Artificial intelligence or AI is one of the most trending technologies of the 21st century. Hello everyone. Welcome to this full course video on artificial intelligence. In this video, we will cover everything you need to know about AI. Our experienced instructors with good industry experience will take you through this course. First, you will understand the basics of artificial intelligence from a short animated video. We will look at the future of AI and listen to some of the industry experts such as Sundar Pichai, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and learn what they have to say about AI. You will see the top 10 applications of AI in 2021. Then, we will understand about machine learning and the different algorithms used to build AI models. We will get an idea about another core component of artificial intelligence that is deep learning. Finally, we learn the top 10 artificial intelligence technologies in 2021. So let's begin. Picture this, a machine that could organize your cupboard just as you like it or serve every member of the house a customized cup of coffee. Makes your day easier, doesn't it? These are the products of artificial intelligence. But why use the term artificial intelligence? Well, these machines are artificially incorporated with human-like intelligence to perform tasks as we do. This intelligence is built using complex algorithms and mathematical functions. But AI may not be as obvious as in the previous examples. In fact, AI is used in smartphones, cars, social media feeds, video games, banking, surveillance, and many other aspects of our daily life. The real question is, what does an AI do at its core? Here is a robot we built in our lab, which is now dropped onto a field. In spite of a variation in lighting, landscape, and dimensions of the field, the AI robot must perform as expected. This ability to react appropriately to a new situation is called generalized learning. The robot is now at a crossroad, one that is paved and the other rocky. The robot must determine which path to take based on the circumstances. This portrays the robot's reasoning ability. After a short stroll, the robot now encounters a stream that it cannot swim across. Using the plank provided as an input, the robot is able to cross this stream. So, our robot uses the given input and finds the solution for a problem. This is problem solving. These three capabilities make the robot artificially intelligent. In short, AI provides machines with the capability to adapt, reason, and provide solutions. Well, now that we know what AI is, let's have a look at the two broad categories an AI is classified into. Weak AI, also called narrow AI, focuses solely on one task. For example, AlphaGo is a maestro of the game Go, but you can't expect it to be even remotely good at chess. This makes AlphaGo a weak AI. You might say Alexa is definitely not a weak AI since it can perform multiple tasks. Well, that's not really true. When you ask Alexa to play Despacito, it picks up the keywords play and Despacito and runs a program it is trained to. Alexa cannot respond to a question it isn't trained to answer. For instance, try asking Alexa the status of traffic from work to home. Alexa cannot provide you this information as she is not trained to. And that brings us to our second category of AI, strong AI. Now, this is much like the robots that only exist in fiction as of now. Ultron from Avengers is an ideal example of a strong AI. That's because it's self-aware and eventually even develops emotions. This makes the AI's response unpredictable. You must be wondering, well, how is artificial intelligence different from machine learning and deep learning? We saw what AI is. Machine learning is a technique to achieve AI, and deep learning, in turn, is a subset of machine learning. Machine learning provides a machine with the capability to learn from data and experience through algorithms. Deep learning does this learning through ways inspired by the human brain. This means, through deep learning, data and patterns can be better perceived. Ray Kurzweil, a well-known futurist, predicts that by the year 2045, we would have robots as smart as humans. This is called the point of singularity. Well, that's not all. In fact, Elon Musk predicts that the human mind and body will be enhanced by AI implants, which would make us partly cyborgs. 
So, here's a question for you. Which of the below AI projects don't exist yet? A. An AI robot with citizenship. B. A robot with a muscular skeletal system. C. AI that can read its owner's emotions. D. AI that develops emotions over time. Give it a thought and leave your answers in the comment section below. Since the human brain is still a mystery, it's no surprise that AI too has a lot of unventured domains. For now, AI is built to work with humans and make our tasks easier. However, with the maturation of technology, we can only wait and watch what the future of AI holds for us. Well, that is artificial intelligence for you in short. Do not forget to leave your answer to the quiz in the comment section below. What's interesting to me is we will use AI, as we have been, to specifically target tasks that we need or want done in place of ourselves. That's how AI will ultimately unfold. It is a renaissance. It is a golden age. We are now solving problems with machine learning and artificial intelligence that were, you know, kind of in the realm of science fiction for the last several decades. AI is probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. You know, I think of it as something more profound than electricity or fire. And anytime you work with technology, you need to learn to harness the benefits and while minimizing the downsides. Is we're focusing on autonomous systems. And uh, clearly one purpose of autonomous systems is self-driving cars. There are others. Uh, and we sort of see it as the mother of all AI projects. So there's a class of things like game playing or speech recognition or image recognition that the performance levels are phenomenal. You know, if you compare human speech recognition to computer speech recognition, the computer is slightly better. And that's, you know, mind blowing. Certainly we use AI to do drug discovery. Uh, these biological systems are very complicated. And so the fact that we have you know, vaccines for TB and HIV coming that's partly enabled by this rich data, advance in biology, and machine learning. John, when I look at uh, Seeing AI, which is an application we just launched for anybody with visual impairment, they can go download this app that uses the latest cutting edge computer vision technology in our cloud to give anyone the ability to see. And in fact, Angela Mills, who's a colleague of mine, was just telling me about how it's changed her life inside of Microsoft. She can go into our cafeteria, order food using this app with confidence, walk into conference rooms with confidence because she knows she's walking into the right conference room, or what we've done with our OneNote and Word learning tools. Uh, anyone who has dyslexia can now use AI to be able to read better. It, the latest release of Windows 10 has this capability called Eye Gaze, uh, which is something that we learned working with Steve Gleason and the ALS patients to saying, if you all you have is the eye muscle uh, and the gaze, can we help you type? be careful uh, when there's advances. In a sense, we're all better off. If, if the machines can make all the food and the clothes and none of us have to work, uh, you know, you think, okay, now we have all the freedom. If we want to stand behind the, the counter and, you know, make sandwiches, okay, you can if you want, but there's this other way to make those goods and services. But it will be very disruptive uh, because, you know, say you're mid-career, in manufacturing or driving, then it's a disruption. Now we've had that in a slow way for hundreds of years. You know, we used to all be farmers, now very few of us are farmers. I said, it's right to be concerned, absolutely. You have to worry about it, otherwise you're not gonna solve it, right? And it's important to understand tomorrow whether Google is there or not, you know, artificial intelligence is going to progress. Uh, you know, technology has uh, this nature, it's, uh, you know, it's going to evolve. I think pulling back, history shows pulling back, countries which pull back don't do well with the change. We know that. 20, 30 years ago, you educated yourself and that carried you through for the rest of your life. 
that is not going to be true for the generation which is being born now. They have to learn continuously over their lives. We know that. So we have to transform how we do education. Look, I think, I mean, you nailed it. Anything that's repetitive and done, you know, on the back of, you know, technology or, you know, is going to be fundamentally vulnerable. Yeah. So I think uh, technology, and in particular AI, can in fact bring more empowerment, more inclusiveness. And at the same time, we should be clear-eyed about displacement, clear-eyed about unintended consequences like any other technology, and work both skilling so that you know, people can find the jobs of the future, create new jobs, and uh, lastly, uh, I think, have a set of policy decisions uh, that really help people uh, at, as they go through this change. The risks are uh, important, and I think the way we solve it is we think ahead, we worry about it, we do things like from, from be upfront, uh, you know, have ethical charters, think about AI safety from day one, be very transparent and open in how we pursue progress there, and figure out global frameworks by which we can engage. Just like Paris Agreement and climate change, you know, using forums like this, I think we bring people together they engage on the hard questions, and I think answers will emerge. Um, you know, I, I have exposure to the very, the very most cutting edge um, AI, um, uh, and I think people should be really concerned about it. Um, I keep sound, sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like they don't know how to react, you know, because it seems so ethereal, um, and. Um, I think we should be really concerned about AI, and I think we should, this is, AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive. Um, because I think by the time we are reactive in AI regulation, it's too late. Right now we have machine learning algorithms that can solve an incredibly complex problem beyond any human intelligence but they're essentially complete idiots and like two-year-olds and anything that's not that problem. They're mm -hmm. dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're in the, like they, you can give them this enormous data set and they come up with brilliant correlations and insights, but they're not going to plug into Skynet and you know, right. like, right. like, like, like threaten us anytime soon. So I'm quite optimistic and uh, I don't think artificial intelligence is a threat. I don't think artificial intelligence is something terrible. But human beings are smart enough to learn that. Hey guys, welcome to this Simply Learn session on AI applications in 2020. So here's a small refresher about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence refers to intelligence displayed by machines that simulates human intelligence. Basically, it's the ability of a machine or a program to think and learn. Now that you're all caught up, let's take a look at how different domains are using AI. Let's have a look at the current market state of AI. According to Attractica, a market research firm, the global AI market is expected to reach a revenue of $118 billion by 2025. Next, according to the research firm, Gartner AI usage has grown by 270% in the last four years, a clear indication of the growth that's yet to come in the upcoming years. In fact, 87% of companies that actually have adopted AI were using it to improve email marketing. And in some news, that could be positive or negative, depending on how you look at it, 75 countries are now using AI technology for surveillance. Now let's have a look at how artificial intelligence is used in different domains. First off, AI applications in e-commerce. AI offers you personalized shopping. With AI, you have a recommendation engine through which you can engage better with your customers. These recommendations are made by taking into consideration their usage history, their preferences, and interests. By providing these recommendations, what you're doing is basically improving your relationship with your customers. You are improving their loyalty towards your brand and by extension, causing an increase in the number of conversions. 
With AI, you can provide users the ability to perform visual searches. Users can upload an image of the item they require. Search results are shown that match their query. So all of this can be done without them having to type a single word. Next, we have AI-powered assistants. Assistants like virtual shopping assistants and chatbots help improve user experience while shopping online. For this, techniques like NLP or natural language processing are used to make the conversation sound as human and personal as possible. Did you know that soon customer service could be handled by chatbots on Amazon.com? Moreover, these assistants can have real-time engagement with your customers. They can handle multiple situations like if the customer has some feedback, the chatbot will take it from them. Or if they have some basic questions about your brand, the chatbot can help them out. These assistants can help further emphasize the point to the users about how important they are to your organization. Next, under e-commerce, we have smart purchasing. Customer trends are often difficult to predict. But with AI, they don't have to be. AI can focus demands related to a particular product. With this knowledge, your decisions on what products to stock up and when it needs to be done can be positively impacted. Doing this, you're meeting customer expectations and improving their experience with your brand. Finally, under e-commerce, we have fraud prevention. Two of the biggest issues that e-commerce companies have to deal with are credit card fraud and fake reviews. By taking into consideration usage patterns, AI can help deal with reducing the possibility of credit card frauds taking place. Talking about fake reviews, did you know that more than 80% of customers decide to buy a product or service based on their customer reviews? AI can help identify and handle fake reviews. By making sure they're handled, you are improving customer trust in your brand and products. Some of the organizations that have already started AI are Amazon, Alibaba.com and eBay. Based on research performed by MIT, GPS technology can provide users with accurate, timely and detailed information to improve safety. The technology uses a combination of conventional neural networks and graph neural network, which makes lives easier for users by automatically determining the number of lanes and road types behind obstructions on the roads. Next up, we have AI applications in robotics. First off, let's have a look at mobility. Robots that are powered by AI will use real-time updates. They would be able to maneuver through a particular part of travel. With this path, the robot can sense obstacles in its path and then pre-plan its journey. It can be used for carrying goods in factories, warehouses and hospitals, cleaning offices and large equipments, inventory management, and it is also used for exploring environments that are too dangerous for humans. AI can also be used in process optimization. Data obtained by sensors can be analyzed to enhance AI intelligence. With this knowledge, unnecessary breakdowns are prevented and it can also reduce associated costs of major issues. Next up, let's see how AI is applied in the human resources domain. Now, this is something most people wouldn't have expected. Did you know that companies use software to ease the hiring process? Artificial intelligence helps with blind hiring. Software that uses machine learning can be used to sift through applications based on specific parameters. AI can be used to scan job candidates' profiles and resumes to provide recruiters an understanding of the talent pool they must choose from. Now let's have a look at AI applications in healthcare. First off, let's have a look at how AI is used in patient care. So there are these things called prescription errors which are basically caused due to slips, lapses or mistakes in a doctor's prescription. Let's face it, a dosage too high can be the difference between life and death. Audit systems that use AI can help prevent these kinds of errors from being handled and the diseases are properly identified. Some of the popular uses are Javion, Analytic and Wellframe. Next, let's see how AI is used with medical imaging and diagnostics. AI can help with early diagnosis to analyze chronic conditions taking into consideration laboratory and other medical data. It is also used with advanced medical imaging through which you can analyze and transform images. Through this, you can create models for possible scenarios. Next up is AI applications in research and development. AI is really important when it comes to the discovery of new drugs. This is made possible with the help of a combination of historical data and medical intelligence. It also helps understand the human gene and its components. 
It also helps predict the different outcomes possible if gene editing is performed. Right now, there's probably scientists racing to develop the gene sequence for COVID-19 and towards the creation of the vaccine. Now that we have reached midwayish, I have a question to ask. Are you guys using AI-powered software in your workplace? Let me know in the live chat. If you enjoy watching informative tech videos like this one, consider subscribing to Simply Learn's channel to stay up to date on the trending technologies and hit the bell icon to never miss an update in the future. Next up, let's talk about AI applications in agriculture. First off, AI helps with monitoring crop and soil health. It can help with identifying defects and nutrient deficiency in the soil. By analyzing images of soil and patterns in them, soil defects, plant pests and diseases can be identified. Next, AI helps decrease pesticide usage using technology like computer vision, robotics and machine learning. Using this kind of technology, it can be determined where weeds are grown. This way, herbicides can be sprayed only where the weeds are. With this, herbicide usage is limited. AI also helps with agriculture bots. It can be used to reduce human labor by harvesting crops at a faster rate and a higher volume. Next, let's have a look at artificial intelligence in gaming. One of the most important things that game companies need to handle, which is labor costs. This is done to generate levels, maps, textures, weapons, characters, etc. AI can be used to create smart, human-like NPCs to interact with players. It can also be used to predict human behavior using which game design and testing can be improved. Now, this example isn't a recent one, but that of a 2014 game called Alien Isolation. Now, if you know about the movies, you know it's from the Alien series of movies. So, in this game, the titular alien stalks the player throughout the game. The alien uses two AIs to hunt the player. A director AI that always knows the position of the location of the player and an alien AI which is driven by sensors and behaviors that constantly hunt the player. The director AI only gives the alien AI clues to the player's location which it needs to figure out. Now let's have a look at AI application in automobiles. First off, we have driverless automobiles. By taking a combination of information obtained from the vehicle's camera, radar, cloud services, GPS and control signals, that can be used to operate the vehicle. It's thanks to all of this that the car is able to drive itself. Next, AI offers driver assistance. AI can be used to improve the in-vehicle experience as well. Systems like emergency braking, blind spot monitoring, driver assist steering are used. Next up, AI in social media. First, let's see how Facebook is able to use AI. One of the ways AI is being used is for analyzing pictures. This can be used to identify the people in an image. AI is also used in a tool called Deep Text. So with the help of AI can be used to analyze posts that represent suicidal thoughts. The tool can also be used to translate posts from different languages. Next, let's have a look at AI used by Instagram. AI takes into account your likes and the accounts you follow to determine what posts you are shown on your Explore tab. The deep text tool has also been used recently to identify and remove spam messages from user accounts. AI is also used for handling cyberbullying to check content based on hashtags from other users. Next up, AI in Twitter. AI is used to determine fraud, propaganda and hateful content on the platform. It is also used to recommend tweets that the users might enjoy based on what tweets that you engage with. It is also used to filter through inappropriate content and remove it from the platform. AI is also used for automatically cropping images based on face recognition. It is also used to filter through inappropriate content and remove it from the platform. AI is also used for automatically cropping images based on face recognition. And finally, let's have a look at AI applications in marketing. First off, AI enables programmatic advertising. AI enables highly targeted and personalized ads by taking into consideration behavioral analysis, pattern recognition, and much more. AI also enables you to retarget audiences at right time to make sure they are given appropriate results and ensure feelings of annoyance and distrust. Next up, that's personalized narratives. AI can help with content marketing in a way that matches the brand style and voice. It can also be used to handle routine tasks like performance, campaign reports, and much more. Then AI helps with setting up chatbots. Chatbots are powered by AI, natural language processing, natural language generation, natural language understanding that can understand what the user's language and respond in the ways humans do. Then we have personalized UI and UX. It can be used to provide users with real-time personalization. 
Basically, these smart systems can process information about site visitors or app users, then apply changes to the model in ways that optimize it for future use. By continually learning and adjusting, the algorithms improves the user's experience to offer a more engaging, personalized experience. Next, AI helps with localization. It can help with editing and optimizing market campaigns to fit the needs of the local market. By automated editing of certain variables like CTAs, ad copies, etc., the campaigns would be able to connect better with a local audience. And there you go, these are the top applications of AI in 2020. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. What do you think is making our lives easier off late? And how do you think the world is rapidly changing? Imagine getting into a car, feeding your destination as the input, and automatically getting dropped off at your destination. At the same time, you sit back and relax through the ride without having to do anything at all. Physically, whoa! Life has become so much simpler with all kinds of automation taking us through everyday life. What do you think is making all this possible? Artificial Intelligence Thanks to numerous advancements in technology which is bringing about a lot of changes in our day-to-day -day lives. To drive innovation, AI is using machine learning, taking things one step further. So what exactly do you mean by Artificial Intelligence? In simple terms, AI refers to simulating a machine with human intelligence and programming the device to think and act like humans. Artificial intelligence, also called machine intelligence, is far beyond robots as portrayed by science fiction. From Google's search algorithm to Amazon's Alexa, to Apple's Siri to self-driven cars, AI progresses rapidly towards a harmonious future between technology and man, bringing together the best of both worlds. Since the machines are artificially incorporated with human-like intelligence and perform tasks as we do, it's termed as artificial intelligence and it was coined in 1956. The programs that were developed after AI was founded were simply astonishing. People could witness computers proving theorems in geometry, solving algebra word problems, and much more. Between the 1950s and 1970s, neural networks emerged. From the 1980s until the last decade, machine learning took over the world. Now is the era of deep learning. The boons of AI. Undoubtedly, AI has changed our lives in many ways. At number one, we have safety factor. There are many fields like defense, mining, etc. where human health is at significant risk. AI is the biggest boon in these fields where a robo or a drone does the work instead of a human. With the invention of self-driven cars, AI is aiding at our road safety by reducing the number of road traffic accidents compared to those caused by humans. Speaking of language processing and speech recognition, AI helps in effective communication by processing and understanding the language spoken by humans. It is also capable of comprehending the words spoken by humans and reciprocate in the same way. All this is possible by the voice assistant feature which the AI bots have. At number 3, we have daily needs. Be it Alexa or Apple Siri, we are surrounded by various applications that run on AI. Fingerprint detection, face detection, GPS, Grammarly, all these run on artificial intelligence. Google Maps calculate the traffic congestion to find the best route to your destination which works on AI. Whether it is the mathematical calculations, booking a ticket, buying a product online and driving a car, AI has limited human interaction and provides various services. In all the unexpected ways, AI is helping humans in their day-to-day needs. At number 4, we have healthcare. AI is a promising tool for supporting healthcare administration. It helps healthcare workers and stakeholders to manage vast amounts of data and transform them into potentially life saving information. In the present scenario, people are threatened by the growing health emergency due to the spread of the COVID 19 coronavirus. A WHO report released said that AI is a vital part of the response to this disease. AI systems are being developed, predicting people's temperatures and survival rates with more than 90% accuracy. One promising approach of AI in the field of healthcare is it guides vaccine design. As COVID-19 began to spread globally, machine learning tools were used to search immunogenic components of the virus that would make good vaccine candidates. Yet another field where the ML is significantly evolving is genomics. 
which is the study of the complete set of genes within an organism. AI can sequence and analyze DNA much faster, cheaper and accurate than the researchers ever will. At number 5, we have Robos. One of the most amazing inventions by humans that thinks intelligently and acts autonomously. The disinfecting robos are playing a significant role in these uncertain times. They rove around healthcare facilities, spreading UV light to disinfect places contaminated with viruses. The benefits of AI robos far exceed the apprehensions. Speaking of role of technology advancements. Artificial intelligence is rapidly advancing with a lot of computers and robots capable of doing miracles. Though the machines and robots cannot have human feelings, they can think and act like humans. Companies use techniques like machine learning and neural networks to accomplish artificial intelligence, which is also called machine intelligence. In the present scenario, considering the total intelligence, we can conclude that 95% of it is machine intelligence and the remaining 5% is what we call human knowledge. Speaking of AI versus human, AI has a positive as well as a negative impact on us and society. According to some recent studies, 7 million existing jobs will be replaced by AI in the UK between 2017 and 2037. But at the same time, 7.2 million jobs could be created as well. A study from McKinsey Global Institute states that by 2030, automation will replace 400 to 800 million jobs, requiring as many as 375 million people to switch their job categories entirely. This is indeed going to cause fear and concern to many vulnerable countries. The biggest challenge is how people would make a living with these changes and uncertainty. Google CEO Sundar Pichai has claimed that AI will be more transformative to humanity than electricity ever will. Google even launched an AI system which bet some of the best Atari 2600 game players. Also, did you know that the best chess player in the world is a machine? How would it be when the best doctor in the world is a machine, the best teacher is a machine, the best architect is a machine and the best of many professions are various machines and robots? AIs and robots will replace fast food joints and radiologists in hospitals. Someday, AI will diagnose your cancer and a robo will perform your surgery. It won't be long until a machine is superior in every single professional field. Warning by Musk This is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. Though AI is a boon to humankind in many different ways, not everyone is ready to welcome AI with open arms. Some AI experts like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have warned us about the looming dangers that AI may possess to humanity. They have even suggested that AI is likely to be the greatest threat that could end the human species. Elon Musk says that he is close to the cutting edge in AI, which scares him a lot. AI is vastly more than almost anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. He also says that AI is far more dangerous than nuclear warheads. Earlier in 2014, Musk had described AI as our biggest existential threat. AI can be harmful to us in two different ways. The idea that AI will become conscious and responsive and seek to destroy us. Also, the notion that people with evil hands can turn this AI into a critical tool for wicked purposes. If the super-intelligent AI, more intelligent than us, becomes conscious, they will look at humans like how humans will look at monkeys. People are afraid of AI by watching movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey where one of the most well-known AIs turned terrible. The Terminator, The Matrix and few others. These movies have speculated about AI that far exceeds the expectations of its creators and escapes their control, eventually targeting humans for extinction. Speaking of the real reasons to be afraid of AI, there are doctors, engineers, accountants, judges, architects who seek information from an AI system. They treat this information as it is from a trusted colleague. This trust is what we should be afraid of. It is not because of how often AI gets it wrong. AI researchers pride themselves on the accuracy of results. 
It is how bad it gets it wrong when it makes a mistake. These systems do not fail gracefully. One such incident is when Facebook had to shut down a controversial chatbot experiment where the two AIs developed their own language for communication. A research was conducted with two chatbots named Alice and Bob, focusing on how to negotiate with each other. Unfortunately, the researchers found that the bots had deviated from the actual script and had started inventing their new phrases without any human script. As the bots were left unsupervised, they developed their machine language, which was otherwise developed to converse with people. That's the scary part of AI, neural networks and deep learning. The developers and researchers working on this would have no idea what it's doing. This technology can get complicated and we have to make sure what we are doing with it holds value. We must also handle it cautiously because AI is a direct reflection of us. People should lead and not follow. So here's the question, should we be afraid of AI? We all know that AI is a transformative technology that we have ever seen in the history of humankind. On the other hand, we should be scared of this so-called transformative power. It has the potential to be transformative both for good reasons as well as for the wrong. However, fear of the unknown has always been the case with technology. Fears that AI will develop awareness and overthrow humanity are grounded in misconceptions of what AI is. AI is defined by the algorithms that dictate its behavior and operate under definite limitations. People are afraid of what happens when AI reaches its consciousness. What if an AI machine starts to have human feelings and emotions? Well, there has been no progress in research in these areas. Also, we don't think that is anywhere in our near future. Pretty much any type of machine can be used for either good or bad reasons. We as developers and researchers should know where to stop or pause. In a TED talk, Peter Huss says, Imagine you're driving up a mountain and it's raining very heavily. As you climb into the mountains, the rain is turning into snow and pretty soon that snow is a whiteout. You cannot see the tail lights of the car in front of you. You start skidding. You see some vehicle was coming to crash into you. All this wouldn't have happened if you paused your journey as the rain was getting worse. This is to tell you how something small and seemingly mundane can quickly grow into something hazardous. Consider yourself driving in the rain with AI right now. That rain will turn into snow soon and that snow could quickly become a dangerous blizzard. So we need to pause, check the conditions, put in place safety standards and ask ourselves how far we want to go. Only the healthy skepticism of these systems is going to help keep people in the loop. Spot checking what the AI algorithms are doing keeping people in the loop will probably solve some of our most significant challenges. At the moment, AI isn't dangerous in itself unless you're living in the realms of the movies as mentioned earlier. However evolved these AI machines are, they still lack human empathy and consciousness. So instead of running away from this technology, we should understand this revolutionary technology and make sure it is used in the right way to make our lives better. And on that note, if you want to master AI and machine learning, you can check out Simply Learn's postgraduate program in AI and machine learning in partnership with Purdue University. Hello, my name is Richard Kirshner, and today we're going to go over what is artificial intelligence. One example of today's artificial intelligence is a smart home. So welcome to my smart home. Smart homes are run by artificial intelligence. Let's have a look at some of the key features of a smart house. Home appliances are voice controlled. Sensors adjust lights and air coolers according to the climate. Security systems can detect movement outside and warn the residents. All the appliances are interconnected to each other and can detect vehicles in the driveway and let the owner know. Home appliances can be controlled remotely through the phone. Now this is just one example in today's world. So what's in it for you today? Today we're going to cover a brief history of artificial intelligence, what is artificial intelligence, types of artificial intelligence, applications of artificial intelligence and just a quick glimpse of the future of artificial intelligence. Let us start with a brief history of artificial intelligence. Let's start with John McCarthy. He was the first one to coin the word artificial intelligence and in 1956 had the first
first artificial intelligence conference. Let's jump forward to 1969 with Shaky. Shaky was the first general purpose mobile robot built. And although by today's standard he was very simple, he did mark a milestone in that we were now processing data differently. He was now able to do things with a purpose versus just a list of instructions. Albeit the list included things like turning on and off lights and pushing boxes around the room. We're going to move forward to 1997. In 1997, the supercomputer Deep Blue was designed, which defeated the world's chess champion in a game. This is the first time when we're actually seeing the computer using logic to beat a human doing some kind of logical, uh, in this case, a game. So it was a huge milestone by IBM to create this large computer that was able to do that in a timely fashion. Let's jump up to 2002 when we have our first commercially successful robotic vacuum cleaner. Nowadays you can go down to the Target and buy one, but back in 2002 that was the first model that was put out. And finally 2005 to 2018 today, in the last more than a decade, we have speech recognition, RPA, dancing robots, smart homes, and many more to come. What I want you to notice about this brief history of artificial intelligence is the compression of time. In 1956 it was just an idea, and more than 10 years later we have our Shaky, the first one who's able to flip light switches. And then we go all the way to 97 where we have Deep Blue. And there's a lot of little steps between 69 and 97. But it's actually able to take on a human in chess and beat them regularly. Now they did have a lot of ties so don't think that it won every game. And then we go only four years later we have our first commercially successful robotic vacuum cleaner. And as we go from 2005 to 2018, we go from simple speech recognition to very complicated, able to really register with your Google Voice and your Siri. We have our RPA, we have dancing robots, smart homes, and many more things that are just coming out almost monthly in the world of artificial intelligence. So what is artificial intelligence? AI is a form of computer science used to create intelligent machines that can recognize human speech, objects, can learn, plan, and solve problems like humans. And I'd like you to focus just on that last one, can solve problems like humans. As we saw earlier, we compare the computer that can beat the chess champion. It's able to, the one before that, able to turn on and off lights in the house. So right now, our concept of artificial intelligence is based primarily on our understanding of how it interacts with humans and how we can compare it to humans. So speech recognition, that's a big one today. Object detection, solve problems and learn from the given data, and plan an approach for future tasks to be done. These are all very huge human things that we do to plan and solve for the future. Types of artificial intelligence. Hi, heard you want to know the types of AI. You can imagine our little robot taking us on a tour. The first type is purely reactive. The second type is limited memory. The third type, theory of mind, which is still in the process of being invented, and definitely the question of self-awareness being the fourth, which is still not invented yet, or is it? Let's look at these a little closer. Here we have our purely reactive. He does not have any past memory or data to work with. He takes actions, reacts based on what he sees. Okay, it's not that tough. Observes every move. You can see we have a nice game of uh, chess going on here. And wins. Takes the best possible decision. Purely reactive machines specialize in one field of work only. In this case, we see a, a chess game where they figure out the best moves, calculating all the different moves. Maybe it's calculating the next one in a row in a linear regression model so you can figure out the best marketing. But they're very reactionive. They don't have a lot of data. They just have what's in front of them to look at. Next, let's look at limited memory. Let's try to understand the limited memory setup. These machines use previous data and keep adding it to their memory. Suggest me a good restaurant. So maybe we're looking to go out for dinner tonight and we're not sure what we want to eat. Hmm, I see you have been to KFC quite a lot in the past week. There is a KFC nearby. So it goes through the previous location data and where they ate prior and says, hmm, this is probably a good suggestion for you tonight. Thanks. It has enough memory or experience to make proper decisions, but the memory is very limited. This isn't trying to uh, guess what a new location would be or anything like that. It just takes what it has in front of it and goes, okay, this is where you've been, this is what you liked, you gave it two thumbs up, one thumb down, whatever, and then it goes, from these suggestions, this is where I think you should go. Theory of mind. This kind of AI has the capacity to understand thoughts and emotions and interact socially. A machine based on this type is yet to be built. That human looks lonely. 
Hey, human, you want to be my friend? Huh? Okay. Theory of mind is a thing of the future. Certainly, we see a lot of the industry poking a little bit at this as it tries to guess how you feel about things. But most of that is still based on previous data. You know, yes, no, two thumbs up, one thumb down. Theory of mind would take it one step further in understanding the emotions behind it. And finally, as we get deep into the uh, sci-fi futuristic, we have self-aware. Self-aware machines are future generation of machines. They will be super intelligent, sentient, sentient and conscious like the Terminator, the good guy in the thing, or Ultron, or Vision from Avengers. For right now, these are mostly movie characters or cartoon characters, but we certainly are getting closer to seeing them in the real world. Hopefully they'll be of the type of the good guys and not the bad guys we see also in the artificial intelligence sci-fi movies. Applications of artificial intelligence. Let's take a look at some of today's commercial and business uses for the AI. We have banking, fraud detection from a large data consisting of fraudulent and non-fraudulent transactions. The AI learns to predict if a new transaction is fraud or not. Online customer support. Most of the customer support is now being automated by artificial intelligence. Cybersecurity. Using machine learning algorithms and a lot of sample data, AI can be used to detect anomalies, adapt, and respond to threats. Virtual assistants. Siri, Cortana, Alexa, and Google now use voice recognition to follow the user's commands. These are all wonderful examples of current AIs that are in the commercial and business world. And these ones in particular have matured over the last half a decade. For instance, very few large banks in today's world would not use banking for fraud detection or for deciding whether it's a good person to give a loan to or not based on their credit scores and where they're from and their income. Same thing with cybersecurity, detecting anomalies, or online customer support. Could you imagine in, uh, say, HP, who has over 70,000 help pages across 17 different languages? Now they have to figure out how to do online customer support to cover new problems that come up and track them so they can build new pages. If they had one person doing that, that would take them a year just to do what they need to have posted yesterday. And of course, our virtual assistants, I don't know about you, but I love mine, kind of like having a private secretary without having a private secretary. Future of artificial intelligence. If we see where it's at now commercially and business-wise, then where is it going? Of course, the imagination is a limit on this one, but you can already see the development in the world today for automated transportation. It'll become a common thing, maybe even early as 2020, when they have the final release from the leaders in the industry. Humans will be able to augment the themselves with robots. Certainly the idea of having the robot bring me my coffee is lovely. Or when I'm doing reports or something else on the computer, it does part of that work for me so that I'm freed up to think about other things. There will be more numbers of smart cities as vehicles, phones, home appliances will be run by AI. Home robots will help elderly people with the day-to-day -day work. Japan already has a very in-depth program where they've begun to integrate robots helping elderly. Even some of the simple things like getting that box of cereal off the top shelf or monitoring if they fall and need to contact the doctor in an emergency to show up. Robots will take over hazardous jobs like bomb defusing, welding, etc. For the future of artificial intelligence, you can see here a number of robotic uses that are already in development. People are already working on these and trying to bring them to us in a commercial and business fashion. Your own imagination can take this to the next level, or a simple Google search will show you some of the stuff that's out there now in addition to these. Hello and welcome to Machine Learning Tutorial Part 1. This is part one of a machine learning series put on by Simply Learn. What's in it for you today? Well, we'll start off with a brief explanation of why machine learning and what is machine learning. And then we'll get into a few of the types of machine learning. Machine learning algorithms, linear regression, decision trees, support vector machine. And finally, we'll do a use case where we're going to classify whether a recipe is of a cupcake or a muffin using the SVM or the support vector machine. Sounds like a delicious way to explore machine learning. So why machine learning? Why do we even care about having these computers come up and be able to do all these new things for us? Well, because machines can now drive your car for you. It's still very in the infant stage, but it's just exploding, as we see with uh, Google's Waymo and then uh, Uber had their program, which unfortunately crashed. They know that this is huge. This is going to be the huge industry to change our whole transportation infrastructure. Machine learning is now used to detect over 50 eye diseases. Do you know how amazing that is to have a computer that double checks for the doctor for things they might miss? That's just huge in the health industry. 
pretty soon they actually do already have that in some areas where maybe not for eyes but for other diseases where they're using the camera on your phone to help pre-diagnose before you go in and see the doctor. And because the machine can now unlock your phone with your face. I mean, that's just cool, having it being able to identify your face or your voice and be able to turn stuff on and off for you depending on where you're at and what you need. Talk about an ultimate automation, the world we live in. And as we dig in deeper, we have a nice example of Facebook. As you can see here, they have the Facebook post with Halloween. Comment yes if you want it. Order here. Nobody likes spam posts on Facebook that annoy them into interacting with likes, shares, comments, and other actions. I remember the original ones were all, if you don't click on here, you will have bad luck or some kind of fear factor. Well, this is a huge thing in a social media when people are getting spammed. And so this tactic, known as engagement bait, takes advantage of Facebook's newsfeed algorithm by choosing engagement in order to get the greater reach. To eliminate engagement bait, the company reviewed and categorized hundreds of thousands of posts to train a machine learning model that detects different types of engagement bait. So in this case we have, we're using Facebook, but this is of course across all the different social media. They have different tools they're building. And the Facebook scroll GIF will be replaced, kind of like a virus coming in there. It notices that there's a certain setup with Facebook and it's able to replace it. And they have like vote baiting, react baiting, share baiting. They have all these different, these are kind of general titles, but there certainly are a lot of way of baiting you to go in there and click on something. So they fed all this. This data was fed into the machine. And then they have the new post. The new post comes up that takes over part of the Facebook setup. And that's what you're looking at. You're looking at this new post that's replaced, like a virus has replaced that. So what Facebook did to eliminate this is they start scanning for keywords and phrases like this and checks the click-through rate. So it starts looking for people who are clicking through it without even looking at it or clicking through it and it's not something that normally would be clicked through. Once Facebook has scanned for these keywords and phrases, it is now able to identify the spam coming in. And this makes your life easier, so you're not getting spammed. It's not like walking through an airport, and in a lot of countries, you have like hundreds of people trying to sell you timeshare. Come join us. Sign up for this. It eliminates that annoyingness, so now you can just enjoy your Facebook and um, your cat pictures, or maybe it's your family pictures. Mine, mine is family. Certainly people like their cat pictures, too. Another good example is Google's DeepMind project AlphaGo. A computer program that plays a board game Go has defeated the world's number one Go player, and I hope I say his name right, KG. The ultimate Go challenge game of three of three was on May 27th, 2017, so it was just last year that this happened. And what makes this so important is that, you know, Go is just is a game, so it's not like you're driving a car or something in our real world, but they are using games to learn how to get the machine learning program to learn. They want it to learn how to learn. And that is a huge step. A lot of this is still in its infant stage as far as development, as we saw what happened with the, um, as I referred to earlier, the Uber cars. They lost their whole division because they jumped ahead too fast. So it's still in infant stage, but boy, is this like the beginning of just an amazing world that is automated in ways we can't even imagine what tomorrow is going to look like. We've looked at a lot of examples of machine learning, so let's see if we can give a little bit more of a concrete definition. What is machine learning? Machine learning is the science of making computers learn and act like humans by feeding data and information without being explicitly programmed. And we see here we have a nice little diagram where we have our ordinary system. Uh, your computer, nowadays, you can even run a lot of this stuff on a cell phone because cell phones have advanced so much. And then with artificial intelligence and machine learning, it now takes the data and it learns from what happened before. And then it predicts what's going to come next. And then really the biggest part right now in machine learning that's going on is it improves on that. How do we find a new solution? So we go from descriptive, where it's learning about stuff and understanding how it fits together, to predicting what it's going to do, to postscripting, coming up with a new solution. And when we're working on machine learning, there's a number of different diagrams that people have posted for what steps to go through. A lot of it might be very domain specific. So if you're working on photo identification versus language versus medical or physics, some of these are switched around a little bit or new things are put in that are very specific to the domain. This is kind of a very general diagram. First, you want to define your objective. Very important to know what it is you're wanting to predict. Then you're going to be collecting the data. So once you've defined an objective, you need to collect the data that matches. 
you spend a lot of time in data science collecting data and the next step preparing the data you got to make sure that your data is clean going in there's the old saying bad data in bad answer out or bad data out and then once you've gone through and we've cleaned all this stuff coming in then you're going to select the algorithm which algorithm are you going to use you're going to train that algorithm in this case I think we're going to be working with SVM the support vector machine then you have to test the model does this model work is this a valid model for what we're doing and then once you've tested it you want to run your prediction you want to run your prediction or your choice or whatever output it's going to come up with and then once everything is set and you've done lots of testing then you want to go ahead and deploy the model and remember I said domain specific this is very general as far as the scope of doing something a lot of models you get halfway through and you realize that your data is missing something and you have to go collect new data because you've run a test in here someplace along the line you're saying hey I'm not really getting the answers I need so there's a lot of things that are domain specific that become part of this model this is a very general model but it's a very good model to start with and we do have some basic divisions of what machine learning does that's important to know. For instance, do you want to predict a category? Well, if you're categorizing thing, that's classification. For instance, whether the stock price will increase or decrease. So in other words, I'm looking for a yes-no answer. Is it going up or is it going down? And in that case, we'd actually say, is it going up? True. If it's not going up, it's false, meaning it's going down. This way, it's a yes-no. Zero, one. Do you want to predict a quantity? That's regression. So remember, we just did classification. Now we're looking at regression. These are the two major divisions in what data is doing. For instance, predicting the age of a person based on the height, weight, health, and other factors. So based on these different factors, you might guess how old a person is. And then there are a lot of domain-specific things. Like, do you want to detect an anomaly? That's anomaly detection. This is actually very popular right now. For instance, you want to detect money withdrawal anomalies. You want to know when someone's making a withdrawal that might not be their own account. We've actually brought this up because this is really big right now. If you're predicting the stock, whether to buy stock or not, you want to be able to know if what's going on in the stock market is an anomaly. Use a different prediction model because something else is going on. You've got to pull out new information in there. Or is this just the norm? I'm going to get my normal return on my money invested. So being able to detect anomalies is very big in data science these days. Another question that comes up, which is on what we call untrained data, is do you want to discover structure in unexplored data? And that's called clustering. For instance, finding groups of customers with similar behavior given a large database of customer data containing their demographics and past buying records. And in this case, we might notice that anybody who's wearing a certain set of shoes goes shopping at certain stores or whatever it is. They're going to make certain purchases. By having that information, it helps us to market or group people together so that we can now explore that group and find out what it is we want to market to them if you're in the marketing world. And that might also work in just about any arena. You might want to group people together, whether they're uh, based on their different areas and investments and financial background, whether you're going to give them a loan or not, before you even start looking at whether they're a valid customer for the bank, you might want to look at all these different areas and group them together based on unknown data. So you're not, you don't know what the data is going to tell you, but you want to cluster people together that come together. Let's take a quick detour for quiz time. Oh, my favorite. So we're going to have a couple questions here under our quiz time. And um, we'll be posting the answers in the part two of this tutorial. So let's go ahead and take a look at these quiz times questions. And hopefully you'll get them all right. And it'll get you thinking about how to process data and what's going on. Can you tell what's happening in the following cases? Of course, you're sitting there with your cup of coffee and you have your checkbox and your pen trying to figure out what's your next step in your data science analysis. So the first one is grouping documents into different categories based on the topic and content of each document. Very big these days. You know, you have legal documents, you have uh, maybe it's a sports group documents, maybe you're analyzing newspaper postings. But certainly having that automated is a huge thing in today's world. B, identifying handwritten digits in images correctly. So we want to know whether uh, they're writing an A or capital A, B, C. What are they writing out in their hand digit, with their handwriting? C. Behavior of a website indicating that the site is not working as designed. D. 
predicting salary of an individual based on his or her years of experience. Boy, HR hiring uh, set up there. So stay tuned for part two. We'll go ahead and answer these questions when we get to the part two of this tutorial. Or you can just simply write at the bottom and send a note to Simply Learn, and they'll follow up with you on it. Back to our regular content. And these last few bring us into the next topic, which is another way of dividing our types of machine learning, and that is with supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is a method used to enable machines to classify, predict objects, problems, or situations based on labeled data fed to the machine. And in here, you see we have a jumble of data with circles, triangles, and squares, and we label them. We have what's a circle, what's a triangle, what's a square, and we have our model training, and it trains it, so we know the answer. Very important, when you're doing supervised learning, you already know the answer to a lot of your information coming in. So you have a huge group of data coming in, and then you have new data coming in. So we've trained our model. The model now knows the difference between a circle, a square, a triangle. And now that we've trained it, we can send in, in this case, a square and a circle goes in, and it predicts that the top one's a square and the next one's a circle. And you can see that this is uh, being able to predict whether someone's going to default on a loan, because I was talking about banks earlier. Supervised learning on stock market, whether you're going to make money or not, that's always important. And if you are looking to make a fortune in the stock market, keep in mind, it is very difficult to get all the data correct on the stock market. It is very, uh, it fluctuates in ways you really hard to predict. So it's quite a roller coaster ride. If you're running machine learning on the stock market, you start realizing you really have to dig for new data. So we have supervised learning. And if you have supervised, we should need unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, machine learning model finds the hidden pattern in an unlabeled data. So in this case, instead of telling it what the circle is and what a triangle is and what a square is, it goes in there and looks at them and says, for whatever reason, it groups them together. Maybe it'll group it by the number of corners. And it notices that a number of them all have three corners, a number of them all have four corners, and a number of them all have no corners. And it's able to filter those through and group them together. We talked about that earlier with looking at a group of people who are out shopping. We want to group them together to find out what they have in common. And of course, once you understand what people have in common, maybe you have one of them who's a customer at your store, or you have five of them are customers at your store, and they have a lot in common with five others who are not customers at your store. How do you market to those five who aren't customers at your store yet? They fit the demographics of who's going to shop there, and you'd like them to shop at your store, not the one next door. Of course, this is a simplified version. You can see very easily the difference between a triangle and a circle, which might not be so easy in marketing. Reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is an important type of machine learning where an agent learns how to behave in an environment by performing actions and seeing the result. And we have here where the, in this case, a baby. It's actually great that they used an infant for this slide because the reinforcement learning is very much in its infant stages. But it's also probably the biggest machine learning demand out there right now or in the future. It's going to be coming up over the next few years is reinforcement learning and how to make that work for us. And you can see here where we have our action. In the action in this one, it goes into the fire. Hopefully the baby didn't, it was just a little candle, not a giant fire pit like it looks like here. When the baby comes out and the new state is the baby is sad and crying because they got burned on the fire. And then maybe they take another action. The baby's called the agent because it's the one taking the actions. And in this case, they didn't go into the fire. They went a different direction, and now the baby's happy and laughing and playing. Reinforcement learning is very easy to understand because that's how, as humans, that's one of the ways we learn. We learn whether it is, you know, you burn yourself on the stove. Don't do that anymore. Don't touch the stove. In the big picture, being able to have a machine learning program or an AI be able to do this is huge because now we're starting to learn how to learn. That's a big jump in the world of computer and machine learning. And we're going to go back and just kind of go back over supervised versus unsupervised learning. Understanding this is huge because this is going to come up in any project you're working on. We have in supervised learning, we have labeled data. We have direct feedback. So someone's already gone in there and said, yes, that's a triangle. No, that's not a triangle. And then you predict an outcome. So you have a nice prediction. This is this this new set of data is coming in, and we know what it's going to be. And then with unsupervised training, it's not labeled. So we really don't know what it is. There's no feedback. So we're not telling it whether it's right or wrong. We're not telling it whether it's a triangle or a square. We're not telling it to go left or right. All we do is we're finding hidden structure in the data. 
grouping the data together to find out what connects to each other. And then you can use these together. So imagine you have an image and you're not sure what you're looking for. So you go in and you have the unstructured data, find all these things that are connected together. And then somebody looks at those and labels them. Now you can take that labeled data and program something to predict what's in the picture. So you can see how they go back and forth and you can start connecting all these different tools together to make a bigger picture. There are many interesting machine learning algorithms. Let's have a look at a few of them. Hopefully this gives you a little flavor of what's out there. And these are some of the most important ones that are currently being used. We'll take a look at linear regression, decision tree, and the support vector machine. Let's start with a closer look at linear regression. Linear regression is perhaps one of the most well-known and well-understood algorithms in statistics and machine learning. Linear regression is a linear model. For example, a model that assumes a linear relationship between the input variables x and the single output variable y. And you'll see this if you remember from your algebra classes, y equals mx plus c. Imagine we are predicting distance traveled y from speed x. Our linear regression model representation for this problem would be y equals m times x plus c, or distance equals m times speed plus c, where m is the coefficient and c is the y-intercept. And we're going to look at two different variations of this. First, we're going to start with time is constant. And you can see we have a bicyclist. He's got his safety gear on, thank goodness. Speed equals 10 meters per second. And so over a certain amount of time, his distance equals 36 kilometers. We have a second bicyclist who's going twice the speed, or 20 meters per second. And you can guess if he's going twice the speed and time is a constant, then he's going to go twice the distance. And that's easily to compute. 36 times 2, you get 72 kilometers. And so if you had the question of how fast would somebody who's going three times that speed, or 30 meters per second is, you can easily compute the distance in our head. We can do that without needing a computer. But we want to do this for more complicated data. So it's kind of nice to compare the two. But let's just take a look at that and what that looks like in a graph. So in a linear regression model, we have our distance to the speed. And we have our m equals the ve slope of the line. And we'll notice that the line has a plus slope. And as the speed increases, distance also increases. Hence, the variables have a positive relationship. And so your speed of the person, which equals y equals mx plus c, distance traveled in a fixed interval of time, and we could very easily compute, either following the line or just knowing it's three times 10 meters per second, that this is roughly 102 kilometers distance that this third bicyclist has traveled. One of the key definitions on here is positive relationship. So the slope of the line is positive. As distance increases, so does speed increase. Let's take a look at our second example where we put distance is a constant. So we have speed equals 10 meters per second. They have a certain distance to go, and it takes them 100 seconds to travel that distance. And we have our second bicyclist who's still doing 20 meters per second. Since he's going twice the speed, we can guess that he'll cover the distance in about half the time, 50 seconds. And of course, you could probably guess on the third one, 100 divided by 30, since he's going three times the speed, you could easily guess that this is 33.333 seconds time. We put that into a linear regression model or a graph. If the distance is assumed to be constant, let's see the relationship between speed and time. And as time goes up, the amount of speed to go that same distance goes down. So now your m equals a minus ve slope of the line. As the speed increases, time decreases. Hence, the variable has a negative relationship. Again, there's our definition, positive relationship and negative relationship, dependent on the slope of the line. And with a simple formula like this, um, and even a significant amount of data. Let's uh, see with the mathematical implementation of linear regression. And we'll take this data. So suppose we have this data set where we have x, y, x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, standard series. And the y value is 3, 2, 2, 4, 3. When we take that and we go ahead and plot these points on a graph, you can see there's kind of a nice scattering. And you could probably eyeball a line through the middle of it. But we're going to calculate that exact line for linear regression. And the first thing we do is we come up here and we have the mean of xi. And remember, mean is basically the average. So we added 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 and divide by 5. And that simply comes out as 3. And then we'll do the same for y. We'll go ahead and add up all those numbers and divide by 5. And we end up with a mean value of y of i equals 2.8. 
where the xi references is an average or means value, and the yi also equals a means value of y. And when we plot that, you'll see that we can put in the y equals 2.8 and the x equals 3 in there on our graph. We kind of gave it a little different color, so you could sort it out with the dashed lines on it. And it's important to note that when we do the linear regression, the linear regression model should go through that dot. Now let's find our regression equation to find the best fit line. Remember, we go ahead and take our y equals mx plus c, so we're looking for m and c. So to find this equation for our data, we need to find our slope of m and our coefficient of c. And we have y equals mx plus c, where m equals the sum of x minus x average times y minus y average, or y means and x means, over the sum of x minus x means squared. That's how we get the slope of the value of the line. And we can easily do that by creating some columns here. We have x, y. Computers are really good about iterating through data. And so we can easily compute this and fill in a graph of data. And in our graph, you can easily see that if we have our x value of 1, and if you remember the um, x, i, or the means value is 3, 1 minus 3 equals a negative 2. And 2 minus 3 equals a negative 1, so on and so forth. And we can easily fill in the column of x minus xi, y minus yi, and then from those we can compute x minus xi squared and x minus xi times y minus yi. And you can guess it that the next step is to go ahead and sum the different columns for the answers we need. So we get a total of 10 for our x minus xi squared and a total of 2 for x minus xi times y minus yi. And we plug those in, we get 2 tenths, which equals 0.2. So now we know the slope of our line equals 0.2. So we can calculate the value of c. That would be the next step, is we need to know where it crosses the y-axis. And if you remember, I mentioned earlier that the linear regression line has to pass through the means value, the one that we showed earlier. We can just flip back up there to that graph. And you can see right here, there's our means value, which is 3, x equals 3, and y equals 2.8. And since we know that value, we can simply plug that into our formula, y equals 0.2x plus c. So we plug that in, we get 2.8 equals 0.2 times 3 plus c, and you can just solve for c. So now we know that our coefficient equals 2.2. And once we have all that, we can go ahead and plot our regression line. y equals 0.2 times x plus 2.2. And then from this equation, we can compute new values. So let's predict the values of y using x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and plot the points. Remember the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 was our original x values. So now we're going to see what y thinks they are, not what they actually are. And when we plug those in, we get uh, y of designated with y of p. You can see that x equals 1 equals 2.4, x equals 2 equals 2.6, and so on and so on. So we have our y predicted values of what we think it's going to be when we plug those numbers in. And when we plot the predicted values along with the actual values, we can see the difference. And this is one of the things that's very important with linear regression in any of these models is to understand the error. And so we can calculate the error on all of our different values. And you can see over here we plotted um, x and y and y predict. And we draw in a little line so you can sort of see what the error looks like there between the different points. So our goal is to reduce this error. We want to minimize that error value on our linear regression model. Minimizing the distance. There are lots of ways to minimize the distance between the line and the data points, like sum of squared errors, sum of absolute errors, root mean square error, etc. We keep moving this line through the data points to make sure the best fit line has the least square distance between the data points and the regression line. So to recap with a very simple linear regression model, we first figure out the formula of our line through the middle, and then we slowly adjust the line to minimize the error. Keep in mind this is a very simple formula. The math gets, even though the math is very much the same, it gets much more complex as we add in different dimensions. So this is only two dimensions, y equals mx plus c, but you can take that out to x, z, i, j, q, all the different features in there, and they can plot a linear regression model on all of those using the different formulas to minimize the error. Let's go ahead and take a look at decision trees, a very different way to solve problems in the linear regression model. Decision tree is a tree-shaped algorithm used to determine a course of action. Each branch of a tree represents a possible decision, occurrence, or reaction. We have data which tells us if it is a good day to play golf. And if we were to open this data up in a general spreadsheet, 
you can see we have the outlook, whether it's uh, rainy, overcast, sunny, temperature, hot, mild, cool, humidity, windy, and did I like to play golf that day, yes or no? So we're taking a census, and certainly I wouldn't want a computer telling me when I should go play golf or not, but you could imagine if you got up in the night before, you're trying to plan your day, and it comes up and says, tomorrow would be a good day for golf for you in the morning, and not a good day in the afternoon, or something like that. This becomes very beneficial, and we see this in a lot of applications coming out now where it gives you suggestions and lets you know what would, what would de, uh, fit the match for you for the next day or the next purchase or the next uh, whatever, you know, next mail out. In this case, is tomorrow a good day for playing golf based on the weather coming in? And so we come up and let's uh, determine if you should play golf when the day is sunny and windy. So we found out the forecast tomorrow is going to be sunny and windy. And suppose we draw our tree like this. We're going to have our humidity, and then we have our normal, which is uh, if, it's, if you have a normal humidity, you're going to go play golf. And if the humidity is really high, then we look at the outlook. And if the outlook is sunny, overcast, or rainy, it's going to change what you choose to do. So if you know that it's a very high humidity and it's sunny, you're probably not going to play golf because you're going to be out there miserable, fighting off the mosquitoes that are out joining you to play golf with you. Maybe if it's rainy, you probably don't want to play in the rain. But if it's slightly overcast and you get just the right shadow, that's a good day to play golf and be outside, out on the green. Now, in this example, you can probably make your own tree pretty easily because it's a very simple set of data going in. But the question is, how do you know what to split? Where do you split your data? What if this is much more complicated data where it's not something that you would particularly understand, like studying cancer. They take about 36 measurements of the cancerous cells, and then each one of those measurements represents how bulbous it is, how extended it is, how sharp the edges are. Something that as a human, we would have no understanding of. So how do we decide how to split that data up? And is that the right decision tree? But, so that's the question that's going to come up. Is this the right decision tree? For that, we should calculate entropy and information gain. Two important vocabulary words there are the entropy and the information gain. Entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness or impurity in the data set. Entropy should be low. So we want the chaos to be as low as possible. We don't want to look at it and be confused by the images or what's going on there with mixed data. And the information gain. It is a measure of decrease in entropy after the data set is split, also known as entropy reduction. Information gain should be high, so we want our information that we get out of the split to be as high as possible. Let's take a look at entropy from the mathematical side. In this case, we're going to denote entropy as I of P of N and N, where P is the probability that you're going to play a game of golf, and n is the probability where you're not going to play the game of golf. Now, you don't really have to memorize these formulas. There's a few of them out there depending on what you're working with. But it's important to note that this is where this formula is coming from, so when you see it, you're not lost when you're running your programming, unless you're building your own decision tree code in the back. And we simply have a log squared of p over p plus n minus n over p plus n times the log squared of n of p plus n. But let's break that down and see what it actually looks like when we're computing that from the computer script side. Entropy of a target class of the data set is the whole entropy. So we have entropy play golf. And when we look at this, if we go back to the data, you can simply count how many yeses and no in our complete data set for playing golf days. In our complete set, we find we have five days we did play golf and nine days we did not play golf. And so our i equals, if you add those together, 9 plus 5 is 14. And so our i equals 5 over 14 and 9 over 14. That's our p and n values that we plug into that formula. And you can go to 5 over 14 equals 0.36, 9 over 14 equals 0.64. And when you do the whole equation, you get the minus 0.36 log root squared of 0.36 minus 0.64 log squared root of 0.64. And we get a set value. We get 0.94. So we now have a full entropy value for the whole set of data that we're working with. And we want to make that entropy go down. And just like we calculated the entropy out for the whole set, we can also calculate entropy for playing golf and the outlook. Is it going to be overcast or rainy or sunny? And so when we look at the entropy, we have uh, P of sunny times E of 3 of 2. And that just comes out how many sunny days yes and how many sunny days no. 
over the total, which is 5, don't forget to put the, we'll divide that 5 out later on, uh, equals P overcast equals 4 comma 0, plus rainy equals 2 comma 3, and then when you do the whole setup, we have 5 over 14, Remember I said there was a total of 5? Five? 5 over 14 times the i of 3 of 2 plus 4 over 14 times the 4 comma 0 and 5 14 over i of 2 3. And so we can now compute the entropy of just the part that has to do with the forecast. And we get 0.693. Similarly, we can calculate the entropy of other predictors like temperature, humidity, and wind. And so we look at the gain outlook. How much are we going to gain from this? Entropy play golf minus entropy play golf outlook. And we can take the original 0.94 for the whole set minus the entropy of just the um, rainy day and temperature. And we end up with a gain of 0.247. So this is our information gain. Remember we define entropy and we define information gain. The higher the information gain, the lower the entropy, the better. The information gain of the other three attributes can be calculated in the same way. So we have our gain for temperature equals 0.029. We have our gain for humidity equals 0.152. And our gain for a windy day equals 0.048. And if you do a quick comparison, you'll see the 0.247 is the greatest gain of information. So that's the split we want. Now let's build the decision tree. So we have the outlook. Is it going to be sunny, overcast, or rainy? That's our first split because that gives us the most information gain. And we can continue to go down the tree using the different information gains with the largest information. We can continue down the nodes of the tree where we choose the attribute with the largest information gain as the root node and then continue to split each subnode with the largest information gain that we can compute. And although it's a little bit of a tongue twister to say all that, you can see that it's a very easy to view visual model. We have our outlook. We split it three different directions. If the outlook is overcast, we're going to play. And then we can split those further down if we want. So if the outlook is sunny, but then it's also windy, if it's uh, windy, we're not going to play. If it's uh, not windy, we'll play. So we can easily build a nice decision tree to guess what we would like to do tomorrow and give us a nice recommendation for the day. So we want to know if it's a good day to play golf when it's sunny and windy. Remember the original question that came out? Tomorrow's weather report is sunny and windy. You can see by going down the tree, we go outlook sunny, outlook windy. We're not going to play golf tomorrow. So our little smartwatch pops up and says, I'm sorry, tomorrow's not a good day for golf. It's going to be sunny and windy. And if you're a huge golf fan, you might go, uh-oh, it's not a good day to play golf. We can go in and watch a golf game at home. So we'll sit in front of the TV instead of being out playing golf in the wind. Multiple linear regression. Let's take a brief look at what happens when you have multiple inputs. So in multiple linear regression, we have, uh, well, we'll start with the simple linear regression, where we had y equals m plus x plus c, and we're trying to find the value of y. Now with multiple linear regression, we have multiple variables coming in. So instead of having just x, we have x1, x2, x3. And instead of having just one slope, each variable has its own slope attached to it. As you can see here, we have m1, m2, m3, and we still just have the single coefficient. So when you're dealing with multiple linear regression, you basically take your single linear regression and you spread it out. So you have y equals m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2, so on all the way to m to the nth, x to the nth, and then you add your coefficient on there. Implementation of linear regression. Now we get into my favorite part. Let's understand how multiple linear regression works by implementing it in Python. If you remember before, we were looking at a company and just based on its R&D, trying to figure out its profit, we're going to start looking at the expenditure of the company. We're going to go back to that. And we're going to predict its profit. But instead of predicting it just on the R&D, we're going to look at other factors like administration costs, marketing costs, and so on. And from there, we're going to see if we can figure out what the profit of that company is going to be. To start our coding, we're going to begin by importing some basic libraries. And we're going to be looking through the data before we do any kind of linear regression. We're going to take a look at the data to see what we're playing with. Then we'll go ahead and format the data to the format we need to be able to run it in the linear regression model. And then from there, we'll go ahead and solve it and just see how valid our solution is. So let's start with importing the basic libraries. Now, I'm going to be doing this in Anaconda Jupyter Notebook, a very popular IDE. I enjoy it because it's such a visual to look at and it's so easy to use. Um, just any IDE for Python will work just fine for this. So break out your favorite Python IDE. 
So here we are in our Jupyter Notebook. Let me go ahead and paste our first piece of code in there. And let's walk through what libraries we're importing. First, we're going to import numpy as np. And then I want you to skip one line and look at import pandas as pd. These are very common tools that you need with most of your linear regression. The numpy, which stands for number Python, is usually denoted as np, and you have to almost have that for your sklearn toolbox. So you always import that right off the beginning. Pandas, although you don't have to have it for your sklearn libraries, it does such a wonderful job of importing data, setting it up into a data frame so we can manipulate it rather easily, and it has a lot of tools also in addition to that. So we usually like to use the pandas when we can, and I'll show you what that looks like. The other three lines are for us to get a visual of this data and take a look at it. So we're going to import matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt and then seaborn as sns. Seaborn works with the matplot library. So you have to always import matplot library and then seaborn sits on top of it. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. You could use any of your own plotting libraries you want. There's all kinds of ways to look at the data. These are just very common ones, and the Seaborn is so easy to use, it just looks beautiful. It's a nice representation that you can actually take and show somebody. And the final line is the Ambersigned Matplot Library inline. That is only because I'm doing an inline IDE. My interface in the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook requires I put that in there, or you're not going to see the graph when it comes up. Let's go ahead and run this. It's not going to be that interesting, so we're just setting up variables. In fact, it's not going to do anything that we can see, but it is importing these different libraries and setup. The next step is load the data set and extract independent and dependent variables. Now, here in the slide, you'll see companies equals pd.read csv, and it has a long line there with the file at the end, 1000companies.csv. You're going to have to change this to fit whatever setup you have. And the file itself, you can request. Just go down to the commentary below this video and put a note in there and simply learn will try to get in contact with you and supply you with that file so you can try this coding yourself. So we're going to add this code in here and we're going to see that I have companies equals pd.reader underscore csv and I've changed this path to match my computer c colon slash simply learn slash 1000 underscore companies dot csv and then below there we're going to set the x equals to companies under the i location and because this is companies is a pd data set I can use this nice notation that says take every row that's what the colon, the first colon is, comma, except for the last column. That's what the second part is, where we have a colon minus one. And we want the values set into there. So X is no longer a data set, a pandas data set. But we can easily extract the data from our pandas data set with this notation. And then Y, we're going to set equal to the last row. Well, the question is going to be, what are we actually looking at? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And we're going to look at the companies.head, which lists the first five rows of data. And I'll open up the file in just a second so you can see where that's coming from. But let's look at the data in here as far as the way the pandas sees it. When I hit run, you'll see it breaks it out into a nice setup. This is what pandas, one of the things pandas is really good about, is it looks just like an Excel spreadsheet. You have your rows, and remember, when we're programming, we always start with zero. We don't start with one. So it shows the first five rows. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then it shows your different columns. R&D spend, administration, marketing spend, state, profit. It even notes that the top are column names. It was never told that, but Pandas is able to recognize a lot of things that they're not the same as the data rows. Why don't we go ahead and open this file up in a CSV so you can actually see the raw data. So here I've opened it up as a text editor, and you can see at the top we have R&D spend, comma, administration, comma, marketing spend, comma, state, comma, profit, carriage return. I don't know about you, but I'd go crazy trying to read files like this. That's why we use the Pandas. You could also open this up in an Excel and it would separate it since it is a comma separated variable file. But we don't want to look at this one. We want to look at something we can read rather easily. So let's flip back and take a look at that top part, the first five rows. Now, as nice as this format is, where I can see the data, to me it doesn't mean a whole lot. Maybe you're an expert in business and investments and you understand what uh, $165,349.20 compared to the administration cost of $136,897.80, so on, so on, helps to create the profit of $192,261.83. That makes no sense to me whatsoever, no pun intended. So let's flip back here and take a look at our next set of code where we're going to graph it so we can get a better understanding of our data and what it means. So at this point, we're going to use a single line of code to get a lot of information 
so we can see where we're going with this. Let's go ahead and paste that into our uh, notebook and see what we got going. And so we have the visualization, and again we're using SNS, which is pandas. As you can see, we imported the matplotlibrary.pyplot as PLT, which then the Seaborn uses. And we imported the Seaborn as SNS. And then that final line of code helps us show this in our um, inline coding. Without this, it wouldn't display, and you could display it to a file and other means. And that's the matplot library in line with the amber sign at the beginning. So here we come down to the single line of code. Seaborn is great because it actually recognizes the panda data frame. So I can just take the companies.core for coordinates, and I can put that right into the Seaborn. And when we run this, we get this beautiful plot. And let's just take a look at what this plot means. If you look at this plot... On mine, the colors are probably a little bit more purplish and blue than the original one. Uh, we have the columns and the rows. We have R&D spending, we have administration, we have marketing spending, and profit. And if you cross-index any two of these, since we're interested in profit, if you cross-index profit with profit, it's going to show up, if you look at the scale on the right, way up in the dark. Why? Because those are the same data. They have an exact correspondence. So R&D spending is going to be the same as uh, R&D spending and the same thing with administration costs. So right down the middle you get this dark row or dark um, diagonal row that shows that this is the highest corresponding data that's exactly the same. And as it becomes lighter there's less connections between the data. So we can see with profit, obviously profit is the same as profit, and next, it has a very high correlation with R&D spending, which we looked at earlier. And it has a slightly less connection to marketing spending, and even less to how much money we put into the administration. So now that we have a nice look at the data, let's go ahead and dig in and create some actual useful linear regression models so that we can predict values and have a better profit. Now that we've taken a look at the visualization of this data, we're going to move on to the next step. Instead of just having a pretty picture, we need to generate some hard data, some hard values. So let's see what that looks like. We're going to set up our linear regression model in two steps. The first one is we need to prepare some of our data so it fits correctly. And let's go ahead and paste this code into our Jupyter Notebook. And what we're bringing in is we're going to bring in the sklearn preprocessing, where we're going to import the label encoder and the one hot encoder. To use the label encoder, we're going to create a variable called label encoder and set it equal to capital L label capital E encoder. This creates a class that we can reuse for transferring the labels back and forth. Now about now you should ask, what labels are we talking about? Let's go take a look at the data we processed before and see what I'm talking about here. If you remember when we did the companies.head and we printed the top five rows of data, we have our columns going across. And we have column 0, which is R&D spending, column 1, which is administration, column 2, which is marketing spending, and column 3 is state. And you'll see under state we have New York, California, Florida. Now, to do a linear regression model, it doesn't know how to process New York. It knows how to process a number. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to change that New York, California, and Florida, and we're going to change those to numbers. That's what this line of code does here. X equals, and then it has the colon, comma, 3 in brackets. The first part, the colon, comma, means that we're going to look at all the different rows. So we're going to keep them all together. But the only row we're going to edit is the third row. And in there, we're going to take the label coder, and we're going to fit and transform the X, also the third row. So we're going to take that third row, and we're going to set it equal to a transformation. And that transformation basically tells it that instead of having a uh, New York, it has a 0 or a 1 or a 2. And then finally, we need to do a one-hot encoder, which equals one-hot encoder categorical features equals 3. And then we take the X, and we go ahead and do that equal to one hot encoder fit transform x to array. This final transformation preps our data for us so it's completely set the way we need it as just a row of numbers. Even though it's not in here, let's go ahead and print x and just take a look at what this data is doing. You'll see you have an array of arrays and then each array is a row of numbers. And if I go ahead and just do row 0, you'll see I have a nice organized row of numbers that the computer now understands. We'll go ahead and take this out there because it doesn't mean a whole lot to us. It's just a row of numbers. Next, on setting up our data, we have avoiding dummy variable trap. This is very important. Why? Because the computer has automatically transformed our header into the setup. And it's automatically transformed all these different variables. So when we did the encoder, the encoder created two 
columns. And what we need to do is just have the one, because it has both the variable and the name. That's what this piece of code does here. Let's go ahead and paste this in here, and we have x equals x colon comma one colon. All this is doing is removing that one extra column we put in there when we did our one hot encoder and our label encoding. And let's go ahead and run that. And now we get to create our linear regression model. And let's see what that looks like here. And we're going to do that in two steps. The first step is going to be in splitting the data. Now whenever we create a uh, predictive model of data, we always want to split it up so we have a training set and we have a testing set. That's very important, otherwise we'd be very unethical without testing it to see how good our fit is. And then we'll go ahead and create our multiple linear regression model and train it and set it up. Let's go ahead and paste this next piece of code in here. And I'll go ahead and shrink it down a size or two so it all fits on one line. So from the sklearn module selection, we're going to import train test split. And you'll see that we've created four completely different variables. We have capital X train, capital X test, smaller case Y train, smaller case Y test. That is the standard way that they usually reference these when we're doing different uh, models. You usually see that a capital X and you see the train and the test and the lowercase y. What this is, is X is our data going in. That's our R&D spin, our administration, our marketing. And then Y, which we're training, is the answer. That's the profit. Because we want to know the profit of an unknown entity. So that's what we're going to shoot for in this tutorial. The next part, train test split, we take X and we take Y. We've already created those. X has the columns with the data in it, and Y has a column with profit in it. And then we're going to set the test size equals 0.2. That basically means 20%. So 20% of the rows are going to be tested. We're going to just put them off to the side. So since we're using 1,000 lines of data, that means that 200 of those lines we're going to hold off to the side to test for later. And then the random state equals zero. We're going to randomize which ones it picks to hold off to the side. We'll go ahead and run this. It's not overly exciting because it's setting up our variables. But the next step is, the next step we actually create our linear regression model. Now that we got to the linear regression model, we get that next piece of the puzzle. Let's go ahead and put that code in there and walk through it. So here we go. We're going to paste it in there. And let's go ahead and, uh, since this is a shorter line of code, let's zoom up there so we can get a good look. And we have from the sklearn dot linear underscore model, we're going to import linear regression. Now, I don't know if you recall from earlier, when we were doing all the math, let's go ahead and flip back there and take a look at that. Do you remember this, where we had this long formula on the bottom, and we were doing all this summization, and then we also looked at uh, setting it up with the different lines, and then we also looked all the way down to multiple linear regression, where we're adding all those formulas together? All of that is wrapped up in this one section. So what's going on here is I'm going to create a variable called regressor. And the regressor equals the linear regression. That's the linear regression model that has all that math built in. So we don't have to have it all memorized or have to compute it individually. And then we do the regressor.fit. In this case, we do X train and Y train because we're using the training data. X being the data in and Y being profit, what we're looking at. And this does all that math for us. So within one click and one line, we've created the whole linear regression model. And we fit the data to the linear regression model. And you can see that when I run the regressor, it gives an output linear regression. It says copy X equals true, fit intercept equals true, in jobs equal one, normalize equals false. It's just giving you some general information on what's going on with that regressor model. Now that we've created our linear regression model, let's go ahead and use it. And if you remember, we kept a bunch of data aside. So we're going to do a y predict variable, and we're going to put in the x test. And let's see what that looks like. Let's scroll up a little bit, paste that in here. Predicting the test set results. So here we have y predict equals regressor dot predict x test going in, and this gives us y predict. Now because I'm in Jupyter inline, I can just put the variable up there, and when I hit the run button, it'll print that array out. I could have just as easily done print y predict. So if you're in a different IDE that's not an inline setup like the Jupyter Notebook, you can do it this way, print y predict. 
And you'll see that for the 200 different test variables we kept off to the side, it's going to produce 200 answers. This is what it says the profit are for those 200 predictions. But let's don't stop there. Let's keep going and take a couple look. We're going to take just a short detail here and calculating the coefficients and the intercepts. This gives us a quick flash at what's going on behind the line. We're going to take a short detour here, and we're going to be calculating the coefficient and intercepts. So you can see what those look like. What's really nice about our regressor we created is it already has the coefficients for us. And we can simply just print regressor.coefficient underscore. When I run this, you'll see our coefficients here. And if we can do the regressor coefficient, we can also do the regressor intercept. And let's run that and take a look at that. This all came from the multiple regression model. And we'll flip over so you can remember where this is going into and where it's coming from. You can see the formula down here where y equals m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2 and so on and so on plus c, the coefficient. So these variables fit right into this formula. y equals slope 1 times column 1 variable plus slope 2 times column 2 variable all the way to the m into the n and x to the n plus c, the coefficient. Or in this case, you have minus 8.89 to the power of 2, etc., etc., times the first column and the second column and the third column. And then our intercept is the minus 103009 point. Boy, it gets kind of complicated when you look at it. This is why we don't do this by hand anymore. This is why we have the computer to make these calculations easy to understand and calculate. Now, I told you that was a short detour, and we're coming towards the end of our script. As you remember from the beginning, I said if we're going to divide this information, we have to make sure it's a valid model, that this model works and understand how good it works. So calculating the R squared value, that's what we're going to use to predict how good our prediction is. And let's take a look at what that looks like in code. And so we're going to use this from sklearn.metrics. We're going to import R2 score. That's the R squared value. And we're looking at the error. So in the R2 score, we take our Y test versus our Y predict. Y test is the actual values we're testing. That was the one that was given to us so we know are true. The Y predict of those 200 values is what we think it was true. And when we go ahead and run this, we see we get a 0.9352. That's the R2 score. Now, it's not exactly a straight percentage, so it's not saying it's 93% correct. But you do want that in the upper 90s oh, and higher shows that this is a very valid prediction based on the R2 score. And if our squared value of 0.91, or 9.2 as we got on our model, because remember it does have a random generation involved, this proves the model is a good model, which means success! Yay! We successfully trained our model with certain predictors and estimated the profit of the companies using linear regression. Use case, loan repayment prediction. Let's get into my favorite part and open up some Python and see what the programming code and the scripting looks like. In here, we're going to want to do a prediction. And we start with this individual here who's requesting to find out how good is customers are going to be, whether they're going to repay their loan or not for his bank. And from that, we want to generate a problem statement to predict if a customer will repay loan amount or not. And then we're going to be using the decision tree algorithm in Python. Let's see what that looks like and let's dive into the code. In our first few steps of implementation, we're going to start by importing the necessary packages that we need from Python. And we're going to load up our data and take a look at what the data looks like. So the first thing I need is I need something to edit my Python and run it in. So let's flip on over. And here I'm using the Anaconda Jupyter Notebook. Now you can use any Python IDE you like to run it in, but I find the Jupyter Notebook's really nice for doing things on the fly. And let's go ahead and just paste that code in the beginning. And before we start, let's talk a little bit about what we're bringing in. And then we're going to do a couple things in here. We have to make a couple changes as we go through this first part of the import. The first thing we bring in is NumPy as NP. That's very standard when we're dealing with uh, mathematics, especially with uh, very complicated machine learning tools. You almost always see the NumPy come in for your num your number. It's called number Python. It has your mathematics in there. In this case, we actually could take it out, but generally you'll need it for most of your different things you work with. And then we're going to use pandas as PD. That's also a standard. The pandas is a data frame setup. And you can liken this to uh, taking your basic data and storing it in a way that looks like an Excel spreadsheet. So as we come back to this, when you see NP or PD, those are very standard uses, you'll know that that's the pandas. And I'll show you a little bit more when we explore the data in just a minute. Then we're going to need to split the data. 
So I'm going to bring in our train, test, and split. And this is coming from the SK Learn package cross-validation. In just a minute, we're going to change that. And we'll go over that too. And then there's also the sk.tree import decision tree classifier. That's the actual tool we're using. Remember I told you don't be afraid of the mathematics. It's going to be done for you. Well, the decision tree classifier has all that mathematics in there for you. So you don't have to figure it back out again. And then we have sklearn.metrics. For accuracy score, we need to score our, our setup. That's the whole reason we're splitting it between the training and testing data. And finally, we still need the sklearn import tree. And that's just the basic tree function that's needed for the decision tree classifier. And finally, we're going to load our data down here. And I'm going to run this, and we're going to get two things on here. One, we're going to get an error. And two, we're going to get a warning. Let's see what that looks like. So the first thing we had is we have an error. Why is this error here? Well, it's looking at this and it says, I need to read a file. And when this was written, the person who wrote it, this is their path where they stored the file. So let's go ahead and fix that. And I'm going to put in here my file path. I'm just going to call it full file name. And you'll see it's on my C drive. And this is very lengthy setup on here where I stored the data2.csv file. Don't worry too much about the full path because on your computer it'll be different. The data.2csv file was generated by Simply Learn. If you want a copy of that, you can comment down below and request it here in the YouTube. And then if I'm going to give it a name, full file name, I'm going to go ahead and change it here to full file name. So let's go ahead and run it now and see what happens. and we get a warning. When you're coding, understanding these different warnings and these different errors that come up is probably the hardest lesson to learn. So let's just go ahead and take a look at this and use this as a uh, opportunity to understand what's going on here. If you read the warning, it says the cross-validation is depreciated. So it's a warning on it's being removed. And it's going to be moved in favor of the model selection so if we go up here, we have sklearn.crossvalidation. And if you research this and go to the sklearn site, you'll find out that you can actually just swap it right in there with model selection. And so when I come in here and I run it again, that removes a warning. What they've done is they've had two different developers develop it in two different branches. And then they decided to keep one of those and eventually get rid of the other one. That's all that is and very easy and quick to fix. Before we go any further, I went ahead and opened up the data from this file. Remember the, the data file we just loaded on here, the data underscore 2.csv. Let's talk a little bit more about that and see what that looks like both as a text file, because it's a comma separated variable file, and in a spreadsheet. This is what it looks like as a basic text file. You can see at the top they've created a header and it's got one, two, three, four, five columns and each column has data in it. And let me flip this over because we're also going to look at this uh, in an actual spreadsheet so you can see what that looks like. And here I've opened it up in the open office calc which is pretty much the same as um, Excel and zoomed in and you can see we've got our columns and our rows of data. A little easier to read in here. We have a result, yes, yes, no. We have initial payment, last payment, credit score, house number. If we scroll way down, we'll see that this occupies 1,001 lines of code or lines of data with uh, the first one being a column and then 1,000 lines of data. Now, as a programmer, if you're looking at a small amount of data, I usually start by pulling it up in different sources so I can see what I'm working with. But in larger data, you won't have that option. It'll just be um, too, too large. So you need to either bring in a small amount that you can look at it like we're doing right now, or we can start looking at it through the Python code. So let's go ahead and move on and take the next couple steps to explore the data using Python. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like in Python to print the length and the shape of the data. So let's start by printing the length of the database. We can use a simple lin function from Python. And when I run this, you'll see that it's a thousand long. And that's what we expected. There's a thousand lines of data in there if you subtract the uh, column head. And this is one of the nice things when we did the uh, balance data from the panda read CSV, you'll see that the header is row zero, so it automatically removes a row. 
and then shows the data separate. It does a good job sorting that data out for us. And then we can use a different function, and let's take a look at that. And uh, again, we're going to utilize the tools in Panda. And since the balance underscore data was loaded as a Panda data frame, we can do a shape on it. And let's go ahead and run the shape and see what that looks like. What's nice about the shape is not only does it give me the length of the data, we have a thousand lines, it also tells me there's five columns. So when we were looking at the data, we had five columns of data. And then let's take one more step to explore the data using Python. And now that we've taken a look at the length and the shape, let's go ahead and use the uh, pandas module for head, another beautiful thing in the data set that we can utilize. So let's put that on our sheet here, and we have print data set and balance data dot head. And this is a pandas print statement of its own. So it has its own print feature in there. And then we went ahead and gave a label for our print job here of data set, just a simple print statement. And when we run that, and let's just take a closer look at that. Let me zoom in here. There we go. Pandas does such a wonderful job of making this a very clean readable data set. So you can look at the data, you can look at the column headers, you can have it, uh, when you put it as the head, it prints the first five lines of the data. And we always start with zero. So we have five lines, we have zero, one, two, three, four, instead of one, two, three, four, five. That's a standard scripting and programming set, is you want to start with the zero position. And that is what the data head does. It pulls the first five rows of data, puts it in a nice format that you can look at and view. Very powerful tool to view the data. So instead of having to flip and open up an Excel spreadsheet or open Office Calc or trying to look at a Word doc where it's all scrunched together and hard to read, you can now get a nice open view of what you're working with. We're working with a shape of a thousand long, five wide, so we have five columns, and we do the full data head, you can actually see what this data looks like. The initial payment, last payment, credit scores, house number. So let's take this, now that we've explored the data, and let's start digging into the decision tree. So in our next step, we're going to train and build our data tree. And to do that, we need to first separate the data out. We're going to separate it into two groups so that we have something to actually train the data with and then we have some data on the side to test it to see how good our model is. Remember with any of the machine learning you always want to have some kind of test set to, to weigh it against so you know how good your model is when you distribute it. Let's go ahead and break this code down and look at it in pieces. So first we have our X and Y. Where do X and Y come from? Well X is going to be our data and Y is going to be the answer or the target. You can look at it source and target. In this case, we're using X and Y to denote the data in and the data that we're actually trying to guess what the answer is going to be. And so to separate it, we can simply put in X equals the balance of the data dot values. The first brackets means that we're going to select all the lines in the database. So it's all the data. And the second one says we're only going to look at columns one through five. Remember, we always start with zero. Zero is a yes or no, and that's whether the loan went default or not. So we want to start with one. If we go back up here, that's the initial payment, and it goes all the way through the house number. Well, if we want to look at uh, one through five, we can do the same thing for Y, which is the answers, and we're going to set that just equal to the zero row. So it's just the zero row, and then it's all rows going in there. So now we've divided this into two different data sets, one of them with the data going in and one with the answers. Next, we need to split the data. And here you'll see that we have it split into four different parts. The first one is your X training, your X test, your Y train, your Y test. Simply put, we have X going in where we're going to train it and we have to know the answer to train it with. And then we have X test where we're going to test that data. And we have to know in the end what the Y was supposed to be. And that's where this train test split comes in that we loaded earlier in the modules. This does it all for us. And you can see they set the test size equal to 0.3. So that's roughly 30% will be used in the test. And then we use a random state so it's completely random which rows it takes out of there. And then finally we get to actually build our decision tree. And they've called it here CLF underscore entropy. That's the actual decision tree, or decision tree classifier. And in here they've added a couple variables, which we'll explore in just a minute. 
And then finally, we need to fit the data to that. So we take our CLF entropy that we created, and we fit the X train. And since we know the answers for X train are the Y train, we go ahead and put those in. And let's go ahead and run this. And what most of these sklearn modules do is when you set up the variable, in this case, when we set the CLF entropy equal decision tree classifier, it automatically prints out what's in that decision tree. There's a lot of variables you can play with in here. And it's quite beyond the scope of this tutorial to go through all of these and how they work. But we're working on entropy. That's one of the options. We've added that it's completely a random state of 100, so 100%. And we have a max depth of 3. Now the max depth, if you remember above when we were doing the different graphs of animals, means it's only going to go down three layers before it stops. And then we have minimal samples of leaves is five. So it's going to have at least five leaves at the end. So it'll have at least three splits. It'll have no more than three layers and at least five end leaves with the final result at the bottom. Now that we've created our decision tree classifier, not only created it but trained it, Let's go ahead and apply it and see what that looks like. So let's go ahead and make a prediction and see what that looks like. We're going to paste our predict code in here. And before we run it, let's just take a quick look at what it's doing here. We have a variable y predict that we're going to do. And we're going to use our variable clf entropy that we created. And then you'll see dot predict. And it's very common in the sklearn modules that their different tools have the predict when you're actually running a prediction. In this case, we're going to put our X test data in here. Now, if you delivered this for use, an actual commercial use, and distributed it, this would be the new loans you're putting in here to guess whether the person's going to be, uh, pay them back or not. In this case, though, we need to test out the data and just see how good our sample is, how good of our tree does at predicting the loan payments. And finally, since Anaconda Jupyter Notebook is, works as a command line for Python, we can simply put the Y predict E in to print it. I could just as easily have put the print and put brackets around Y predict E in to print it out. We'll go ahead and do that. It doesn't matter which way you do it. And you'll see right here that it runs a prediction. This is roughly 300 in here. Remember, it's 30% of 1,000, so you should have about 300 answers in here. And this tells you which each one of those lines of our uh, test went in there, and this is what our Y predict came out. So let's move on to the next step. Where we're going to take this data and try to figure out just how good a model we have. So here we go. Since sklearn does all the heavy lifting for you and all the math, we have a simple line of code to let us know what the accuracy is. And let's go ahead and go through that and see what that means and what that looks like. Let's go ahead and paste this in. And let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. So you have a nice full picture. And we'll see here we're just going to do a print accuracy is. And then we do the accuracy score. And this was something we imported um, earlier, if you remember at the very beginning. Let me just scroll up there real quick so you can see where that's coming from. That's coming from here down here from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score. And you could probably run a script, make your own script to do this very easily. How accurate is it? How many out of 300 do we get right? And so we put in our Y test. That's the one we ran the predict on. And then we put in our Y predict EN. That's the answers we got. And we're just going to multiply that by 100 because this is just going to give us an answer as a decimal. And we want to see it as a percentage. And let's run that and see what it looks like. And if you see here, we got an accuracy of 93.66667. So when we look at the number of loans and we look at how good our model fit, we can tell people it has about a 93.6 fitting to it. So just a quick recap on that. We now have accuracy set up on here. And so we have created a model that uses the decision tree algorithm to predict whether a customer will repay the loan or not. The accuracy of the model is about 94.6%. The bank can now use this model to decide whether it should approve the loan request from a particular customer or not. And so this information is really powerful. We may not be able to, as individuals, understand all these numbers because they have thousands of numbers that come in. But you can see that this is a smart decision for the bank to use a tool like this to help them to predict how good their uh, profit's going to be off of the loan balances and how many are going to default or not. What's in it for you? We're going to cover clustering. What is clustering? K-means clustering, which is one of the most common used clustering tools out there. 
including a flow chart to understand k-means clustering and how it functions. And then we'll do an actual Python live demo on clustering of cars based on brands. Then we're going to cover logistic regression. What is logistic regression? Logistic regression curve and sigmoid function. And then we'll do another Python code demo to classify a tumor as malignant or benign based on features. And let's start with clustering. Suppose we have a pile of books of different genres. Now we divide them into different groups like fiction, horror, education, and as we can see from this young lady, she definitely is into heavy horror. You can just tell by those eyes and the maple Canadian leaf on her shirt. But we have fiction, horror, and education, and we want to go ahead and divide our books up. Well, organizing objects into groups based on similarity is clustering. And in this case, as we're looking at the books, we're talking about clustering things with known categories. But you can also use it to explore data. So you might not know the categories, you just know that you need to divide it up in some way to conquer the data and to organize it better. But in this case, uh, we're going to be looking at clustering in specific categories. And let's just take a deeper look at that. We're going to use k-means clustering. k-means clustering is probably the most commonly used clustering tool in the machine learning library. K-means clustering is an example of unsupervised learning. If you remember from our previous thing, it is used when you have unlabeled data. So we don't know the answer yet. We have a bunch of data that we want to cluster into different groups. Define clusters in the data based on feature similarity. So we've introduced a couple terms here. We've already talked about unsupervised learning and unlabeled data. So we don't know the answer yet. We're just going to group stuff together and see if we can find an answer of how things connect. We've also introduced feature similarity, features being different features of the data. Now with books, we can easily see fiction and horror and history books. But a lot of times with data, some of that information isn't so easy to see right when we first look at it. And so k-means is one of those tools where we can start finding things that connect, that match with each other. Suppose we have these data points and want to assign them into a cluster. Now when I look at these data points, I would probably group them into two clusters just by looking at them. I'd say two of these group of data kind of come together. But in k-means, we pick k-clusters and assign random centroids to clusters, where the k-clusters represents two different clusters. We pick k-clusters and assign random centroids to the clusters, then we compute distance from objects to the centroids. Now we form new clusters based on minimum distances and calculate the centroids. So we figure out what the best distance is for the centroid, then we move the centroid and recalculate those distances. Repeat previous two steps iteratively till the cluster centroids stop changing their positions and become static. Repeat previous two steps iteratively till the cluster centroids stop changing and the positions become static. Once the clusters become static, then k-means clustering algorithm is said to be converged. And there's another term we see throughout machine learning is converged. That means whatever math we're using to figure out the answer has come to a solution or it's converged on an answer. Shall we see the flowchart to understand? Make a little bit more sense by putting it into a, a nice easy step-by-step. So we start, we choose K, we'll look at the elbow method in just a moment. We assign random centroids to clusters, and sometimes you pick the centroids, because you might look at the data in a, in a graph and say, oh, these are probably the central points. Then we compute the distance from the objects to the centroids. We take that and we form new clusters based on minimum distance and calculate their centroids. Then we compute the distance from objects to the new centroids. And then we go back and repeat those last two steps. We calculate the distances. So as we're doing it, it brings into the new centroid. And then we move the centroid around and we figure out what the best, which objects are closest to each centroid. So the objects can switch from one centroid to the other as the centroids are moved around. And we continue that until it is converged. Let's see an example of this. Suppose we have this data set of seven individuals and their score on two topics, A and B. So here's our subject. In this case, referring to the person taking the uh, test. And then we have subject A, where we see what they've scored on their first subject, and we have subject B, and we can see what they score on the second subject. Now, let's take two farthest apart points as initial cluster centroids. Now, remember, we talked about selecting them randomly, or we can also just put them in different points and pick the furthest one apart so they move together. Either one works okay, depending on what kind of data you're working on and what you know about it. So we took the two furthest points, 1 and 1, and 5 and 7. And now let's take the two farthest apart points as initial cluster centroids. 
Each point is then assigned to the closest cluster with respect to the distance from the centroids. So we take each one of these points in there and we measure that distance. And you can see that if we measure each of those distances, and you use the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem for a triangle in this case, because you know the x and the y, and you can figure out the uh, diagonal line from that. Or you can just take a ruler and put it on your monitor. That'd be kind of silly, but it would work if you're just eyeballing it. You can see how they naturally come together in certain areas. Now we again calculate the centroids of each cluster. So cluster 1 and then cluster 2, and we look at each individual dot. There's 1, 2, 3. We're in one cluster. Uh, the centroid then moves over. It becomes 1.8, 2.3. So remember, it was that 1 and 1? Well, the very center of the data we're looking at would put it at the one point, roughly 2, 2, but 1.8 and 2.3. And the second one, if we wanted to make the overall mean vector, the average vector of all the different distances to that centroid, we come up with 4, 1 and 5, 4. So we've now moved the centroids. We compare each individual's distance to its own cluster, mean, and to that of the opposite cluster. And we find, we can build a nice chart on here, that the as we move that centroid around, we now have a new different kind of clustering of groups. And using Euclidean distance between the points and the mean, we get the same formula. You see new formulas coming up. So we have our individual dots, distance to the mean, centroid of the cluster, and distance to the mean, centroid of the cluster. Only individual 3 is nearer to the mean of the opposite cluster, cluster 2, than its own cluster 1. And you can see here in the diagram where we've kind of circled that one in the middle. So when we've moved the, cluster, the centroids of the clusters over, one of the points shifted to the other cluster because it's closer to that group of individuals. Thus, individual 3 is relocated to cluster 2, resulting in a new partition. And we regenerate all those numbers of how close they are to the different clusters. For the new clusters, we will find the actual cluster centroids. So now we move the centroids over. And you can see that we've now formed two very distinct clusters on here. On comparing the distance of each individual's distance to its own cluster mean and to that of the opposite cluster, we find that the data points are stable. Hence, we have our final clusters. Now, if you remember, I brought up a concept earlier K -mean on the k-means algorithm. Choosing the right value of k will help in less number of iterations. And to find the appropriate number of clusters in a data set, we use the elbow method. And within sum of squares, WSS is defined as the sum of the squared distance between each member of the cluster and its centroid. And so you see what we've done here is we have the number of clusters. And as you do the same k-means algorithm over the different clusters, and you calculate what that centroid looks like, and you find the optimal, you can actually find the optimal number of clusters using the elbow of the graph is called as the elbow method. And on this, we guessed at two just by looking at the data. But as you can see, the slope, you actually just look for right there where the elbow is in the slope, and you have a clear answer that we want two different, to start with k-means equals two. A lot of times people end up computing k-means equals two, three, four, five, until they find the value which fits on the elbow joint. Sometimes you can just look at the data and if you're really good with that specific domain, remember domain I mentioned that last time, you'll know that, that where to pick those numbers or where to start guessing at what that k value is. So let's take this and we're going to use a use case using k means clustering to cluster cars into brands using parameters such as horsepower, cubic inches, make, year, etc. So we're going to use the data set cars data having information about three brands of cars Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. We'll go back to my favorite tool, the Anaconda Navigator with the Jupyter Notebook. And let's go ahead and flip over to our Jupyter Notebook. And in our Jupyter Notebook, I'm going to go ahead and just paste the uh, basic code that we usually start a lot of these off with. We're not going to go too much into this code because we've already discussed NumPy, we've already discussed Matplotlibrary, and Pandas. NumPy being the number array, Pandas being the Pandas data frame, and Matplot for the graphing. And don't forget, uh, since if you're using the Jupyter Notebook, you do need the Matplotlibrary in line so that it plots everything on the screen. If you're using a different Python editor, then you probably don't need that because it'll have a pop-up window on your computer. And we'll go ahead and run this just to load our libraries and our setup into here. The next step is, of course, to look at our data, which I've already opened up in a spreadsheet. And you can see here we have the miles per gallon, cylinders, cubic inches, horsepower, weight pounds, how, you know, how heavy it is, time it takes to get to 60. My card is probably on this one at about 80 or 90. What year it is, 
So this is, you can actually see this is kind of older cars, and then the brand, Toyota, Honda, Nissan. So the different cars are coming from all the way from 1971, if we scroll down, to uh, the 80s. We have between the 70s and 80s a number of cars that they've put out. And let's, uh, when we come back here, we're going to do importing the data. So we'll go ahead and do data set equals. And we'll use pandas to read this in, and it's uh, from a CSV file. Remember, you can always post this in the comments and request the data files for these, either in the comments here on the YouTube video or go to simplylearn.com and request that. The cars CSV, I put it in the same folder as the code that I've stored. So my Python code is stored in the same folder, so I don't have to put the full path. If you store them in different folders, you do have to change this and double check your name variables. And we'll go ahead and run this, and uh, we've chosen data set arbitrarily because you know it's a data set we're importing and we've now imported our car CSV into the data set. As you know you have to prep the data so we're going to create the X data. This is the uh, one that we're going to try to figure out what's going on with and then there's a number of ways to do this but we'll do it in a simple loop so you can actually see what's going on. So we'll do for I and X dot columns. So we're going to go through each of the columns and a lot of times it's important I'll, I'll make lists of the columns and do this because I might remove certain columns or there might be columns that I want to be processed differently. But for this, we can go ahead and take X of I and we want to go fill in A. And that's a pandas command. But the question is, what are we going to fill the missing data with? We definitely don't want to just put in a number that doesn't actually mean something. And so one of the tricks you can do with this is we can take X of I and then in addition to that, we want to go ahead and turn this into an integer, because a lot of these are integers. So we'll go ahead and keep it integers. And let me add the bracket here. And a lot of editors will do this. They'll think that you're closing one bracket. Make sure you get that second bracket in there if it's a double bracket. That's always something that happens regularly. So once we have our integer of x of y, this is going to fill in any missing data with the average. And I was so busy closing one set of brackets, I forgot that the mean is also has brackets in there for the pandas. So we can see here we're going to fill in all the data with the average value for that column. So if there's missing data, it's in the average of the data it does have. And then once we've done that, we'll go ahead and loop through it again. And just check and see to make sure everything is filled in correctly. And we'll print. And then we take x is null. And this returns a set of the null value, or the how many lines are null. And we'll just sum that up to see what that looks like. And so when I run this... And so with the X, what we want to do is we want to remove the last column because it had the models. That's what we're trying to see if we can cluster these things and figure out the models. There is so many different ways to sort the X out. For one, we could take the X and we could go data set, our variable we're using, and use the I location, one of the features that's in pandas. And we could take that and then take all the rows and all but the last column of the data set. And at this time we could do values. We just convert it to values. So that's one way to do this. And if I, let me just put this down here and print X. It's a capital X we chose. And I run this, you can see it's just the values. We could also take out the values and it's not gonna return anything because there's no values connected to it. What I like to do with this, is instead of doing the I location, which does integers, more common is to come in here and we have our data set and we're going to do data set dot or data set dot columns. And remember that lists all the columns. So if I come in here, let me just mark that as red and I print data set dot columns. You can see that I have my index here. I have my MPG, cylinders, everything, including the brand, which we don't want. So the way to get rid of the brand would be to do data columns of everything but the last one, minus one. So now if I print this, you'll see the brand disappears. And so I can actually just take data set columns, minus one, and I'll put it right in here for the columns we're going to look at. And uh, let's unmark this. And unmark this. And now if I do an X dot head, I now have a new data frame. And you can see right here we have all the different columns except for the brand at the end of the year. And it turns out when you start playing with the data set, you're going to get an error later on. And it'll say, cannot convert string to uh, float value. 
And that's because it, it, for some reason these things, the way they recorded them, must have been recorded as strings. So we have a neat feature in here on pandas to convert. And it is simply convert objects. And for this we're going to do convert, oops, convert underscore numeric numeric equals true. And yes, I did have to go look that up. I don't have it memorized, the convert numeric in there. If I'm working with a lot of these things, I remember them. But um, depending on where I'm at, what I'm doing, I usually have to look it up. And we run that. Oops, I must have missed something in here. Let me double check my spelling. And when I double check my spelling, you'll see I missed the first underscore in the convert objects. And when I run this, it now has everything converted into a numeric value. Because that's what we're going to be working with is numeric values down here. And the next part is that we need to go through the data and eliminate null values. Most people, when they're doing small amounts, working with small data pools, discover afterwards that they have a null value and they have to go back and do this. So, you know, be aware, whenever we're formatting this data, things are going to pop up and sometimes you go backwards to fix it. And that's fine. That's just part of exploring the data and understanding what you have. And I should have done this earlier, but let me go ahead and Increase the size of my window one notch. There we go. Easier to see. So we'll do for i in working with x dot columns. We'll page through all the columns. And we want to take x of i, and we're going to change that, and we're going to alter it. And so with this, we want to go ahead and fill in x of i. Pandas has the fill in a, and that just fills in any non-existent missing data. I will put my brackets up and there's a lot of different ways to fill this data. If you have a really large data set some people just void out that data because they and then look at it later in a separate uh, exploration of data. One of the tricks we can do is we can take our column and we can find the means. And the means is in other uh, our quotation marks. So when we take the columns, we're going to fill in the, the non-existing one with the means. The problem is that returns a decimal float. So some of these aren't decimals. Certainly, we need to be a little careful of doing this, but for this example, we're just going to fill it in with the integer version of this. It keeps it on par with the other data that isn't a decimal point. And then what we also want to do is we want to double check. A lot of times you do this first part first to double check, then you do the fill, and then you do it again just to make sure you did it right. So we're going to go through and test for missing data. And one of the re ways you can do that is simply go in here and take our x of i column. So it's going to go through the x of i column, it says is null. So it's going to return any, any place there's a null value, it actually goes through the, all the rows of each column, is null, and then we want to go ahead and sum that. So we take that and we add the sum value. And these are all pandas. So is null is a panda command and so is sum. And if we go through that and we go ahead and run it. And we go ahead and take and run that, you'll see that all the columns have zero null values. So we've now tested and double checked and our data is nice and clean. We have no null values. Everything is now a number value. We turned it into numeric. And we've removed the last column in our data. And at this point, we're actually going to start using the elbow method to find the optimal number of clusters. So we're now actually getting into the sklearn part, uh, the k means clustering on here. I guess we'll go ahead and zoom it up one more notch so you can see what I'm typing in here. And then from sklearn, we're going to or sklearn cluster, we're going to import k means. I always forget to capitalize the K and the M when I do this. So it's capital K, capital M, K means. And we'll go ahead and create a um, array, WCSS equals, we'll make it an empty array. If you remember from the elbow method from our slide, within the sum of squares, WSS is defined as the sum of square distance between each member of the cluster in a centroid. So we're looking at that change in differences as far as a squared distance. And we're going to run this over a number of k-mean values. In fact, let's go for i in range, we'll do 11 of them. Range 0 of 11. 
And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create the actual, we'll do it all lowercase. And so we're going to create this object from the k-means that we just imported. And the variable that we want to put into this is in clusters. And we're going to set that equals to i. That's the most important one because we're looking at how increasing the number of clusters changes our answer. There are a lot of settings to the k-means. Our guys in the back did a great job just kind of playing with some of them. The most common ones that you see in a lot of stuff is how you init your k-means. So we have k-means plus plus plus. This is just a tool to let the model itself be smart how it picks its centroids to start with, its initial centroids. We only want to iterate no more than 300 times. We have a max iteration we put in there. We have a, the nth init, the random state equals zero. You really don't need to worry too much about these when you're first learning this. As you start digging in deeper, you start finding that these are shortcuts that will speed up the process as far as the setup. But the big one that we're working with is the in clusters equals i. So we're going to literally train our k-means 11 times. We're going to do this process 11 times. And if you're working with uh, big data, you know the first thing you do is you run a small sample of the data so you can test all your stuff on it. And you can already see the problem that if I'm going to iterate through a terabyte of data 11 times and then the k-means itself is iterating through the data multiple times, that's a heck of a process. So you've got to be a little careful with this. A lot of times, though, you can find your um, elbow, using the elbow method, find your optimal number on a sample of data, especially if you're working with larger data sources. So we want to go ahead and take our k-means, and we're just going to fit it. If you're looking at any of the sklearn, very common, you fit your model. And if you remember correctly, our variable we're using is the capital X. And once we fit this value, we go back to the um, array we made, and we want to go ahead and just append that value on the end. And it's not the actual fit we're pinning in there. It's when it generates it, it generates the value you're looking for is inertia. So k-means.inertia will pull that specific value out that we need. And let's get a visual on this. We'll do our PLT plot. And what we're plotting here is first the x-axis, which is range 0, 11. So that will generate a nice little plot there and the WCSS for our y-axis. It's always nice to give our uh, plot a title. And let's see, we'll just give it the elbow method for the title. And let's get some labels. So let's go ahead and do PLT X label. And what we'll do, we'll do number of clusters for that. And PLT Y label. And for that we can do there we go. WCSS, since that's what we're doing on the plot on there. And finally, we want to go ahead and display our graph, which is simply plt dot, oops, <laughs> dot show. There we go. And because we have it set to inline, it'll appear inline. Hopefully I didn't make a type error on there. And you can see we get a very nice graph. You can see a very nice elbow joint there at uh, 2, and again, right around 3 and 4, and then after that, there's not very much. Now, as a data scientist, if I was looking at this, I would do either 3 or 4, and I'd actually try both of them to see what the um, output looked like. And they've already tried this in the back, so we're just going to use 3 as a setup on here. And let's go ahead and see what that looks like when we actually use this to show the different kinds of cars. And so let's go ahead and apply the k-means to the cars data set. And basically we're going to copy the code that we looped through up above, where k-means equals k-means number of clusters, and we're just going to set the number of clusters to 3, since that's what we're going to look for. And you can do 3 and 4 on this and graph them just to see how they come up differently. It'd be kind of curious to look at that. But for this we're just going to set it to 3. Go ahead and create our own variable, y k-means, for our answers. And we're going to set that equal to, whoops, a double equal there, to k means, but we're not going to do a fit. We're going to do a fit predict is the setup you want to use. And when you're using untrained models, you'll see um, a slightly different, because usually you see fit and then you see just the predict. But we want to both fit and predict the k means on this. 
and that's fit underscore predict, and then our capital X is the data we're working with. And before we plot this data, we're going to do a little pandas trick. And we're going to take our X value and we're going to set X as matrix. So we're converting this into a nice rows and columns kind of setup, but we want the, we're going to have columns equals none, so it's just going to be a matrix of data in here. And let's go ahead and run that. A little warning. You'll see this warnings pop up because things are always being updated. So there's like minor changes in the versions and future versions. Instead of matrix, now the, it's more common to set it dot values instead of doing as matrix. But mass matrix works just fine for right now. And you'll want to update that later on. But let's go ahead and dive in and plot this and see what that looks like. And before we dive into plotting this data, I always like to take a look and see what I am plotting. So let's take a look at why k means. I'm just going to print that out down here. And we see we have an array of answers. We have 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 2. So it's clustering these different rows of data based on the three different spaces it thinks it's going to be. And then let's go ahead and print x and see what we have for x. And we'll see that x is an uh, array, it's a matrix. So we have our different values in the array. And what we're going to do it's very hard to plot all the different values in the array. So we're only going to be looking at the first two, or positions 0 and 1. And if you were doing a full presentation in front of the board meeting, you might actually do a little different and, and dig a little deeper into the different aspects, because this is all the different columns we looked at. But we'll only look at columns 1 and 2 for this to make it easy. So let's go ahead and clear this data out of here, and let's bring up our plot. And we're going to do a scatter plot here. So PLT, scatter, and this looks a little complicated. So let's explain what's going on with this. We're going to take the X values, and we're only interested in Y of K means equals zero, the first cluster. Okay? And then we're going to take value zero for the X axis, and then we're going to do the same thing here. We're only interested in k means equals zero, but we're going to take the second column. So we're only looking at the first two columns in our answer, or in the data. And then the guys in the back played with this a little bit to make it pretty. And they discovered that it looks good with as a size equals 100. That's the size of the dots. We're going to use red for this one. And when they were looking at the data and what came out, it was uh, definitely the Toyota on this. So we're just going to go ahead and label it Toyota. Again, that's something you really have to explore in here as far as playing with those numbers and see what looks good. We'll go ahead and hit enter in there. And I'm just going to paste in the next two lines, which is the next two cars. And this is our Nisa and Honda. And you'll see with our scatter plot, we're now looking at where y underscore k means equals 1. And we want the 0 column and y k means equals 2. Again, we're looking at just the first two columns, 0 and 1. And each of these rows then corresponds to Nissan and Honda. And I'll go ahead and hit enter on there. And uh, finally, let's take a look and put the centroids on there. Again, we're going to do a scatter plot. And on the centroids, you can just pull that from our k-means, the uh, model we created, dot cluster centers. And we're going to just do um, all of them in the first number and all of them in the second number, which is 0, 1, because you always start with 0 and 1. And then if we were playing with the size and everything to make it look good, we'll do a size of 300. We're going to make the color yellow, and we'll label them, uh, it's always good to have some good labels, centroids. And then we do want to do a title, PLT title, and pop up there. PLT title, because you always make, want to make your graphs look pretty, and we'll call it clusters of car make. And one of the features of the plot library is you can add a legend. It'll automatically bring in it, since we've already labeled the different aspects of the legend with Toyota, Nissan, and Honda. And finally, we want to go ahead and show. So we can actually see it. And remember, it's inline. Uh, so if you're using a different editor that's not the Jupyter Notebook, you'll get a pop-up of this. And you should have a nice set of clusters here. So we can look at this, and we have uh, clusters of Honda in green, Toyota in red, Nissan in purple. And you can see where they put the centroids to separate them. 
Now, when we're looking at this, we can also plot a lot of other different data on here as far, because we only looked at the first two columns. This is just column one and two, or zero, one, as, as you label them in computer scripting. But you can see here we have a nice clusters of car make, and we were able to pull out the data, and you can see how just these two columns form very distinct clusters of data. So if you were exploring new data, you might take a look and say, well, what makes these different? Almost going in reverse, you start looking at the data and pulling apart the columns to find out why is the first group set up the way it is. Maybe you're doing loans, and you want to go, well, why is this group not defaulting on their loans? And why is the last group defaulting on their loans? And why is the middle group 50% defaulting on their bank loans? And you start finding ways to manipulate the data and pull out the answers you want. So now that you've seen how to use k-mean for clustering, let's move on to the next topic. Now let's look into logistic regression. The logistic regression algorithm is the simplest classification algorithm used for binary or multi-classification problems. And we can see we have our little girl from Canada who's into horror books is back. That's actually really scary when you think about that with those big eyes. In the previous tutorial, we learned about linear regression, dependent and independent variables. So, to brush up, y equals mx plus c. Very basic algebraic function of uh, y and x. The dependent variable is the target class variable we are going to predict. The independent variables, x1 all the way up to xn, are the features or attributes we're going to use to predict the target class. We know what a linear regression looks like, but using the graph, we cannot divide the outcome into categories. It's really hard to categorize 1.5, 3.6, 9.8. Uh, for example, a linear regression graph can tell us that with increase in number of hours studied, the marks of a student will increase, but it will not tell us whether the student will pass or not. In such cases where we need the output as categorical value, we will use logistic regression. And for that, we're going to use the sigmoid function. So you can see here we have our marks, 0 to 100, number of hours studied. That's going to be what they're comparing it to in this example. And we usually form a line that says y equals mx plus c. And when we use the sigmoid function, we have p equals 1 over 1 plus e to the minus y. It generates a sigmoid curve. And so you can see right here, when you take the ln, which is the natural logarithm, I always thought it should be NL, not LN. That's just the inverse of uh, E, or E to the minus Y. And so when we do this, we get uh, LN of P over 1 minus P equals M times X plus C. That's the sigmoid curve function we're looking for. And we can zoom in on the function, and you'll see that the function, as it derives, goes to 1 or to 0, depending on what your x value is. And the probability, if it's greater than 0.5, the value is automatically rounded off to 1, indicating that the student will pass. So if they're doing a certain amount of studying, they will probably pass. Then you have a threshold value at the 0.5. It automatically puts that right in the middle, usually. And your probability, if it's less than 0.5, the value rounded off to 0, indicating the student will fail. So if they're not studying very hard, they're probably going to fail. This, of course, is ignoring the outliers of that one student who's just a natural genius and doesn't need any studying to memorize everything. That's not me, unfortunately. <laughs> I have to study hard to learn new stuff. Problem statement. To classify whether a tumor is malignant or benign. And this is actually one of my favorite data sets to play with because it has so many features, and when you look at them, you really are hard to understand. You can't just look at them and know the answer. So it gives you a chance to kind of dive into what data looks like when you aren't able to understand the specific domain of the data. But I also want you to remind you that in the domain of medicine, if I told you that my probability was really good at classified things at, say, 90% or 95%, and I'm classifying whether you're going to have a malignant or a benign tumor, I'm guessing that you're going to go get it tested anyways. So you've got to remember the domain we're working with. So why would you want to do that if you know you're just going to go get a biopsy because, you know, it, it's that serious. This is like an all or nothing. Just referencing the domain, it's important. It might help the doctor know where to look just by understanding what kind of tumor it is. So it might help them or aid them in something they missed from before. So let's go ahead and dive into the code, and I'll come back to the domain part of it in just a minute. So use case, and we're going to do our normal imports here where we're importing numpy 
pandas, seaborn, the matplotlib library, and we're going to do matplotlib inline since I'm going to switch over to anaconda. So let's go ahead and flip over there and get this started. So I've opened up a new window in my anaconda Jupyter notebook. And by the way, Jupyter notebook, uh, you don't have to use anaconda for the Jupyter notebook. I just love the interface and all the tools that anaconda brings. So we got our import numpy as in p for our uh, numpy number array. We have our pandas pd. We're going to bring in seaborn to help us with our graphs as sns. So many really nice tools in both seaborn and matplot library. And we'll do our matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt. And then, of course, we want to let it know to do it in line. And let's go ahead and just run that so it's all set up. And we're just going to call our data data, <laughs> not creative today, uh, equals pd, and this happens to be in a csv file. So we'll use the pd.read underscore csv, and I happen to name the file, I renamed it, data for p2.csv. You can, of course, um, write in the comments below the YouTube and request for the data set itself, or go to the Simply Learn website, and we'll be happy to supply that for you. And let's just um, open up the data before we go any further, and let's just see what it looks like in a spreadsheet. So when I pop it open in a local spreadsheet, and this is just a CSV file, comma separated variables, we have an ID. So I guess they um, categorize this for reference or what ID, which test was done. The diagnosis, M for malignant, B for B9. So there's two different options on there. And that's what we're going to try to predict is the M and B and test it. And then we have like the radius mean or average, the texture average, perimeter mean, area mean, smoothness. I don't know about you, but unless you're a doctor in the field, most of the stuff, I mean, you can guess what concave means just by the term concave, but I really wouldn't know what that means in the measurements they're taking. So they have all kinds of stuff like how smooth it is, uh, the symmetry, and these are all float values. We can just page through them real quick, and you'll see there's, I believe, 36, if I remember correctly, in this one. So there's a lot of different values they take and all these measurements they take when they go in there and they take a look at the different growth, the tumorous growth. So back in our data, and I put this in the same folder as the code. So I saved this code in that folder. Obviously, if you have it in a different location, you want to put the full path in there. And we'll just do uh, pandas first five lines of data with the data.head. When we run that, we can see that we have pretty much what we just looked at. We have an ID, we have a diagnosis. If we go all the way across, you'll see all the different columns coming across displayed nicely for our data. And while we're exploring the data, our uh, Seaborn, which we referenced as SNS, makes it very easy to go in here and do a joint plot. You'll notice the uh, very similar to, because it is sitting on top of the um, plot library, so the joint plot does a lot of work for us. And we're just going to look at the first two columns that we're interested in, the radius mean and the texture mean. We'll just look at those two columns. And data equals data. So that tells it which two columns we're plotting and that we're going to use the data that we pulled in. And let's just run that. And it generates a really nice graph on here. And there's all kinds of cool things on this graph to look at. I mean, we have the texture mean and the radius mean, obviously the axes. You can also see... Uh, and uh, one of the cool things on here is you can also see the histogram. They show that for the radius mean. Where is the most common radius mean come up and where the most common texture is? Uh, so we're looking at the, the uh, on each growth, it's average texture, and on each radius, it's average uh, radius on there. It gets a little confusing because we're talking about the individual objects average. And then we can also look over here and see the, the histogram showing us the median or how common each measurement is. And that's only two columns, so let's dig a little deeper into Seaborn. They also have a heat map. And if you're not familiar with heat maps, a heat map just means it's in color. That's all that means. Heat map, I guess the original ones were plotting heat density on something, and so ever since then it's just called a heat map. And we're going to take our data and get our corresponding numbers to put that into the heat map. And that's simply data.corr for that, that's a pandas expression. Let's remember we're working in a pandas data frame, so that's one of the cool tools in pandas for our data. And let's just pull that information into a heat map and see what that looks like. And you'll see that we're now looking at all the different features. We have our ID, we have our texture, we have our area, our compactness, concave points. 
And if you look down the middle of this chart, diagonal, going from the upper left to bottom right, it's all white. That's because when you compare texture to texture, they're identical. So they're 100%, or in this case, a perfect one in their correspondence. And you'll see that when you look at, say, area, or right below it, it has almost a black on there when you compare it to texture. So these have almost no corresponding data. They don't really form a linear graph or something that you can look at and say how connected they are. They're very scattered data. This is really just a really nice graph to get a quick look at your data. It doesn't so much change what you do, but it changes verifying. So when you get an answer or something like that, or you start looking at some of these individual pieces, you might go, hey, that doesn't match. According to showing our heat map, this should not correlate with each other. And if it is, you're going to have to start asking, well, why? What's going on? What else is coming in there? But it does show some really cool information on here. I mean, we can see from the ID, there's no real one feature that just says, if you go across the top line, that lights up. There's no one feature that says, hey, if the area is a certain size, then it's going to be benign or malignant. It says there's some that sort of add up. And that's a big hint in the data that we're trying to ID this, whether it's malignant or benign. That's a big hint to us as data scientists to go, okay, we can't solve this with any one feature. It's going to be something that includes all the features or many of the different features to come up with a solution for it. And while we're exploring the data, let's explore one more area and let's look at data.isNull. We want to check for null values in our data. If you remember from earlier in this tutorial, we did it a little differently where we added stuff up and summed them up. You can actually, with pandas, do it really quickly, data.isNull and sum it, and it's going to go across all the columns. So when I run this, you're going to see all the columns come up with no null data. So we've just, just to rehash these last few steps, we've done a lot of exploration. We have looked at the first two columns and seen how they plot with the Seaborn, with a joint plot, which shows both the histogram and the data plotted on the XY coordinates. And obviously, you can do that more in detail with different columns and see how they plot together. And then we took and did the Seaborn heat map, the SNS dot heat map of the data. And you can see right here where it did a nice job showing us some bright spots where stuff correlates with each other and forms a very nice combination or points of scattering points. And you can also see areas that don't. And then finally we went ahead and checked the data. Is the data null value? Do we have any missing data in there? Very important step because it'll crash later on. If you forget to do this step, it will remind you when you get that nice error code that says null values. Okay, so not a big deal if you miss it, but it, it's no fun having to go back when you're when you're in a huge process and you've missed this step, and now you're 10 steps later and you got to go remember where you were pulling the data in. So we need to go ahead and pull out our x and our y. So we just put that down here. And we'll set the x equal to, and there's a lot of different options here. Certainly we could do x equals all the columns except for the first two. Because if you remember the first two is the ID and the diagnosis. So that certainly would be an option. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to focus on the worst. The worst radius, the worst texture, parameter, area, smoothness, compactness, and so on. One of the reasons to start dividing your data up when you're looking at this information is sometimes the data will be the same data coming in. So if I have two measurements coming into my model, it might overweigh them. It might overpower the other measurements because it's, measure, it's basically taking that information in twice. That's a little bit past the scope of this tutorial. What I want you to take away from this though is that we are dividing the data up into pieces and our team in the back went ahead and said, hey, let's just look at the worst. So I'm going to create a, an array and you'll see this array, radius worst, texture worst, perimeter worst. We've just taken the worst of the worst, and I'm just going to put that in my X. So this X is still a pandas data frame, but it's just those columns. And our Y, if you remember correctly, is going to be, oops, hold on one second. It's not X, it's data. There we go. So X equals data, and then it's a list of the different columns, the worst of the worst. And if we're going to take that, then we have to have our answer for our Y for the stuff we know. And if you remember correctly, we're just going to be looking at 
the diagnosis. That's all we care about is what is it diagnosed? Is it uh, benign or malignant? And since it's a single column, we can just do diagnosis. Oh, I forgot to put the brackets. Or the, there we go. Okay. So it's just diagnosis on there. And we can also real quickly do like x dot head if you want to see what that looks like. And y dot head. And run this. And you'll see um, it only does the last one. I forgot about that if you don't do print. You can see that the, the y dot head is just mmm because the first ones are all malignant. And if I run this, the x dot head. It's just the first five values of radius worst, texture worst, parameter worst, area worst, and so on. I'll go ahead and take that out. So moving down to the next step, we've built our two data sets, our answer and then the features we want to look at. In data science, it's very important to test your model. So we do that by splitting the data. And from sklearn model selection, we're going to import train test split. So we're going to split it into two groups. There are so many ways to do this. I noticed in one of the more modern ways, they actually split it into three groups. And then you model each group and test it against the other groups. So you have all kinds of, and there's reasons for that, which is past the scope of this. And for this particular example, isn't necessary. For this, we're just going to split it into two groups, one to train our data and one to test our data. and the sklearn uh, dot model selection we have train test split you could write your own quick code to do this we just randomly divide the data up into two groups but they do it for us nicely and we actually can almost we can actually do it in one statement with this where we're going to generate four variables capital x train capital x test so we have our training data we're going to use to fit the model and then we need something to test it and then we have our Y train, so we're going to train the answer. And then we have our test. So this is the stuff we want to see how good it did on our model. And we'll go ahead and take our train test split that we just imported. And we're going to do X and our Y, our two different data that's going in for our split. And then the guys in the back came up and wanted us to go ahead and use a test size equals 0.3. That's test underscore size. Random state. It's always nice to kind of switch your random state around, but not that important. What this means is that the test size is we're going to take 30% of the data and we're going to put that into our test variables, our Y test and our X test. And we're going to do 70% into the X train and the Y train. So we're going to use 70% of the data to train our model and 30% to test it. Let's go ahead and run that and load those up. So now we have all our stuff split up and all our data ready to go. And now we get to the actual logistics part. We're actually going to do our create our model. So let's go ahead and bring that in from sklearn. We're going to bring in our linear model and we're going to import logistic regression. That's the actual model we're using. And this we'll call it log model. Oops, there we go. Model. And let's just set this equal to our logistic regression that we just imported. So now we have a variable log model set to that class for us to use. And with most of the uh, models in the sklearn, we just need to go ahead and fix it, fit, do a fit on there. And we use our x train that we separated out with our y train. And let's go ahead and run this. So once we've run this, we'll have a model that fits this data, that 70% of our training data. Uh, and of course, it prints this out that tells us all the different variables that you can set on there. There's a lot of different choices you can make. But for Word we're just going to let all the defaults sit. We don't really need to mess with those on this particular example. And there's nothing in here that really stands out as super important until you start fine-tuning it. But for what we're doing, the basics will work just fine. And then let's we need to go ahead and test out our model. Is it working? So let's create a variable y predict. And this is going to be equal to our log model. And we want to do a predict. Again, very standard format for the sklearn library is taking your model and doing a predict on it. And we're going to test y predict against the y test. So we want to know what the model thinks it's going to be. That's what our y predict is. And with that we want the capital X X test. So we have our train set and our test set and now we're going to do our y predict. And let's go ahead and run that. And if we uh, print y predict Go ahead and run that. You'll see it comes up and it presents a nice, 
prints a nice array of uh, B and M for B9 and malignant for all the different test data we put in there. So it does pretty good. We're not sure exactly how good it does, but we can see that it actually works and is functional. It was very easy to create. You'll always discover with our data science that as you explore this, you spend a significant amount of time prepping your data and making sure your data coming in is good. Uh, there's a saying, good data in, good answers out. Bad data in, bad answers out. That's only half the thing. That's only half of it. Selecting your models becomes the next part as far as how good your models are. And then, of course, fine-tuning it depending on what model you're using. So we come in here, we want to know how good this came out. So we have our y predict here, log model dot predict x test. So for deciding how good our model is, we're going to go from the sklearn.metrics, we're going to import classification report. And that just reports how good our model is doing. And then we're going to feed it the model data. And let's just print this out. And we'll take our classification report. And we're going to put into there our test, our actual data. So this is what we actually know is true. And our prediction, what our model predicted for that data on the test side. And let's run that and see what that does. So we pull that up, you'll see that we have um, a precision for B9 and malignant B and M. And we have a precision of 93, a 91, a total of 92. So it's kind of the average between these two of 92. There's all kinds of different information on here. Your F1 score, your recall, your support coming through on this. And for this, I'll go ahead and just flip back to our slides that they put together for describing it. And so here we're going to look at the precision using the classification report. And you see this is the same printout I had up above. Some of the numbers might be different because it does randomly pick out which data we're using. So this model is able to predict the type of tumor with 91% accuracy. So when we look back here, that's, you'll see where we have uh, B9 and malignant. It actually is 92 coming up here. But we're looking at about a 92, 91% precision. And remember, I reminded you about domains. So when we're talking about the domain of a medical domain, with a very catastrophic outcome, you know, at 91 or 92 percent precision, you're still going to go in there and have somebody do a biopsy on it. Very different than if you're investing money and there's a 92 percent chance you're going to earn 10 percent and 8 percent chance you're going to lose 8 percent, you're probably going to bet the money because at that odds it's pretty good that you'll make some money and in the long run you do that enough, you definitely will make money. And also with this domain, I've actually seen them use this to identify different forms of cancer. That's one of the things that they're starting to use these models for, because then it helps the doctor know what to investigate. So that wraps up this section. We're going to cover the K nearest neighbors, a lot referred to as KNN. And KNN is really a fundamental place to start in the machine learning. It's a basis of a lot of other things, and just the logic behind it is easy to understand and incorporated in other forms of machine learning. So today, what's in it for you? Why do we need KNN? What is KNN? How do we choose the factor K? When do we use KNN? How does KNN algorithm work? And then we'll dive into my favorite part, the use case. Predict whether a person will have diabetes or not. That is a very common and popular used data set as far as testing out models and learning how to use the different models in machine learning. By now, we all know machine learning models make predictions by learning from the past data available. So we have our input values, our machine learning model builds on those inputs of what we already know, and then we use that to create a predicted output. Is that a dog? Little kid looking over there and watching the black cat cross their path. No, dear, you can differentiate between a cat and a dog based on their characteristics. Cats. Cats have sharp claws, uses to climb, smaller length of ears, meows and purrs, doesn't love to play around. Dogs have dull claws, bigger length of ears, barks, loves to run around. You usually don't see a cat running around people, although I do have a cat that does that, where dogs do. And we can look at these, we can say, uh, we can evaluate their sharpness of the claws, how sharp are their claws, and we can evaluate the length of the ears, and we can usually sort out cats from dogs based on even those two characteristics. Now tell me if it is a cat or a dog. 
Not a question. Usually little kids know cats and dogs by now. <laughs> Unless they live in a place where there's not many cats or dogs. So if we look at the sharpness of the claws, the length of the ears, and we can see that the cat has smaller ears and sharper claws than the other animals. Its features are more like cats. It must be a cat. Sharp claws, length of ears, and it goes in the cat group. Because KNN is based on feature similarity, we can do classification using KNN classifier. So we have our input value, the picture of the black cat. It goes into our trained model, and it predicts that this is a cat coming out. So what is KNN? What is the KNN algorithm? K nearest neighbors is what that stands for. It's one of the simplest supervised machine learning algorithms mostly used for classification. So we want to know, is this a dog or is not a dog? Is it a cat or not a cat? It classifies a data point based on how its neighbors are classified. KNN stores all available cases and classifies new cases based on a similarity measure. And here we've gone from cats and dogs right into wine, another favorite of mine. KNN stores all available cases and classifies new cases based on a similarity measure. And here you see we have a measurement of sulfur dioxide versus the chloride level, and then the different wines they've tested and where they fall on that graph based on how much sulfur dioxide and how much chloride. K and KNN is a perimeter that refers to the number of nearest neighbors to include in the majority of the voting process. And so if we add a new glass of wine there, red or white, we want to know what the neighbors are. In this case, we're going to put uh, K equals 5. We'll talk about K in just a minute. A data point is classified by the majority of votes from its five nearest neighbors. Here, the unknown point would be classified as red, since four out of five neighbors are red. So how do we choose K? How do we know K equals 5? I mean, that was the value we put in there, so we're going to talk about it. How do we choose the factor K? K and N algorithm is based on feature similarity. Choosing the right value of K is a process called parameter tuning and is important for better accuracy. So at K equals 3, we can classify, we have a question mark in the middle, as either a, as a square or not. Is it a square or is it, in this case, a triangle? And so if we set K equals to 3, we're going to look at the three nearest neighbors. We're going to say this is a square. And if we put K equals to 7, we classify as a triangle depending on what the other data is around it. And you can see as the K changes, depending on where that point is, that drastically changes your answer. And uh, we jump here where we go, how do we choose the factor of K? You'll find this in all machine learning. Choosing these factors, that's the face you get. He's like, oh my gosh, did I choose the right K? Did I set it right, my values in whatever machine learning tool you're looking at, so that you don't have a huge bias in one direction or the other? And in terms of KNN, the number of K, if you choose it too low, the bias is based on, it's just too noisy. It's, it's right next to a couple things, and it's going to pick those things, and you might get a skewed answer. And if your K is too big, then it's going to take forever to process. So you're going to run into processing issues and resource issues. So what we do, the most common use, and there's other options for choosing K, is to use the square root of N. So n is a total number of values you have, and you take the square root of it. In most cases, you also, if it's an even number, so if you're using, uh, like in this case, squares and triangles, if it's even, you want to make your k value odd. That helps it select better. So in other words, you're not going to have a balance between two different factors that are equal. So usually you take the square root of n, and if it's even, you add one to it or subtract one from it, and that's where you get the k value from. That is the most common use, and it's pretty solid. It works very well. When do we use KNN? We can use KNN when data is labeled. So you need a label on it. We know we have a group of pictures with dogs, dogs, cats, cats. Data is noise free. And so you can see here, when we have a class and we have like underweight, 140, 23, Hello Kitty, normal, that's pretty confusing. We have a, a high variety of data coming in, so it's very noisy. And that would cause an issue. Data set is small, so we're usually working with smaller data sets where I mean, you might get into a gig of data if it's really clean, it doesn't have a lot of noise. Because KNN is a lazy learner, i.e. it doesn't learn a discriminative function from the training set. So it's very lazy, so if you have very complicated data, data and you have a large amount of it, you're not going to use the KNN. But it's really great to get a place to start. Even with large data, you can sort out a small sample and get an idea of what that looks like using the KNN. And also just using for smaller data sets, KNN works really good. How does the KNN algorithm work? Consider a data set having two variables, height in centimeters and weight in kilograms. And each point is classified as normal or underweight. 
So we can see right here we have two variables, you know, true, false. They're either normal or they're not. They're underweight. On the basis of the given data, we have to classify the below set as normal or underweight using KNN. So if we have new data coming in that says 57 kilograms and 177 centimeters, is that going to be normal or underweight? To find the nearest neighbors, we'll calculate the Euclidean distance. According to the Euclidean distance formula, the distance between two points in the plane with the coordinates x, y, and a, b is given by distance d equals the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared. And you can remember that from the two edges of a triangle. We're computing the third edge since we know the x side and the y side. Let's calculate it to understand clearly. So we have our unknown point, and we placed it there in red, and we have our other points where the data is scattered around. The distance d1 is the square root of 170 minus 167 squared plus 57 minus 51 squared, which is about 6.7. And distance 2 is about 13. And distance 3 is about 13.4. Similarly, we will calculate the Euclidean distance of unknown data point from all the points in the data set. And because we're dealing with small amount of data, that's not that hard to do. and It's actually pretty quick for a computer. And it's not a really complicated math. So you can just see how close is the data based on the Euclidean distance. Hence, we have calculated the Euclidean distance of unknown data point from all the points as shown, where x1 and y1 equal 57 and 170, whose class we have to classify. So now we're looking at that, we're saying, well, here's the Euclidean distance. Who's going to be their closest neighbors? Now let's calculate the nearest neighbor at k equals 3. And we can see the three closest neighbors puts them at normal. And that's pretty self-evident. When you look at this graph, it's pretty easy to say, okay, what, you know, we're just voting. Normal, 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 three votes for normal. This is going to be a normal weight. So majority of neighbors are pointing towards normal. Hence, as per KNN algorithm, the class of 57170 should be normal. So a recap of KNN. Positive integer K is specified along with a new sample. We select the K entries in our database which are closest to the new sample. We find the most common classification of these entries. This is the classification we give to the new sample. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. We're just looking for the closest things that match what we got. So let's take a look and see what that looks like in uh, a use case in Python. So let's dive into the predict diabetes use case. So use case, predict diabetes. The objective, predict whether a person will be diagnosed with diabetes or not. We have a data set of 768 people who were or were not diagnosed with diabetes. And let's go ahead and open that file and just take a look at that data. And this is in a simple spreadsheet format. The data itself is comma separated, very common set of data, and it's also a very common way to get the data. And you can see here we have columns A through I. That's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, eight columns with a particular attribute, and then the ninth column, which is the outcome, is whether they have diabetes. As a data scientist, the first thing you should be looking at is insulin. Well, you know, if someone has insulin, they have diabetes because that's why they're taking it. And that could cause issue in some of the machine learning packages, but for for a very basic setup, this works fine for uh, doing the KNN. And the next thing you notice is it, it didn't take very much to open it up. Um, I can scroll down to the bottom of the data. There's 768. It's pretty much a small data set. You know, at 769, I can easily fit this into my RAM on my computer. I can look at it. I can manipulate it. And it's not going to really tax just a regular desktop computer. You don't even need an enterprise version to run a lot of this. So let's start with importing all the tools we need. And before that, of course, we need to discuss what IDE I'm using. Certainly you can use any uh, particular editor for Python, but I like to use for doing uh, very basic visual stuff, the Anaconda, which is great for doing demos, with the Jupyter Notebook. And just a quick view of the Anaconda Navigator, which is the new release out there, which is really nice. You can see under Home, I can choose my application. We're going to be using Python 3.6. I have a couple different uh, versions on this particular machine. If I go under Environments, I can create a unique environment for each one, which is nice. And there's even a little button there where I can install different packages. So if I click on that button and open the terminal, I can then use a simple pip install to install different packages I'm working with. Let's go ahead and go back under Home, and we're going to launch our notebook. And I've already, you know, kind of like uh, the old cooking shows, I've already prepared a lot of my stuff, so we don't have to wait for it to launch, because it takes a few minutes for it to open up a uh, browser window. In this case, I'm going to, it's going to open up Chrome, because that's my default that I use. 
And since the script is pre-done, you'll see you have a number of windows open up at the top, the one we're working in. And uh, since we're working on the KNN predict whether a person will have diabetes or not, let's go ahead and put that title in there. And I'm also going to go up here and click on cell. Actually, we want to go ahead and first insert a cell below. And then I'm going to go back up to the top cell. And I'm going to change the cell type to markdown. That means this is not going to run as Python. It's a markdown language. So if I run this first one, it comes up in nice big letters, which is kind of nice. Remind us what we're working on. And by now, you should be familiar with doing all of our imports. We're going to import the pandas as pd, import numpy as np. Pandas is the uh, pandas data frame and numpy is a number array. Very powerful tools to use in here. So we have our imports. So we've brought in our pandas, our numpy, our two general Python tools. And then you can see over here we have our train test split. By now you should be familiar with splitting the data. We want to split part of it for training our thing and then training our particular model. And then we want to go ahead and test the remaining data to see how good it is. Pre-processing, a standard scalar preprocessor, so we don't have a bias of really large numbers. Remember in the data we had like number of pregnancies isn't going to get very large where the amount of insulin they take can get up to 256. So 256 versus 6 that will skew results. So we want to go ahead and change that so that they're all uniform between uh, minus one and one. And then the actual tool. This is the K neighbors classifier we're going to use. And finally the last three are three tools to test. All about testing our model. How good is it? We just put down test on there. And we have our confusion matrix, our F1 score, and our accuracy. So we have our two general Python modules we're importing and then we have our six modules specific from the sklearn setup. And then we do need to go ahead and run this. So these are actually imported. There we go. And then move on to the next step. And so in this set, we're going to go ahead and load the database. We're going to use pandas. Remember, pandas is pd. And we'll take a look at the data in Python. We looked at it in a simple spreadsheet. But usually, I like to also pull it up so that we can see what we're doing. So here's our data set equals pd.readcsv. That's a pandas command. And the diabetes folder, I just put in the same folder where my IPython script is. If you put it in a different folder, you'd need the full length on there. We can also do a quick length of uh, the data set. That is a simple Python command, L-E-N for length. We might even, let's go ahead and print that. We'll go print. And if you do it on its own line, length.dataset in the Jupyter Notebook, it'll automatically print it. But when you're in most of your different setups, you want to do the print in front of there. And then we want to take a look at the actual data set. And since we're in pandas, we can simply do data set head. And again, let's go ahead and add the print in there. If you put a bunch of these in a row, you know, the data set one head, data set two head, it only prints out the last one. So I usually always like to keep the print statement in there. But because most projects only use one data frame, Panda's data frame, doing it this way doesn't really matter. The other way works just fine. And you can see when we hit the run button, we have the 768 lines, which we knew. And we have our pregnancies. It's automatically given a label on the left. Remember, the head only shows the first five lines. So we have 0 through 4. And just a quick look at the data, you can see it matches what we looked at before. We have pregnancy, glucose, blood pressure, all the way to age and then the outcome on the end. And we're going to do a couple things in this next step. We're going to create a list of columns where we can't have zero. There's no such thing as zero skin thickness or zero blood pressure, zero glucose. Uh, any of those you'd be dead. So not a really good factor if they don't if they have a zero in there because they didn't have the data. And we'll take a look at that because we're going to start replacing that information with a couple of different things. And let's see what that looks like. So first we create a nice list. As you can see, we have the values we talked about glucose, blood pressure, skin thickness. Uh, and this is a nice way when you're working with columns is to list the columns you need to do some kind of transformation on. A uh, very common thing to do. And then for this particular setup, we certainly could use the, there's some Panda tools that will do a lot of this where we can replace the NA. But we're going to go ahead and do it as a data set column equals data set column dot replace. This is, this is still pandas. You can do a direct. There's also one that's, that you look for your NAN. A lot of different options in here. But the NAN, numpy NAN is what that stands for, is, is non, doesn't exist. So the first thing we're doing here is we're replacing the zero with a numpy none. There's no data there. That's what that says. That's what this is saying right here. So put the zero in and we're going to replace zeros with no data. 
So if it's a zero, that means the person's, well, hopefully not dead. Hopefully they just didn't get the data. The next thing we want to do is we're going to create the mean, which is the in integer from the data set from the column dot mean where we skip NAs. We can do that. That is a pandas command there, the skip NA. So we're going to figure out the mean of that data set. And then we're going to take that data set column and we're going to replace all the NPNAN with the means. Why did we do that? And we could have actually just uh, taken this step and gone right down here and just replaced zero and skip anything where, except you could actually, there's a way to skip zeros and then just replace all the zeros. But in this case, we want to go ahead and do it this way. So you can see that we're switching this to a non-existent value. And then we're going to create the mean. Well, this is the average person. So if we don't know what it is, if they did not get the data and the data is missing, one of the tricks is you replace it with the average. What is the most common data for that? This way you can still use the rest of those values to do your computation and it kind of just brings that particular value or those missing values out of the equation. Let's go ahead and take this and we'll go ahead and run it. It doesn't actually do anything so we're still preparing our data. If you wanted to see what that looks like, we don't have anything in the first few lines so it's not going to show up, but we certainly could look at a row. Let's do that. Let's go into our data set, let's print a data set, and let's pick, in this case, let's just do glucose. And if I run this, this is going to print all the different glucose levels going down, and we Thankfully, don't see anything in here that looks like missing data, at least on the ones it shows. You can see it skipped a bunch in the middle. Because that's what it does. If you have too many lines in Jupyter Notebook, it'll skip a few and, and go on to the next in a data set. Let me go ahead and remove this. And okay, we'll just zero out that. And of course, before we do any processing, before proceeding any further, we need to split the data set into our train and testing data. That way we have something to train it with and something to test it on. And you're going to notice we did a little something here with the uh, pandas database code. There we go, my drawing tool. We've added in this right here off the data set. And what this says is that the first one in pandas, this is from the PD pandas, it's going to say within the data set, we want to look at the I location and it is all rows. That's what that says. So we're going to keep all the rows, but we're only looking at zero, column zero to eight. Remember column nine. Here it is right up here, we printed it in here, is outcome. Well, that's not part of the training data, that's part of the answer. Yeah, it's column 9, but it's listed as 8, number 8. So 0 to 8 is 9 columns, so uh, 8 is the value. And when you see it in here, 0, this is actually 0 to 7, it doesn't include the last one. And then we go down here to Y, which is our answer, and we want just the last one, just column 8. And you can do it this way with this particular notation. And then if you remember, we imported the train test split. That's part of the SK Learn right there. And we simply put in our X and our Y. We're going to do random state equals zero. You don't have to necessarily seed it. That's a seed number. I think the default is one when you seed it. I'd have to look that up. And then the test size. Test size is 0.2. That simply means we're going to take 20% of the data and put it aside so that we can test it later. That's all that is. And again, we're going to run it. Not very exciting. So far, we haven't had any printout other than to look at the data. But that is a lot of this, is prepping this data. Once you prep it, the actual lines of code are quick and easy. And we're almost there with the actual running of our KNN. We need to go ahead and do a scale the data. If you remember correctly, we're fitting the data in a standard scalar, which means instead of the data being from you know 5 to 303 in one column, and the next column is 1 to 6, we're going to set that all so that all the data is between minus 1 and 1. That's what that standard scalar does. It keeps it standardized. And we only want to fit the scalar with the training set but we want to make sure the testing set is the X test going in is also transformed. So it's processing it the same. So here we go with our standard scalar. We're going to call it SC underscore X for the scalar. And we're going to import the standard scalar into this variable. And then our X train equals SC underscore X dot fit transform. So we're creating the scalar on the X train variable. And then our X test, we're also going to transform it. So We've trained and transformed the X train, and then the X test isn't part of that training. It isn't part of, the, of training the transformer. It just gets transformed. That's all it does. And again, we're going to go ahead and run this. And if you look at this, we've now gone through these steps, all three of them. We've taken care of replacing our zeros for key columns that shouldn't be zero. And we've replaced that with the means of those columns. That way that they fit right in with our data models. We've come down here and we split the data. So now we have our test data and our training data. 
and then we've taken and we've scaled the data. So all of our data going in. Now, no, we don't we don't train the Y part, the Y train and Y test. That never has to be trained. It's only the data going in. That's what we want to train in there. Then define the model using K neighbors classifier and fit the train data in the model. So we do all that data prep. And you can see down here, we're only going to have a couple lines of code where we're actually building our model and training it. That's one of the cool things about Python and how far we've come. It's such an exciting time to be in machine learning because there's so many automated tools. Let's see, before we do this, let's do a quick length of, and let's do Y. We want, you know, let's just do length of Y. And we get 768. And if we import math, we do math dot square root. Let's do y train. There we go. It's actually supposed to be x train. Before we do this, let's go ahead and do import math and do math square root length of y test. And when I run that, we get 12.409. I wanted to see, show you where this number comes from we're about to use. 12 is an even number. So if you know, if you're ever voting on things, remember the neighbors all vote, don't want to have an even number of neighbors voting. So we want to do something odd. And let's just take one away and we'll make it 11. Let me delete this out of here. And that's one of the reasons I love Jupyter Notebook because you can flip around and do all kinds of things on the fly. So we'll go ahead and put in our classifier. We're creating our classifier now. And it's going to be the K neighbors classifier. N neighbors equal 11. Remember we did 12 minus 1 for 11. So we have an odd number of neighbors. P equals 2, because we're looking for, is it are they diabetic or not? And we're using the Euclidean metric. There are other means of measuring the distance. You could do like square, square means values. There's all kinds of ways to measure this. But the Euclidean is the most common one, and it works quite well. It's important to evaluate the model. Let's use the confusion matrix to do that. And we're going to use the confusion matrix, wonderful tool. And then we'll jump into the F1 score. And finally, accuracy score, which is probably the most commonly used quoted number when you go into a meeting or something like that. So let's go ahead and paste that in there, and we'll set the CM equal to confusion matrix, Y test, Y predict. So those are the two values we're going to put in there. And let me go ahead and run that and print it out. And the way you interpret this is you have the Y predicted, which would be your title up here. You could do, uh, let's just do P-R-E-D. Predicted across the top and actual going down. Actual. <laughs> it's always hard to, to write in here. Actual. That means that this column here down the middle, that's the important column. And it means that our prediction said 94 and prediction and the actual agreed on 94 and 32. This number here, the 13 and the 15, those are what was wrong. So you could have like three different, if you're looking at this across three different variables instead of just two, you'd end up with the third row down here and that column going down the middle. So in the first case, we have the, the and I believe the zero is a 94, people who don't have diabetes. The prediction said that 13 of those people did have diabetes and were at high risk. And the 32 that had diabetes, it had correct. But our prediction said another 15, out of that 15, it classified as incorrect. So you can see where that classification comes in and how that works on the confusion matrix. And then we're going to go ahead and print the F1 score. Let me just run that. And you see we get a 0.69 in our F1 score. The F1 takes into account both sides of the balance of false positives. Where if we go ahead and just do the accuracy account, and that's what most people think of, is it looks at just how many we got right out of how many we got wrong. So a lot of people, when you're a data scientist, and you're talking to other data scientists, they're going to ask you what the F1 score or the F score is. If you're talking to the general public or the uh, decision makers in the business, they're going to ask what the accuracy is. And the accuracy is always better than the F1 score. But the F1 score is more telling. It lets us know that there's more false positives than we would like on here. But 82%. Not too bad for a quick flash look at people's different statistics and running an SK Learn and running the KNN, the K nearest neighbor on it. So we have created a model using KNN, which can predict whether a person will have diabetes or not, or at the very least, whether they should go get a checkup and have their glucose checked regularly or not. The print accuracy score, we got the 0.818, was pretty close to what we got. And we can pretty much round that off and just say we have an accuracy of 80%. It tells us it is a pretty fair fit in the model. We're going to cover mathematics for machine learning. So today's agenda is going to cover data and its types. 
And then we're going to dive into linear algebra and its concepts. Calculus, statistics for machine learning, probability for machine learning, hands-on demos. And of course, throwing in there in the middle is going to be your matrices and a few other things to go along with all this. Data and its types. Data denotes the individual pieces of factual information collected from various sources. It is stored, processed, and later used for analysis. And so we see here uh, just a huge grouping of information, a lot of tech stuff, money, dollar signs, numbers. Uh, and then you have your performing analytics to drive insights. And hopefully you have a nice share, your shareholders gather it at the meeting and you're able to explain it in something they can understand. So we talk about data, types of data. We have in our types of data, we have a qualitative categorical. And you think nominal or ordinal. And then you have your quantitative or numerical, which is discrete or continuous. And let's look a little closer at those data types. Vocabulary, always people's favorite is the vocabulary words. Okay, not mine. Uh, but let's di dive into this, what we mean by nominal. Nominal, they are used to label various, uh, label our variables without providing any measurable value. Uh, country, gender, race, hair, color, etc. It's something that you either mark true or false. This is a label. It's on or off. Either they have a red hat on or they do not. Uh, so a lot of times when you're thinking nominal data labels, uh, think of it as a true-false kind of setup. And we look at ordinal. This is categorical data with a set order or a scale to it. Uh, and you can think of salary range as a great one. Uh, movie ratings, etc. You can see here the salary range if you have 10,000 to 20,000. Number of employees earning that rate is 150, 20,000 to 30,000, 100, and so forth. Some of the terms you'll hear is bucket. Uh, this is where you have 10 different buckets and you want to separate it into something that makes sense into those 10 buckets. And so when we start talking about ordinal, a lot of times when you get down to the brass bones, again, we're talking true false. Uh, so if you're a member of the 10 to 20K range, uh, so forth. Those would each be uh, either part of that group or you're not. But now we're talking about buckets and we want to count how many people are in that bucket. Quantitative numerical data uh, falls into two classes, discrete or continuous. And so data with a final set of values which can be categorized. Class strength, questions, answered correctly, and runs hit and cricket. A lot of times when you see this you can think integer. Uh, and a very restricted integer, i.e. you can only have 100 questions um, on a test, so you can it's very discrete. I only have 100 different values that it can attain. So think, usually you're talking about integers, but within a very small range. They don't have an open end or anything like that. Uh, so discrete is very solid, simple to count, set number. Continuous, on the other hand, uh, continuous data can take any numerical value within a range. So water pressure, weight of a person, etc. Usually we start thinking about float values where they can get phenomenally small in their in what they're worth. And there's a whole series of values that falls right between discrete and continuous. Um, you can think of the stock market. You have dollar amounts. It's still discrete, but it starts to get complicated enough when you have like you know jump in the stock market from five hundred twenty-five dollars point thirty-three cents to $580.67, there's a lot of point values in there. It'd still be called discrete, but you start looking at it as almost continuous because it does have such a variance in it. Now, uh, we talk about no, we did, we went over nominal and ordinal, uh, almost true false charts, and we looked at quantitative and numerical data, which we're starting to get into numbers. Discrete, you can usually, a lot of times discrete will be put into, it could be put into true false, but usually it's not. Uh, so we want to address this stuff, and the first thing we want to look at is the very basic, which is your algebra. So we're going to take a look at linear algebra. You can remember back when your Euclidean geometry, uh, we have a line. Well, let's go through this. We have a linear algebra is the domain of mathematics concerning linear equations and their representations in vector spaces and through matrices. I told you we're going to talk about matrices. Uh, so a linear equation is simply... Um, uh, 2x plus 4y minus 3z equals 10. Very linear. 10x plus 12.4y equals z. And now you can actually solve these two equations by combining them. Uh, and that's what we're talking about, a linear equation. 
in the vectors we have a plus b equals c. Now we're starting to look at a direction. And these values usually think of an x, y, z plot. Um, so each one is a direction. And the actual distance of like a triangle, a, b, is c. And then your matrix can describe all kinds of things. Um, I find matrices uh, confuse a lot of people not because they're particularly difficult, but because of the magnitude and the different things they're used for. And a matrix is a, a chart or a, um, you know, think of a spreadsheet, but you have your rows and your columns. And you'll see here we have A times B equals C. Very important to know your counts. Uh, so depending on how the math is being done, what you're using it for, making sure you have the same rows and the number of columns or a single number. There's all kinds of things that play in that that can make matrices confusing. Uh, but really it has a lot more to do with what domain you're working in. Uh, are you adding in multiple polynomials where you have like uh, uh, AX squared plus BY plus, you know, you start to see that it can be very confusing versus a very straightforward matrix. And let's just go a little deeper into these because these are such primary. This is what we're here to talk about is these different math, uh, mathematical computations that come up. So when we're looking at linear equations. Let's dig deeper into that one. An equation having a maximum order of one is called a linear equation. Uh, so it's linear because when you look at this, we have uh, ax plus b equals c, which is a one variable. We have uh, two variable ax plus by equals c, ax plus by plus z, cz equals d, and so forth. But all of these are to the power of one. You don't see x squared. You don't see x cubed. So when we're talking about linear equations, that's what we're talking about. And their addition, if you have already dived into, say, neural networks, you should recognize this ax plus by plus cz um, setup plus the intercept, uh, which is basically your, your neural network, each node adding up all the different inputs. And we can drill down into that. Most common formula is your y equals mx plus c. So you have your uh, y equals the m, which is your slope, your x value plus c, which is your um, y-intercept. They kind of labeled it wrong here. Uh, <laughs> threw me for a loop. But the, the c would be your y-intercept. So when you set x equal to 0, y equals c. And that's that's your y-intercept right there. Uh, and that's they, they just had a reversed value of y when x equals 0. It equals the y-intercept, which is c. And your slope gradient line, which is your m. So you get your y equals 2x plus 3. And there's lots of easy ways to compute this. This why this is why we always start with the most basic one when we're solving one of these problems. And then, of course, the uh, uh, one of the most important takeaways is the slope gradient of the line. Uh, so the slope is very important, that m value. Uh, in this case, we went ahead and solved this. If you have y equals 2x plus 3, you can see how it has a nice line graph here on the right. So, matrices. A matrix refers to a rectangular representation of an array of numbers arranged in columns and rows. So, we're talking uh, M rows by N columns. Here, A11 is, denotes the element of the first row in the first column. Similarly, A12, and it's really pronounced A11 in this particular setup. So, it's uh, row 1, column 1. A12 is A of row 1, column 2. Uh, first row and second column and so on. And there's a lot of ways to denote this. I've seen these as like a capital letter A, smaller case A for the top row. Or, I mean, you can see where it, they can go all kinds of different directions as far as the value. You just take a moment to realize there needs to be some designation as far as what row it's in and what column it's in. And we have our uh, basic operations. We have addition. So when you think about addition, you have uh, uh, two matrices of two by two, and you just add each individual number in that matrix, and then when you get to the bottom, you have, uh, in this case, the solution is 12, 10 plus 2 is 12, 5 plus 3 is 8, and so on. And the same thing with subtraction. Now again, you're counting matrices, you want to check your um, dimensions of the matrix. The shape, you'll see shape come up a lot in programming, so when we're talking about dimensions, we're talking about the shape. If the two shapes are equal, this is what happens when you add them together or subtract them. And we have multiplication. 
When you look at the multiplication, you end up with a very uh, a slightly different setup going. Now, <laughs> if we look at our last one, we're, uh, uh, we're like, why? This always gets to me when we get to matrices. They don't really say why you multiply matrices. Um, you know, my first thought is 1 times 2, 4 times 3. But if you look at this, we get 1 times 2 plus 4 times 3, 1 times 3 plus 4 times 5. Uh, 6 times 2 plus 3 times 3, 6 times 3 plus 3 times 5. If you're looking at these matrices, uh, think of this more as an equation. And so we have, uh, if you remember, when we went back up here for our multiple line equations. Let's just go back up a couple slides where we were looking at uh, two variable. So this is a two variable equation, ax plus by equals c. Um, and this is a way to make it very quick to solve these variables, and that's why you have the matrix, and that's why you do the multiplication the way they do. And this is the dot product of uh, 1 times 2 plus 4 times 3. 1 times 3 plus 4 times 5. Uh, 6 times 2 plus 3 times 3. 6 times 3 plus 3 times 5, and it gives us a nice little uh, 14, 23, 21, and 33 over here, which then can be used and reduced down to a simple um, formula as far as solving the variables as you have enough inputs. Uh, and then in matrix operations, when you're dealing with a lot of matrices, uh, now keep in mind, multiplying matrices is different than finding the product of two matrices, okay? So when we're talking about multiplication, we're talking about solving uh, for equations, when you're finding the product, you are just finding 1 times 2. Keep that in mind, because that does come up. I've had that come up a number of times where I am altering data, and I get confused as to what I'm doing with it. Uh, transpose. Flipping the matrix over its diagonal. Comes up all the time, where you have you still have 12, but instead of it being uh, 12, 8, it's now 12, 14, 8, 21. You're just flipping the columns and the rows. Uh, and then, of course, you can do an inverse. Um, changing the signs of the values across this main diagonal. And you can see here we have the inverse a to the minus 1, and it ends up with, uh, instead of 12, 8, 14, 12, it's now minus 22, minus 12. Vectors. Uh, vector just means we have a value and a direction. And we have down four numbers here on our vector. Uh, in mathematics, a one-dimensional matrix is called a vector. Uh, so... If you have your x plot and you have a single value, that value is along the x axis and it's a single dimension. If you have two dimensions, you can think about putting them on a graph. You might have x and you might have y, and each value denotes a direction. And then, of course, the actual distance is going to be the hypothesis of that triangle. Uh, and you can do that with three dimensionals, x, y, and z. Uh, and you can do it all the way to nth dimensions. So when they talk about the k means, uh, for categorizing and how close data is together, they will compute that based on the Pythagorean theorem. So you would take uh, the square of each value, add them all together, and find the square root, and that gives you a distance as far as where that point is, where that vector exists, or an actual point value. And then you can compare that point value to another one, and it makes a very easy comparison versus comparing uh, 50 or 60 different numbers. And that brings us up to i-gene vectors and i-gene values. Uh, i-gene vectors, the vectors that don't change their span wall transformation, and i-gene values, the scalar values that are associated to the vectors. Conceptually, you can think of the vector as your picture. You have a picture, it's um, uh, two dimensions, x and y. And so when you do those two dimensions and those two values, or whatever that value is, um, that is that point. But the values change when you skew it. And so if we take and we have a vector A, and that's a set value, uh, B is, um, your, is your, you have A and B, which is your i gene vector. 2 is the i gene value. So we're altering all the values by 2. That means we're, uh, maybe we're stretching it out one direction, making it tall. Uh, if you're doing picture editing, um, that, that's one of the places this comes in. But you can see when you're transforming uh, your different information, how you transform it is then your i-gene value. And you can see here a uh, vector after line transi transition. Uh, we have 3a. a is the i-gene vector. 3 is the i-gene value. 
So A doesn't change. That's whatever we started with. That's your original picture. And 3 uh, is skewing it one direction, and maybe uh, B is being skewed another direction. And so you have a nice tilted picture because you altered it by, those, by the aging values. So let's go ahead and pull up a demo on linear algebra. And to do this, I'm going to go through my trusted anaconda into my Jupyter Notebook. And we'll create a new uh, notebook called Linear Algebra. Since we are working in Python, uh, we're going to use our NumPy. I always import that as NP, our NumPy array. Probably the most popular um, module for doing matrices and things in. Given that this is part of a series, I'm not going to go too much into NumPy. Uh, we are going to go ahead and create two different variables. A for a NumPy array 10, 15, and B, 29. We'll go ahead and run this, and you can see there's our two arrays, 10, 15, 29. And I went in and added a space there in between, so it's easier to read. And since it's the last line, we don't have to put the print statement on it unless you want, we can simply, but we can simply do A plus B. So when I run this, uh, we have 10, 15, 29, and we get 30, 24, which is what you expect. 10 plus 20, 15 plus 9. You could almost look at this addition as being um, just adding up the columns on here coming down. And if we wanted to do it a different way, we could also do a dot t plus b dot t. Remember that t flips them. And so if we do that, we now get them, uh, we now have 3024 going the other way. We could also do something kind of fun. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, as far as a plus b, I can also do a plus b dot t, and you're going to see that that will come out the same, the 3024, whether I transpose a and b or transpose them both at the end. And likewise, we can very easily subtract two vectors. I can go a minus b, and we run that, and we get minus 10, 6. Now remember, this is the last line in this particular section, so I don't have to put the print around it. Um, and just like we did before, we can transpose either the individual or we can transpose the main setup and then we get a minus 10, 6 going the other way. Now, we didn't mention this in our notes, but you can also do a scalar multiplication. Let me just put down scalar so you can remember that. Uh, and what we're talking about here is I have uh, this array here, U. And if I go a times u, uh, we'll take the value 2, we'll multiply it by every value in here. So 2 times 30 is 60, 2 times 15. And just like we did before, um, this happens a lot because when you're doing matrices, you do need to flip them. You get 60, 30 coming this way. So in NumPy, uh, we have what they call dot product. And uh, with this, this is in a two-dimensional vectors. It is the equivalent of two matrix multiplication. And remember, we were talking about matrix multiplication, uh, where it is the, well, let's walk through it. We'll go ahead and start by defining two um, numpy arrays. We'll have uh, 10, 20, 25, 6, or our U and our V. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and do, if we take the values, uh, and if you remember correctly, an array like this would be 10 times 25 plus 20 times 6. We'll go ahead and uh, print that. There we go. And then we'll go ahead and do the uh, np dot dot of u comma v. And we'll find when we do this, we go ahead and run this, uh, we're going to get uh, 370, 370. So this is a strain multiplication where they use it to solve uh, linear algebra uh, when you have multiple numbers going across. And so this could be very complicated. We could have a whole string of different variables going in here. But for this, we get a nice uh, value for our dot multiplication. And we did um, addition earlier, which is just your basic addition. Uh, and of course, the matrix, you can get very complicated on these. Or uh, in this case, we'll go ahead and do, um, let's create two 
complex matrices. This one is a matrix of um, you know, 12, 10, 4, 6, 4, 31. We'll just print out A so you can see what that looks like. Here's print A. When we print A out, you can see that we have a um, 2 by 3 layer matrix for A. And we can also put together, always kind of fun when you're playing with print values, uh, we could do something like this. We could go in here. There we go. Uh, we could print A. We have it end with uh, equals A run. And this kind of gives it a nice look. Uh, here's your matrix. That's all this is. Comma n means it just tags it on the end. That's all, all that is doing on there. And then we can simply add in what is a plus b. And you should already guess because this is the same as what we did before. There's no difference. Uh, when we do a simple vector addition, we have 12 plus 2 is 14, 10 plus 8 is 18, and so on. And just like we did the uh, matrix addition, we can also do a minus b and do our matrix subtraction. And we look at this, uh, we have what, 12 minus 2 is 10, 10 minus 8, uh, where are we? <laughs> oh, there we go. 8 minus, ah, uh, confusing what I'm looking at. I should have reprinted out the original numbers. Uh, but we can see here 12 minus 2 is, of course, 10. 10 minus 8 is 2. Uh, 4 minus 46 is minus 42, and so forth. So same as the subtraction as before, we just call it matrix subtraction. It's identical. Now, if you remember up here, we had a scalar addition. Where we're adding just one number to a matrix. You can also do scalar multiplication. Uh, and so simply, if you have a single value A and you have B, which is your array, we can also do A times B. When we run that, uh, you can see here we have 2 times 4 is 8. Uh, 5 times 4 is 20, and so forth. You're just multiplying the 4 across each one of these values. And this is an interesting one that comes up. A little bit of a brain teaser is uh, matrix and vector multiplication. And so when we're looking at this, uh, we are, just do a regular array. It doesn't necessarily have to be a NumPy array. We have A, which has our... Um, an array of arrays and B, which is a single array. And so we can from here do the dot AB, and this is going to return two values. And the first value is that it's, it's, you could say it's like uh, uh, we're doing the this array, B array, first with A and then with a, a second one. And so it splits it up. So you have a matrix of vector multiplication and you can mix and match. When you get into really complicated uh, back-end stuff, this becomes more common because you're now, you've got layers upon layers of data, and so you, you'll end up with a matrix and a set of bolt, uh, vector matrices that you want to multiply. Now, keep in mind that if you're doing data science, a lot of times you're not looking at this. This is what's going on behind the scenes. So if you're in um, the scikit looking at sklearn where you're doing linear regression models, this is some of the math that's hidden behind the scenes that's going on. Other times, you might find yourself having to do part of this and manipulate the data around so it fits right, and then you go back in and you run it through the scikit. And if we can do um, up here where we did a uh, matrix and vector multiplication, we can also do matrix to matrix multiplication. And if we run this where we have the two matrices, uh, you can see we have a very complicated array that, of course, comes out on there for our dot. And just to reiterate it, we have our transpose a matrix, which is your dot T. And so if we create a matrix A and then we do uh, transpose it, you can see how it flips it from 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 to 5, 15, 25, 10, 20, 30 uh, rows and columns. And certainly with the math, uh, this comes up a lot. Um, it also comes up a lot with XY plotting. When you put it into PyPlot, you have one format where they're looking at pairs of numbers and then they want all of X's and all Y's. So, you know, the transpose is an important tool both for your math and for plotting and all kinds of things. Another tool that we didn't discuss uh, is your identity matrix. Uh, and this one is more definition. Uh, the identity matrix, um, we have here one where we just did uh, two. So it comes down as 10001, 100010. Uh, 
it creates a diagonal of one. And what that is, is when you're doing your identities, you can be comparing all your different features to the different features and how they correlate. And of course, when you have uh, feature one compared to feature one to itself, it is always one, uh, where usually it's between zero and one, depending on how well it correlates. So when we're talking about identity matrix, that's what we're talking about right here, is that the, you create this preset matrix, and then you might adjust these numbers depending on what you're working with and what the domain is. And then another thing we can do uh, to kind of wrap this up, we'll hit you with the most complicated uh, um, piece of this puzzle here, is an inverse um, A matrix. And let's just go ahead and put the, um, oh, it's a lengthy description. <laughs> let's go ahead and put the description. This is straight out of the, uh, the website for um, NumPy. Uh, so given a square matrix A, Here's our square matrix A, which is 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1. Keep in mind, 3 by 3, it's square. It's got to be equal. It's going to return the matrix A inverse satisfying dot A, um, A inverse. So here's our matrix multiplication. Um, and then, it, of course, it equals the dot, uh, yeah, A inverse of A um, with an identity shape of... Uh, a dot shape zero. This is just reshaping the identity. Whew. That's a little complicated there. Uh, so we go ahead and have our, here's our array. Uh, we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see what we end up with is we end up with uh, an array 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 and so forth with our 211 going down to 100, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1. Uh, getting into a little deep on the math, understanding when you need this is probably really is, is what's really important when you're doing data science versus uh, handwriting this out and looking up the math and handwriting all the pieces out. You do need to know about the linear algorithm inverse of A. Uh, so if it comes up, you can easily pull it up or at least remember where to look it up. We took a look at the algebra side of it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the calculus side of uh, what's going on here with the machine learning. So calculus, oh my goodness, and differential equations. You got to throw that in there because that's all part of the bag of tricks, especially when you're doing large neural networks, but it also comes up in many other areas. The good news is most of it's already done for you in the back end. Uh, so when it comes up, you really do need to understand from the data science, not data analytics. Data analytics means you're digging deep into actually solving these math equations. Uh, and a neural network is just a giant differential equation. Uh, so when we talk about calculus, uh, we're going to go ahead and understand it by talking about cars versus time and speed. Uh, so helps to calculate the spontaneous rate of change. Uh, so suppose we plot a graph of the speed of a car with respect to time. So as you can see here, going down the highway, probably merged into the highway from an on-ramp. So I had to accelerate, so my speed went way up. Uh, stuck in traffic, merged into the traffic. Traffic opens up, and I accelerate again up to the speed limit. And uh, maybe it peters off up there. So you can look at this as... as um, the speed versus time. I'm getting faster and faster because I'm continually accelerating. And if I hit the brakes, it'd go the other way. So the rate of change of speed with respect of time is nothing but acceleration. How fast are we accelerating? The acceleration is the area between the start point of X and the end point of delta X. Uh, so we can calculate a simple, if you had uh, X and delta X, we could put a line there. And that slope of the line is our acceleration. Now, that's pretty easy when you're doing linear algebra, but I don't want to know it just for that line in those two points. I want to know it across the whole of what I'm working with. That's where we get into calculus. So when we talk about the distance between x and delta x, it has to be the smallest possible near to zero in order to approximate the acceleration. Uh, so the idea is that instead of, I mean, if you ever did took a basic calculus class, they would draw bars down here, and you would divide this area up. Um, let's go back up a screen. You divide this area of this time period up into maybe 10 sections, and you'd use that, and you could calculate the acceleration between each one of those 10 sections kind of thing. Uh, and then we just keep making that space smaller and smaller until delta x is almost uh, infinitesimally small. And so we get a function of a 
uh, equals a limit as h goes to zero of a function of a plus h minus a function of a over h. And that is you're computing the slope of the line. We're just computing that slope under smaller and smaller and smaller samples. Uh, and that's what calculus is. Calculus is the integral. You can see down here we have our nice uh, integral sign. It looks like a giant S. And that's what that means, is that we've taken this down to as small as we can for that sampling. Uh, so we're talking about calculus. We're finding the area under the slope is the main process in the integration. Similar, small intervals are made of the smallest possible length of x plus delta x, where delta x approaches almost an infinitesimally small space. And then it helps to find the overall acceleration by summing up all the lengths together. Uh, so we're summing up all the accelerations from the beginning to the end. And so here's our integral. We sum of a of x times d of x equals a plus c. Uh, that is our basic calculus here. So when we talk about multivariate calculus, uh, multivariate calculus deals with functions that have multiple variables. And you can see here we start getting into some very complicated equations. Um, uh, change in w over change of time equals change of w over change of z. The differential of z to dx, the differential of x to dt, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, and it really translates into the multivariate integration using double integrals. And so you have the, the sum of the sum of f of x of y of d of a equals the sum from c to d and a to b of f of x of y dx dy equals uh, the sum of a to b, sum of c to d of f x of y dy dx. Understanding the very specifics of everything going on in here and actually doing the math is usually calculus 1, calculus 2, and differential equations. Uh, so you're talking about three full-length courses to dig into and solve these math equations. What we want to take from here is when we're talking about calculus, uh, we're talking about summing of all these different slopes. And so we're still solving a linear uh, expression. We're still solving y equals mx plus b. But we're doing this for infinitesimally small x's and then we want to sum them up. That's what this integral sign means. Uh, the sum of a of x d of x equals a plus c. And when you see these very complicated uh, multivariate differentiation using the chain rule, uh, when we come in here and we have the change of w to the change of t equals the change of w dz uh, and so forth. That's what's going on here. That's what these means. We're basically looking for the area under the curve, which really comes to how is the change changing? You know, speed's going up. How is that changing? And then you end up with a multiple layer. So if I have three layers of neural networks, how is the third layer changing based on the second layer changing, which is based on the first layer changing? And you get the picture here that now we have a very complicated uh, multivariate integration um, with integrals. The good news is we can solve this uh, mathematically, and that's what we do when you do neural networks and reverse propagation. Uh, so the nice thing is that you don't have to solve this on paper unless you're a data analysis and you're working on the back end of integrating these formulas and building the script to actually build them. So we talk about applications of calculus. Uh, it provides us the tools to build an accurate predictive model. Um, so it's really behind the scenes. We want to guess at what the change of the change of the change is. <laughs> That's a little goofy. I, I know. I just threw that out there. It's kind of a meta term. But if you can guess how things are going to change, then you can guess what the new numbers are. Multivariate calculus explains the change in our target variable in relation to the rate of change in the input variables. So there's our multiple variables going in there. If uh, one variable is changing, how does it affect the other variable? And then in gradient descent, Calculus is used to find the local and global maxima. And this is really big. Uh, we're gonna actually going to have a whole section here on gradient descent because it is really, I mean, I talked about neural networks and how you can see how the different layers go in there. But gradient descent is one of the most key things for trying to guess the best answer to something. So let's take a look at the code behind gradient descent. And uh, before we open up the code, let's just do real quick uh, gradient descent. Let's say we have a curve like this. And most common 
is that this is going to represent your error. Oops. <laughs> error. There we go. Error. Uh, hard to read there. And I want to make the error as low as possible. And so what I'm looking at it is I want to find this line here, which is the minimum value. So we're looking for the minimum. And it does that by uh, sampling there. And then it, based on this, it guesses it might be someplace here. And it goes, hey, this is still going down. It goes here and then goes back over here and then goes a little bit closer. And it's just playing a high-low until it gets to that spot, that bottom spot. And so we want to minimize the error. And uh, on the flip note, you could also want to be maximizing something. You want to get the best output of it. Uh, that's simply uh, minus the value. Uh, so if you're looking for where the peak is, this is the same as a negative for where the valley is. I'm looking for that valley. Uh, that's all that is, and this is a way of finding it. So the cool thing is um, all the heavy lifting's done. Um, I actually ended up putting together one of these a while back as uh, when I didn't know about Sidekick, and I was just starting. Uh, boy, it's a long while back. And... Uh, is playing high-low. How do you play high-low, not get stuck in the valleys, uh, figure out these curves and things like that? Well, you do that in the back end is all the calculus and differential equations to calculate this out. The good news is you don't have to do those. Uh, so instead, we're going to put together the code. And let's go ahead and see what we can do with that. So, uh, guys in the back put together a nice little piece of code here, which is kind of fun. Uh, some things we're going to note, and this is, this is really important stuff, because when you start doing your data science and digging into your machine learning models, uh, you're going to find these things are stumbling blocks. Uh, the first one is current X. Where do we start at? Uh, keep in mind, your model that you're working with is very generic. So whatever you use to minimize it, the first question is, where do we start? Um, and we started at this because the algorithm starts at x equals 3. So we ar arbitrarily picked 5. Learning rate is uh, how many bars to skip going one way or the other. Uh, in fact, I'm going to separate that a little bit because these two are really important. Um, if we're dealing with something like this where we're talking about, um, uh, well, here's, our, here's the function we're going to use, our um, gradient of our function. Um, 2 times x plus 5, keep it simple. So that's a function we're going to work with. So if I'm de dealing with increments of 1,000, 0.1 is going to be a very long time. And if I'm dealing with increments of 0.001, uh, 0.1 is going to skip over my answer. So I won't get a very good answer. Um, and then we look at precision. This tells us when to stop the algorithm. So again, very specific to what you're working on. Uh, if you're working with money, and you don't convert it into a float value, uh, you might be dealing with 0.01, which is a penny. That might be your precision you're working with. Um, and then, of course, the previous step size, max iterations, uh, we want something to cut out at a certain point. Usually that's built into a lot of minimization functions. And then here's our actual uh, formula we're going to be working with. And then we come in, we go, while previous step size is greater than precision and iters is less than max, and max iters, eh, <laughs> say that 10 times fast. Um, we're just saying if, it's, uh, if, we're, if we're still greater than our precision level, we still got to keep digging deeper. Um, and then we also don't want to go past a thousand or whatever this is, a million or 10,000 uh, running. That's actually pretty high. Um, we almost never do max iterations more than like 100 or 200. Rare occasions you might go up to four or five hundred if it's uh, depending on the problem you're working with. Uh, so we have our previous equals our current. That way we can track time wise. Uh, the current now equals the current minus the rate times the formula of our previous x. So now we've generated our new version. Uh, previous step size equals the absolute current previous. Uh, so we're looking for the change in x. Iters equals iterations plus one. That's so we know to stop if we get too far. And then we're just going to print the local minimum occurs at X on here. And if we go ahead and run this, uh, you can see right here it gets down to this point and it says, hey, um, 
local minimum is minus 3.3222 for this particular series we created. Uh, and this is created off of our formula here, lambda x2 times x plus 5. Now, when I'm running this stuff, uh, you'll see this come up a lot in uh, with the SK Learn kit. And, and one of the nice reasons of breaking this down the way we did is I could go over those top pieces. Uh, those top pieces are everything when you start looking at these minimization toolkits in built-in code. And so from, um, we'll just do, it's actually docs.scipy.org. And we're looking at the scikit. There we go. Um, optimize, minimize. You can only minimize one value. You have the function that's going in. This function can be very complicated. Uh, so we used a very simple function up here. It could be, uh, there's all kinds of things that could be on there. And there's a number of methods to solve this as far as how they shrink down. Uh, and your x naught, there's your, there's your start value. So your function, your start value, um, there's all kinds of things that come in here that you can look at, which we're not going to. Um, optimization automatically creates, constraints, bounds. Some of this it does automatically, but you really, the big thing I want to point out here is you need to have a starting point. You want to start with something that you already know is mostly the answer. Uh, if you don't, then it's going to have a heck of a time trying to calculate it out. Or you can write your own little script that does this and, and does a high-low guessing and tries to find the max value. That brings us to statistics. What this is kind of all about is figuring things out. A lot of vocabulary and statistics. Uh, so statistics, well, I guess it's all relative. It's definitely not an Edel class. Uh, so a bunch of stuff going on in statistics. Statistics concerns with the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. That is a mouthful. Um, so we have from end to end, where, where does it come from? Is it valid? What does it mean? How do we organize it? Um, how do we analyze it? And then you got to take those analysis and interpret it into something that uh, people can use, kind of reduce it to understandable. Um, and nowadays you have to be able to present it. If you can't present it, then no one else is going to understand what the heck you did. So when we look at the terminologies, uh, there's a lot of terminologies depending on what domain you're working in. So clearly if you're working in um, a domain that deals with viruses and T cells and, and how does, you know, where does that come from? And you're studying the different people that you can have a population. If you are working with um, mechanical gear, um, you know, a little bit different if you're looking for the wobbling statistics uh, to know when to replace a uh, rotor on a machine or something like that. Uh, that can be a big deal. You know, we have these huge fans that turn in our sewage processing systems. And so those fans, they start to wobble and hum and do different things that the sensors pick up. At one point, do you replace them instead of waiting for it to break, in which case it costs a lot of money. Instead of replacing a bushing, you're replacing the whole fan unit. Uh, an interesting project that came up for our city a while back. Uh, so population. All objects are measurements whose properties are being observed. Uh, so that's your population, all the objects. It's easy to see it with people because we have our population in large. Um, but in the case of the sewer fans, we're talking about how many, the fan units. That's the population of fans that we're working with. You have a parameter, a matrix, uh, that is used to represent a population or characteristic. You have your sample, a subset of the population studied. You don't want to do them all because then you don't have a, if you come up with a conclusion for everyone, you don't have a way of testing it. So you take a sample. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice. You can only take a sample of what's going on. You, you can't um, study the whole population. And a variable, a metric of interest for each person or object in a population. Types of sampling. We have a probabilistic approach, uh, selecting samples from a larger population using a method based on the theory of probability. And we'll go into a little bit more deeper on these. We have random, systematic, stratified. And then you have a non-probabilistic approach, selecting samples based on the subjective judgment of the researcher rather than random selection. Uh, it has to do with convenience, trying to reach a quota, um, or snowball. 
Uh, and they're very biased. That's one of the reasons you'll see this big stamp on it that says biased. Uh, so you got to be very careful on that. So probabilistic sampling. Uh, when we talk about a random sampling, we select random size samples from each group or category. So we, it's as random as you can get. Uh, when we talk about systematic sampling, we're selecting random size samples from each group or category with a fixed periodic interval. Uh, so we kind of split it up. This would be like a time setup or our different categories. And you might ask your question, well, what is a category or a group? Uh, if you look at, I'm going to go back a window. Let's say we're studying um, economics of different of an area. Um, we know pretty much that based on their culture and where they came from, they might need to be separated. And so, uh, and when I say separated, I don't mean separated from their, their uh, place where they live. I mean, as far as the analysis, we want to look at the different groups and make sure they're all represented. So if we had like an 80% uh, of a group that is, uh, say, Hispanic and, or Indian, and also in that same area, we have 20%, 20% who are, uh, let's call our expatriates. They left America and they're nice and uh, your Caucasian group. We might want to sample a group that is representative of both. Uh, so we're talking about stratified sampling and we're talking about groups. Those are the groups we're talking about. And that brings us to stratified sampling, selecting approximately equal size samples from each group or category. Uh, this way we can actually separate the categories and give us an insight into the different cultures and how that might affect them in that area. Uh, so you can see these are very, very different, kind of depends on what you're working with um, as far as your data and what you're studying. And so we can see here, uh, just to go a little bit more, we'd have selecting 25 employees from a company of 250 employees randomly. Don't care anything about them, what groups they're in, which office they're in, nothing. Uh, and we might be selecting one employee from every 50 unique employees in a company of 250 employees. And then we have selecting one employee from every branch in the company office. So we have all the different branches. There's our group or our categories by the branch. And the category could depend on what you're studying. So it has a lot of variation on there. You see this kind of grouping and categorizing is also used to generate a lot of misinformation. Uh, so if you only study one group and you say, this is what it is, then everybody assumes that's what it is for everybody. And so you got to be very careful of that, and it's a very unethical thing to kind of do. So types of statistics. Uh, when we talk about statistics, we're going to talk about descriptive and inferential statistics. There are so many different terms in statistics to break it up. Uh, so, we, so we're talking about a particular setup. So we're talking about descriptive and inferential uh, statistics. You, the base of the word describe is pretty solid. You're describing the data. What does it look like? With inferential statistics, we're going to take that from the small population to a large population. So if you're working with a drug company, uh, you might look at the data and say, these people were helped by this drug. They did 80% uh, better as far as their health or 80% better survival rate than the people um, who did not have the drug. So we can infer that that drug will work in the greater populace and will help people. So that's where you get your inferential. Uh, so we are predicting how it's going to affect the greater population. So descriptive statistics. It is used to describe the basic features of data and form the basis of quantitative analysis of data. So we have a measure of central tendencies. We have your mean, median, and mode. And then we have a measure of spread, like your range, your interquartile range, your variance, and your standard deviation. And we're going to look at all these a little deeper here in a second. Uh, but one of them you can think of is um, how the data difference, differences, you know, what's the max, min range, all that stuff is your spread. And anything that's just a single number is usually your central uh, tendencies, measure of central tendencies. So we talk about the mean, it is the average of the set of values considered. What is the average outcome of whatever's going on? And then your median separates the higher half and the lower half of data. Uh, so where's the center point of all your different data points? So your mean might have some a couple really big numbers that skew it uh, so that the average is much higher than if you took those outliers out where the median would, by separating the high from the low, 
might give you a much lower number. You might look at it and say, oh, that's, that's odd. Why is the average so much higher than the median? Well, it's because you have some outliers. Or why is it so much lower? And then the mode is the most frequent appearing value. Uh, this is really interesting. If you're studying economics and how people are doing, you might find that the most common um, income, like in the U.S., was uh, 1.24 thousand a year, where the average was closer to 80 thousand. And it's like, wow, what a difference! Well, there's some people who have a lot of money, and so that skews that way up. So the average person is not making that kind of money. And then you look at the median income, and you're like, well, the median income is a little bit closer to the average. Uh, so it does create a very interesting way of looking at the data. Again, these are all uh, central tendencies, single numbers you can look at for the whole spread of the data. And we look at the measure of central tendencies. The mean is the average marks of a student in a classroom. So here we have the mean, some of the marks of the students, total number of students. And as we talked about the median, uh, if we have 0 through 10, and we take half the numbers and put them on one side of the line, half the numbers on the other side of the line, uh, we end up with five in the middle. And then the mode. What mark was scored by most of the students in a test? In a simple case where most people scored like an 82% and got certain problems wrong, easy to figure out. Uh, not so easy when you have different areas where like you have like the... Um, Oh, let's go back to economy. A little bit more difficult to calculate if you have a large group that scores that makes 30,000 and a slightly bigger group that makes 26,000. So what do you put down for the mode? Uh, certainly there's a number of ways to calculate that and there's actually a different variations depending on what you're doing. So now we're looking at a measure of spread. Uh, range. What's the difference between the highest and the lowest value? First thing you want to look at, you know, it's, uh, we had everybody in the test scored between 60 and 100%. Somebody got 100%, or maybe 60 to 90%. It was so hard that a lot of people could not get 100%. Um, and you have your interquartile range. Quartiles divide a rank ordered data set into four equal parts. Very common thing to do as part of all the basic packages, whether you're working in, uh, data frames with pandas, whether you're working in Scala, whether you're working in R. Um, you'll see this come up where they have range, your min, your max, and then it'll have your interquartile range. How does it look like in each quarter of data? Variance measures how far each number in the set is from the mean and therefore from every other number in the set. Uh, so you have like a, how much turbulence is going on in this data. And then the standard deviation. It is the measure of the variance or the dispersion of a set of values from the mean. And you'll usually see, uh, if I'm doing a graph, I might have the value graphed, um, and then based on the, the error, I might gra graph the standard deviation and the error on the graph as a background, so you can see how far off it is. Uh, so standard deviation is used a lot. So measurement of spread. Uh, marks of a student out of 100, uh, we have here from 50 to 63, or 50 to 90. Uh, so the range, maximum marks, minimum marks, we have 90 to 45, and the spread of that is 45, 90 minus 45. And then we have the interquartile range using the same marks over there. You can see here where the median is, and then there's the first quarter, the second quarter, and the third quarter, based on splitting it apart by those values. And to understand the variance and standard deviation, we first need to find out the mean. Uh, so here's our, our, you know, calculating the average there. We end up at approximately 66 for the average. And then we look at that in the variance. Once we know the means, we can do equals the marks minus the mean squared. Why is it squared? Uh, because one, you want to make sure it's, you don't have like, if you, if you're putting all this stuff together, you end up with an error as far as one's negative, one's positive, one's a little higher, one's a little lower. Uh, so you always see the squared value and over the total observations. And so the standard deviation equals the square root of the variance, which is approximately 16. And if you were looking at um, a predictable model, you would be looking at the deviation based on the error. How much error does it have? Uh, and that's, again, really important to know. If, you're, if your prediction is predicting something, what's the chance of it being way off or just a little bit off? Now that we've looked at the... Um, tools as far as some of the basics for doing your statistics and what we're talking about. Let's go ahead and pull up a little demo and show you what that looks like in Python code uh, so you can get some little hands-on here. 
For that, let's go in back into our Jupyter Notebook in Python. Now, almost all of this you can do in NumPy. Last time we worked um, in NumPy. This time we're going to go ahead and use Pandas. And if you remember from uh, Pandas on here, uh, this is basically a data frame, rows, columns. Let's just go ahead and do a print df.head and run that. And you can see we have uh, the name Jane, Michael, William, Rosie, Hannah, Sal and their salaries on here. And of course, instead of having to do uh, all those hand calculations and add everything together and divide by the total, we can do something very simple on this, uh, like use the command uh, mean in pandas. And so if I go ahead and do this, print df, pick our column, salary, because we want to find the means of that colory. We want to find the means of that column. Uh, and we go ahead and print this out, and you can see that the uh, average income on here is 71,000. Uh, and let's just go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and put in uh, means. And if we're going to do that, we also might want to find the median. And the median is uh, very similar, except it actually is just median. Uh, we're used to means and average. It's kind of interesting that those are they use the two different words. Uh, there can be in some computations slight differences, but for the most part, the means is the average. Uh, and then the median. Oops, let's put a median here. DF salary that way it displays a little better. We can see the median is fifty four um, thousand. So the halfway mark is significantly below the average. Why? Because we have somebody in here who makes 189,000. Darn you, Rosie, for throwing off our numbers. Uh, but that's something you'd want to notice. This is, this is, uh, the difference between these is huge. And so is what is the meaning behind that when you're studying a populace and looking at, uh, the different data coming in. And of course, we also want to find out, hey, what's the most, uh, common income that people make in this little tiny sample? And so we'll go ahead and do the mode. And you can see here with the mode, uh, it's at 50,000. So this is, this is very telling that most people are making 50,000. The middle point is at 54,000. So half the people are making more than that. What that tells me is that if the most common income is way, is below the median, then there's a few, there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of high salaries going up, but there's some really low salaries in there. And so this trend, which is very common in statistic, you know, when you're analyzing the economy and different people's income, is pretty common. And the bigger difference between these is also very important when we're studying statistics. Uh, and when you hear someone just say, hey, the average income was, you might start asking questions at that point. Why aren't you talking about the median income? Why aren't you talking about the mode, the most common income? What are you hiding? Uh, and if you're doing these analyses, you should be looking at these saying, hey, why, why are these discrepancies? Why are these so different? And of course, with any uh, analysis, it's important to find out the minimum and the maximum. So we'll go ahead. It, it's just simply uh, um, dot min will pull up your minimum and then dot max pulls up the maximum. Pretty straightforward on as far as... Um, translating it and knowing what your, you know, what the your lowest value and what your highest value is here, um, which you'll use to generate like a spread later on. And real quick on no, mode, uh, note that it puts mode zero. Like I said, there's a couple different ways you can compute the mode. Um, although the you know, standard one's pretty good. We can, of course, do the range, which is your max minus your min. So now we have a range of 149,000 between the upper end and the lower end. And you might want to be looking up the individual values on all of these, but it turns out there is a describe feature in pandas. And so in pandas, we can actually do df salary describe. And if we do this, you can see we have that there's seven uh, setups. Here's our mean, um, our standard deviation, which we didn't compute yet, which would just be a dot std. And you got to be a little careful because when it computes it, it, it looks for axes and things like that. Uh, we have our minimum value, and here's our quartiles, uh, our maximum value, and then of course the name salary. Uh, so these are the, these are the basic statistics. You can pull them up and like just describe. This is a dictionary, so I could actually do something like, um, in here I could actually go, uh, count and run, and now it just prints the count. 
so because this is a dictionary, you can pull any one of these values out of here. It's kind of a quick and dirty way to pull all the different information and then split it up and depending on what you need. Now, if I just walked in and gave you this information um, in a meeting, at some point you would just kind of fall asleep. <laughs> That's what I would do anyway. Um, so we want to go ahead and, and see about graphing it here. And we'll go ahead and put it into a histogram and plot that graph on it of the salaries. And let's just go ahead and put that in here. So we do our map plot inline. Remember, that's a Jupyter's notebook thing. Uh, a lot of the new version of the map plot library does it automatically. But just in case, I always put it in there. Uh, import map plot library pi plot is PLT. That's my plotting. And then we have our data frame. Uh, I, don't, I guess I really don't need to respell the data frame. Maybe we could just remind ourselves what's in it. So we'll go ahead and just uh, print df. That way we still have it. And then we have our salary df salary, salary.plot history title, salary distribution, color gray, uh, plot axv line, salary the mean value. So we're going to take the mean value, um, color violet. Line style dash. This is just all making it pretty. Uh, what color, dash line, line width of two, that kind of thing. And the median. And let's go ahead and run this just so you can see what we're talking about. And so up here we are taking on our plot. Um, so here's the data. Here's our, our data frame printed out so you can see it with the salaries. And we're looking at the salary distribution. And just look at this, the way the salary is distributed. Um, you have our, uh, in this case, we did, let's see, we had red for the median. We have violet for our average or mean. And you can just see how it really, I mean, here's our outlier. Here's our person who makes a lot of money. Here's the um, average, and here's the median. Um, and so as you look at this, you can say, wow, um, based on the average, it really doesn't tell you much about what people are really taking home. All it does is tell you, how much money is in this, you know, what the average salary is. So some of the things you want to take away in addition to this is that it's very easy to plot um, an AXV line. These are these up and down lines for your markers. Um, and as you dis display the data, I mean, you can add all kinds of things to this and get really complicated. Keeping it simple is pretty straightforward. I look at this and I can see we have a major outlier out here. We can definitely do a histogram and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. What you really want to make sure you take away is that we can do a basic describe, which pulls all this information out, and we can print any of the individual information from the describe, because uh, this is a dictionary. And so if we want to go ahead and look up um, the mean value, we can also do describe mean. So if you're doing a lot of statistics, uh, being able to doesn't have the print on there, so it's only going to print um, the last one, which happens to be the mean. Uh, you can very easily reference any one of these. And then you can also, if you're doing something a little bit more complicated and you don't need just the basics, you can come through and pull any one of the individual um, references from the, from the pandas on here. So now we've had a chance to describe our data. Uh, let's get into inferential statistics. Inferential statistics allows you to make predictions or inferences from data. And you can see here we have a nice little picture of movie ratings. And um, if we took this group of people and said, hey, how many people like the movie, dislike it, can't say. And then you ask just a random person who comes out of the movie who hasn't been in this study, uh, you can infer that 55% chance of saying liked, 35% chance of saying disliked, or a 10 or 11 percent chance of can't say. So that, that's real basics of what we're talking about is you're going to infer that the next person is going to follow these statistics. Uh, so let's look at point estimation. Uh, it is a process of finding an approximate value for a population's parameter, like mean or average, from random samples of the population. Let's take an example of testing vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, vaccines and flu bugs, all that, it's a pretty big thing of how do you test these out and make sure they're going to work on the populace. A group of people are chosen from the population. Medical trials are performed. Results are generalized for the whole population. So here's our protected, here's our small group up here where we've selected them. 
we run medical trials on them, and then the results work for the population. You know, nice diagram with the arrows going back and forth and the very scary COVID virus in the middle of one. And let's take a look at the applications of inferential statistics. Very central is what they call hypotheses testing uh, and the confidence interval, which go with that. And then as we get into probability, we get into our binomial theorem, our normal distribution, and central limit theorem. Hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is used to measure the plausibility of a hypothesis, assumption, by using sample data. Now, when we talk about theorems, theory, hypothesis, uh, keep in mind that if you are in a philosophy class, theory is the same as hypothesis, where theorem is a scientific uh, statement that is something that has been proven although it is always up for debate, because in science we always want to make sure things are up to debate. So a hypothesis is the same as a philosophical class calling a theory, where theory in science is not the same. Theory in science says this has been well proven. Gravity is a theory. Uh, so if you want to debate the theory of gravity, try jumping up and down. If you want to have a theory about why the economy is collapsing in your area, that is a philosophical debate. Very important. I've heard people mix those up, and it is a pet peeve of mine. When we talk about hypotheses testing, the steps involved in hypotheses testing is first we formulate a hypothesis. We figure out the right test to test our hypothesis. We execute the test, and we make a decision. And so when you're talking about a hypothesis, you're usually trying to disprove it. If you can't disprove it, and it works for all the facts, then you might call that a theorem at some point. So in a use case, uh, let's consider an example. We have four students who are given a task to clean a room every day. <laughs> Sounds like working with my kids. They decided to distribute the job of cleaning the room among themselves. They did so by making four chits, which has their names on it, and the name that gets picked up has to do the cleaning for that day. Rob took the opportunity to make chits and wrote everyone's name on it. So here's our uh, four people, Nick, Rob, Imlia, Imlia, and Summer. Now, Rick, Imlia, and Summer are asking us to decide whether Rob has done some mischief in preparing the chits, i.e., whether Rob has written his name on one of the chit. For that, we will find out the probability of Rob getting the cleaning job on first day, second day, third day, and so on, till 12 days. The probability of Rob getting the job decreases every day, i.e., his turn never comes up, then definitely he has done some mischief while making the chits. So the probability of Rob not doing work on day one is uh, 3 out of 4. There's a 0.75 chance that he didn't do work. Uh, two days, 3 fourths times 3 fourths equals 0.56. Three days, you have 3 fourths, 3 fourths, 3 fourths, which equals 0.42. Uh, when you get to day 12, it's 0.032, which is less than 0.05. Remember this 0.05. Uh, that comes up a lot when we're talking about um, certain values when we're looking at statistics. Rob is cheating as he wasn't chosen for 12 consecutive days. That's a very high probability when on day 12 he still hasn't gotten the job cleaning the room. So we come up to our important, important terminologies. We have null hypothesis, a general statement that states that there is no relationship between two measured phenomena or no association among the groups. Alternative hypothesis. Contrary to the null hypothesis, it states whenever something is happening, a new theory is preferred instead of an old one. And so the two hypotheses go hand in hand. Uh, so your null, this is always interesting in, in when talking about data science and the math behind it, it's about proving that the things have no correlation. Null hypothesis says these two have zero relation to each other where the alternative hypothesis says, hey, we found a relation, this is what it is. We have p-value. The p-value is a probability of finding the observed or more extreme results when the null hypothesis of a study question is true. And the t-value. It is simply the calculated difference represented in units of standard error. The greater the magnitude of t, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. And you can look at the t-value as being specific to the test you're doing where the p-value is derived from your t-value, and you're looking for what they call the 5% or the 0.05, showing that it has a high correlation. So 
Digging in deeper, let's assume that a new drug is developed with the goal of lowering the blood pressure more than the existing drug. And this is a good one because uh, the null value here isn't that you don't have any drug. The null value here is that it's better than the existing drug. The new drug doesn't lower the blood pressure more than the existing drug. Now if we get that, uh, that says our null hypothesis is correct, there is no correlation, and the new drug is not doing its job. The alternative hypothesis, the new drug does significantly lower the blood pressure more than the existing drug. Uh, yay, we got a new drug out there. And that's our alternative hypothesis, or the H1 or HA. And we look at the p-value, results from the evidence like medical trials showing positive results, which will reject the null hypothesis. And again, they're looking for um, a 0.05 or 5%. And the t-value, comparing all the positive test results and finding means of different samples in order to test hypothesis. So this is specific to the test. How, uh, what percentage of increase did they have? And this leads us to the confidence intervals. Uh, a confidence interval is a range of values we are sure our true values of observations lie in. Let's say you asked a dog owner around you and asked them, how many cans of food do you buy for your, uh, per year for your dog? Through calculations, you got to know that the, on an average, around 95% of the people bought around 200 to 300 cans of food. Hence, we can say that we have a confidence interval of 2, 300, where 95% of our values lie in that data spread. Uh, and this, the graph really helps a lot, so you can start seeing what you're uh, looking at here, where you have the 95%, you have your peak, in this case it's a normal distribution, so you have the nice bell curve equal on both sides, it's not asymmetrical. And 95% of all the values lie within a very small range. And then you have your outliers, the 2.5% going each way. So we touched upon hypothesis. Uh, and we're going to move into probability. Uh, so you have your hypothesis. Once you've generated your hypothesis, we want to know the probability of something occurring. Probability is a measure of the likelihood of an event to occur. Any event can be predicted with total certainty and can only be predicted as a likelihood of its occurrence. So any event cannot be predicted with total certainty. It can only be predicted as a likelihood of its occurrence. Uh, score prediction, how good you're going to do in uh, whatever uh, sport you're in, weather prediction, stock prediction. If you've studied physics and chaos theory, even the location of the chair you're sitting on has a probability that it might move three feet over. Granted, that probability is one in like, uh, uh, I think we calculated as under one in trillions upon trillions. So it's the better the probability, the more likely it's going to happen. There are some things that have such a low probability that we don't see them. So we talk about a random variable. A uh, random variable is a variable whose possible values are numerical outcomes of a random phenomena. So uh, we have the coin toss. How many heads will occur in the series of 20 coin flips? Probably, you know, the on average they're 10, but you really can't know because it's very random. How many times a red ball is picked from a bag of balls, if there's equal number of, of uh, red balls and blue balls and green balls in there? How many times the sum of digits on two dice uh, result are five each? Um, so, you know, there's, how often are you going to roll two fives on your pair of dice? So in a use case, uh, let's consider the example of rolling two dice. We have a random variable outcome equals y. You can take values 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we have a random variable and a combination of dice. And instead of looking at how many times um, both dice were roll five, let's go ahead and look at a uh, total sum of five. And you have, in, as far as your random variables, you can have a one, four equals five, four, one, two, three, three, two. So four of those rolls can be four. If you look at all the different options you have, four of those random rolls can be a five. And if we look at the total number, which happens to be 36 different options, uh, you can see that we have four out of 36 chance every time you roll the dice that you're going to roll a total of five. You're going to have an outcome of five. And uh, we'll look a little deeper as to what that means. Uh, but you could think of that at what point if someone never rolls a five or they always roll a five, can you say, hey, that person's probably cheating? Uh, we'll look a little closer at the math behind that. But let's just consider this as one of the cases is rolling two dice and gambling. There's also a binomial distribution. It is the probability of getting success or failure as an outcome in an experiment or trial that is repeated multiple times. 
And the key is, is by meaning to, binomial. Uh, so passing or failing an exam, winning or losing a game, and getting either head or tails. So if you ever see binomial distribution, it's based on a um, true-false kind of setup. You win or lose. Let's consider a uh, use case, and let's consider the game of football between two clubs, Barcelona and Dortmund. The teams will have to play a total of four matches, and we have to find out the chances of Barcelona winning the series. So we look at the total games, and we're looking at five different games or matches. Let's say that the winning chance for Barcelona is 75% or 0.75. That means that each game, they have a 75% chance that they're going to win that game. And losing chances are 25% or 0.25. Clearly 0.75 plus 0.25 equals 1. So that accounts for 100% of the game. Probability for getting K wins in N matches is calculated. And we, we're talking like, so if you have five games uh, and you want to know if I play... Um, how many wins in those five games should I get? What's the percentage on those? And the probability for getting K wins in N matches is calculated by PX equals K equals NCK, P to the K, Q to the N minus K. Here, P is the probability of success and Q is the probability of failure. And so we can do total games of N equals 5, where K equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. P, which is the chance of winning, is 0.75. Q, the chance of losing, equals 1 minus P, which equals 1 minus 0.075, which equals 0.25. The probability that Barcelona will lose all of the matches can then just plug in the numbers, and we end up with a 0.00097656625. So very small chance they're going to lose all their matches. And we can plug in uh, the value for two matches. Probability that Barcelona will win at least two matches is 0.0878. And of course, we can go on to probability that Barcelona will win three matches, the 0.26, and of course, four matches, and so on. And it's always nice to take this information um, and let's find the cumulated discrete probabilities for each of the outcomes. Where Barcelona has won three or more matches, x equals three, x equals four, x equals five. And we end up with the P equals 0 0.264 plus 0 0.395 plus 237, which equals 0 0.89. In reality, the probability of Barcelona winning the series is much higher than 0 0.75. And it's always nice to uh, put out a nice graph so you can actually see the number of wins to the probability and how that pans out with our binomial case. Continuing in our important terminology, Location. The location of the center of the graph depends on the mean value. And uh, this is some very important things. So much of the data we look at, and when you start looking at probabilities, almost always has a normalized look, like the graph in the middle. Uh, but you do have left skewed, where the data is skewed off to the left, and you have more stuff happening off to the left, and you have right skewed data. And so when this comes up and these probabilities come up where they're skewed, it's really important to take a closer look at that. Uh, mostly you end up with a normalized set of data, but you got to also be aware that sometimes it's a skewed data. And then the height. Height of the slope inversely depends upon the standard deviation. So you can see down here the standard deviation is really large. It kind of squishes it out. And if the standard deviation is small, then most of your data is going to hit right there in the middle. You're going to have a nice peak. Um, and so being aware of this, that you might have a probability that fits certain data, but it has a lot of outliers. So you're, if you have a really high standard deviation, um, if you're doing stock market analysis, this means your predictions are probably not going to make you much money. Uh, where if you have a very small deviation, you might be right on target and set to become a millionaire. Which leads us to the z-score. Z-score tells you how far from the mean a data point is. It is measured in terms of standard deviations from the mean. Around 68% of the results are found between one standard deviation. Around 95% of the results are found between two standard deviations. And you read the symbols. Of course, they love to throw some Greek letters in there. We have uh, mu minus two sigma. Mu is just a quick way. It's that kind of funky U. It just means the mean. Uh, and then the sigma is the standard deviation, and that's the O with the little arrow off to the right, or the little waggly tail going up, the O with the, with the line on it. Uh, so mu minus 2 sigma is your 
95% uh, of the results are found between two standard deviations. Central limit theorem. This goes back to the skew. If you remember, we were looking at the skew values on this previous slide. We have left skewed, normalized, and right skewed. When we're talking about it being skewed or not skewed, the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normally distributed, evenly distributed, not skewed, if you take large random samples from the population with the mean, mu, and the standard deviation, sigma, with replacement. And you can see here, um, uh, of course, we have our uh, mu minus 2 sigma and the spread down here, the mean, the median, and the mode. And so when you're talking about very large populations, these numbers should come together and you shouldn't have a skewed value. If you do, that's a flag that something's wrong. That's why this is so important to be aware of what's going on with your data, where your samples are coming from, and uh, the math behind it. And if we're going to do all this, we've got to jump into conditional probability. The conditional probability of an event A is a probability that the event will occur given the knowledge that an event B has already occurred. And you'll see this as Bayes' theorem, B-A-Y-E-S, Bayes. Uh, and this is red. I mean, you have these funky looking little P brackets, A, B. This is the probability of A being true while B is already true. And you have the probability of B being true when A is already true. So P, B of A. The probability of A being true divided by the probability of B being true. And we talk about Bayes' theorem, which occurred back in the 1800s when he discovered this. This is such an important formula. And it's really, it's not, if you actually do the math, you could just kind of do, um, um, x, y equals j, k, and then you divide them out, and you're going to see the same math. But it works with probabilities, which makes it really nice. And so if you have a set, you might have uh, eight or nine different studies going on in different areas. Different people have done the studies. They brought them together. Um, if we look at today's uh, COVID virus, the virus spread, uh, certainly the studies done in China versus the studies the way they're done in the U.S., that data is different in each of those studies. But if you can find a place where it overlaps, where they're studying the same thing together, you can then compute the changes that you need to make in one study to make them equal. And this is also true if you have a study of uh, um, one group and you want to find out more about it. So this formula is very powerful. Uh, and It really has to do with the data collection part of the math and data science and understanding where your data is coming from and how are you going to combine different studies in different groups. And we'll go ahead and go into a use case. Uh, let's find out the chance of a person getting lung disease due to smoking. Uh, and this is kind of interesting the way they word this. Um, let's say that according to medical report provided by the hospital, states that around 10% of all patients they treated suffered lung, lung disease. Uh, so we have kind of a generic medical report. They further found out uh, by a survey that 15% of the patients that visit them smoke. So we have 10% that are lung disease and 15% um, of the patients smoke. And finally, 5% of the people continued smoke even when they had lung disease. Uh, not the brightest choice, um, but you know it is an addiction, so it can be really difficult to kick. And so we can look at the probability of A, uh, prior probability of 10% people having lung disease. And then probability B, probability that a patient smokes is 15%. Uh, and the probability of B, um, if B, then A, the probability of a patient smokes even though they have lung disease is 5%. And probability of A is B, probability that the patient will have lung disease if they smoke. And then when you put the formulas together, uh, you get a nice solution here. You get uh, the probability of A of B, probability that the patient will have lung disease if they smoke. And you can just plug the numbers right in, and we get a 3.33% uh, chance. Hence, there is a 3.33% chance that a person who smokes will get a lung disease. So we're going to pull up a little Python code. I'm always my favorite. Roll up the sleeves. Keep in mind, we're going to be doing this um, kind of like the back-end way so that you can see what's going on. And then later on, we're going to create, um, we'll get into another demo, which shows you some of the tools that are already pre-built for this. 
Let's start by creating a, a set. So we're going to create a set with curly braces. This means that our set has um, only unique values. So you have a list, uh, you have your tuples, which can never change, and then you have, um, in this case, the, the set. So 4, 7, you can't create a 4, 7, 4. It'll delete the 4 out. So it's only unique values. And if you use dictionaries, quick reminder, this should look familiar because it is a dictionary. Uh, we have a value and that value is assigned to, or that key is assigned to a value. Uh, so you can have a key value set up as a dictionary. So it's like a dictionary without the value. It's just the keys and they all have to be unique. And if we run this, we have a uh, set of four, seven. We can also take a list, a regular um, setup, and I'm going to go ahead and just throw in another number in here, four, and run it. Uh, and you can see here, if I take my list, one, two, three, four, four, and I convert it to a set, and here it is, my set from list equals set, my list, the result is one, two, three, four. So it just deletes that last four right out of there. And with the sets, you can also go in there and um, print, here is my set, my set. Uh, three is in the set, and then if you do three in my set, that's going to be a logic function. Uh, and one in my set, six is not in the set, and so forth. If we run this, we get uh, three is in the set true, one is in the set false, because three, five, seven is another one. Six is in the set, uh, six is not in the set, so not in my set. You can also use this with a list. We could have just used three, five, seven, and it would have um, the same response on there, is three in, usually you do if three is in, but three in my set is still works on a, just a regular list. And we'll go ahead and do a little iteration. We're going to do kind of the dice one. Remember, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we're going to bring in the iteration tool and import product as product. And uh, I'll show you what that means in just a second. So we have our two dice. We have dice A, and it's going to be a set of values. Um, you can only have one value for each one. That's why they put it in a set. And if you remember from range, it is up to seven. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. It will not include the seven. And the same thing for our dice B. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a list, which is the product of A and B. So what's uh, A plus B? And if we go ahead and run this, uh, it'll print that out. And you'll see, um, in this case, when they say product, because it's an iteration tool, we're talking about creating a tuple of the two. So we've now created a tuple of all possible outcomes of the dice, where dice A is 1, 2, 3, 1 to 6, and dice B is 1 to 6. And you can see 1 to 1, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, and so forth. And you remember we had a slide on this earlier, where we talked about um, the different, all the different outcomes of a dice. We can play around with this a little bit. Uh, we can do in dice equals 2, dice faces 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, another way of doing what we did before, and then we can create an event space where we have a set, which is the product of the dice faces, repeat equals in dice. And we'll go ahead and just run this. And you can see here, it just, again, puts it through all the different possible variables we can have. And then if we wanted to take the same uh, set on here and print them all out like we had before, uh, we can just go through for outcome and event space, outcome and equals. So the event space is creating a sequence. And as you can see here, when we print it out, it stacks them versus going through and putting them in a nice line. And we'll go ahead and do something. Uh, let's go print. Since we have the end printing with a comma, that just means uh, it's just going to, it's not going to hit the return going down to the next line. Uh, and we'll go ahead and do the length of our event space. Uh, that'll be an important variable we're going to want to know in a minute. And of course if I get carried away with my typing of length, uh, we'll print it twice and it'll give me an error. Uh, so we have 36 different possible variations here. And we might want to calculate something like, um, what about the multiple of three? What if we want to have 
uh, the probability of the multiple of 3 in our setup. And so uh, we can put together the code for the outcome in event space of x, y equals outcome. If x plus y remainder 3, so we're going to divide by 3 and look at the remainder, and it equals 0, then it's a favorable outcome. And we're going to pop that outcome on the end there. And we'll turn it into a set. So the favorable outcome equals a set. Not necessary uh, because we know it's not going to be repeating itself, but just in case, we'll go ahead and do that. And if we want to print out the outcome, we can go ahead and see what that looks like. And you can see here, these are all uh, multiples of 3. Uh, 1 plus 2 is 3, 5 plus 4 is 9, which divided by 3 is 3, and so forth. And just like we looked up the length uh, of the one before, let's go ahead and print the length of our uh, f outcome so we can see what that looks like. There we go. And uh, of course, I did forget to add the print in the middle because we're looping through and putting an end on the, on the setup on there. So we're going to put the print in there. And if I run this, you can see... Uh, um, we end up with 12. So we have 36 total options. Uh, we have 12 that are multiple, that um, add up to a multiple of three. And we can easily compute the probability of this uh, by simply taking the length of our favorable outcome over the length of the event space. And if we print it out, let me put that in there, probability. Last line, so we can just type it in. We end up with a 0.3333 chance. And it's roughly a third. And we might want to make this look nice. So let's go ahead and put in another line there. The probability of getting the sum, which is a multiple of 3, is 0.3333. We can compute the same thing for 5 dice. And if we do this for 5 dice and go ahead and run it, yeah, um, you can see we just have a huge amount of choices. Uh, so it just goes on and on down here. And we can look at the uh, length of the event space. And we have over 7,776 choices. That's a lot of choices. And if we want to ask the question like we did above, uh, what is the sum where the sum is a multiple of five but not a multiple of three? We can go through all of these different options, and then uh, you can see here uh, d1, d2, d3, d4, d5 equals the outcome. And if uh, you add these all together and the division by five does not have a remainder of zero, but the remainder is also of a division by three is not equal to zero. So the multiple of 5 is equal to 0, but the multiple of 3 is not. We can just append that on here, and then we can look at that uh, favorable outcome. We'll go ahead and set that, and we'll just take a look at this. What's our length of our favorable outcome? It's always good to see what we're working with. And so we have 904 out of 770. Six, and then of course we can just do a simple division to get the probability on here. What's the probability that we're going to roll a uh, multiple of five when you add them together, but not a multiple of three? And so we're just going to divide those two numbers, and you can see here we get uh, 0 0.116255 or 11.62 percent. And so you can really have a nice visual that this is not really complicated math right here on probabilities. Uh, it's just how many options do you have and how many of those are you possibly going to be able to um, come up with with the solution you're looking for. And this leads us to a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix is a table which is used to describe the performance of a classification model on a set of test data for which the true values are known. And so you'll see on the left we have the predicted and the actual. And we have a negative, uh, false negative, positive, true positive, um, and then we have false positive and true negative. And you can think of this as your predicted model. 
What does that mean? That means if you divided your data and you used two-thirds of it to create the model, you might then test it against an actual case for the last third to see how well it comes out. How many times was it uh, true positive versus uh, false positive? It gave a false positive response. And you can imagine in medical uh, situations, this is a pretty big deal. You don't want to give a false positive. So you might adjust your model ac accordingly so you don't have a false positive. Say with a COVID virus test, it'd be better to have a false negative and they go back and get retested than to have 30% false positives where then the test is pretty much invalid. So in a use case uh, like cancer prediction, let's consider an example where a cancer prediction model is put to the test for its accuracy and precision. Actual result of a person's medical report is compared with the prediction made by the machine learning model. And so you can see here, here's our actual predicted, uh, whether they have cancer or not, you know, cancer, a big one, you don't want to have a uh, false positive, I mean a false negative. In other words, you don't want to have it tell you that you don't have cancer when you do. So that would be something you'd really be looking for in this particular domain. You don't want a false negative. Uh, and this is, again, you know, you've created a model. You have uh, hundreds of people or thousands of uh, pieces of data that come in. There's a real famous case study where they have the imagery and all the measurements they take. And there's about 36 different measurements they take. And then if you run the, uh, a basic model, you want to know just how accurate it is. How many um, negative results do you have that are either telling people they have cancer that don't or telling people that don't have cancer that they do. And then we can take these numbers and we can feed them into our accuracy, our precision, and our recall. Uh, so accuracy, precision, and recall, accuracy metric to measure how accurately the results are predicted. And this is your um, total um, true, where you got the right results, you add them together, the true positive, the true negative, over all the results. So what percentage of them were accurate versus what were wrong. When we talk about precision, is a metric to measure how many of the correctly predicted cases are actually turned out to be positive. Uh, so we have a precision on true positive. Again, if you're talking about like uh, COVID testing with the viruses, uh, you really want this to be a, a high number. You want this true um, that to be the center point where you might have the opposite if you're dealing with uh, cancer, where you want no false negatives. Uh, so this is your metric on here. Precision is your test positive, uh, true positive plus uh, false positive. And then your recall, how many of the actual positive cases we were able to predict quickly with our model. Uh, so test positive is the test positive plus the false negative on there. And we'll want to go ahead and do a demo on the naive Bayes classifier. Before I get too far into uh, naive Bayes classifier, because we're going to pull it from the SK Learn or the uh, Psych Kit, um, let's go ahead. Kind of an interesting page here for classifiers. When you go into the SK Learn Kit, there's a lot of ways to do classification. And I'll just zoom up in here so you can see some of the titles. Uh, there's everything from the nearest neighbor, linear. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on the naive bays over here. And this is just a, a sample data set that they put together. And you can see how some of these have a very different output. The naive bays, remember, is set up as probably the most simplified uh, calculator or um, set of predictions out there. And so what we've been talking about with the true-false and stuff like that, where there's a... Uh, and then a belief that there is a independent assumption between the features, where the features are very assumed to have some kind of connection, uh, then we can go ahead and use that for the prediction. And so that's what we're using as a naive Bayes classifier versus many of the other classifiers that are out there. For this, we're going to use uh, the social network ads. It's a little data set on here. And uh, let me go ahead and just open that up, the file. Uh, here we go. It has user ID, gender, age, estimated salary, uh, purchased. And so we have, you can see the user ID, mail, 19, uh, estimated salary, 19,000, and purchased zero. Uh, so it's either going to make a purchase or not. So look at that last one, zero, one, we should be thinking of binomials. We should be thinking of a uh, simple naive Bayes classifier kind of setup. So if we close this out, we're going to go ahead and import our NumPy as NP. 
We're going to nice to have a, a good visual of our data, so we'll put in our matplot library. Here's our pandas, our data frame. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and import the data set. And the data set's going to be, we're going to read it from the social network ads.csv. Then we're going to print the head just so you can see it again, uh, even though I showed you it in the file. And x equals the data set i location, uh, two, three values, and y is going to be the four, uh, column four. Let me just run this so it's a little easier to go over that. Um, you can see right here we're going to be looking at uh, 0, 1, 2 is age and estimated salary, so 2, 3. And that's what I location just means um, that we're looking at the number versus a regular location. Uh, regular location you'd actually say age and estimated salary. And then column 4 is did they make a purchase? They purchased something. Uh, so those are the three columns we're going to be looking at when we do this. And we've gone ahead and imported these and imported the data. So now our data set is all set with this information in it. And we'll need to go ahead and split the data up. Uh, so we need our, from the SK Learn model selection, we can import train test split. Uh, this does a nice job. We can set the random state so it randomly picks the data. And we're just going to take 25% uh, of it's going to go into the test, our X test and our Y test, and the 75% will go to X train and Y train. And that way, once we create our model, we can then have data to see just how accurate or how well it has performed with our um, prediction. The next step in pre-processing our data is to go ahead and do feature scaling. Now, a lot of this is start to look familiar. If you've done a number of the other modules and setup, you should start noticing that we bring in our data, we take a look at what we're working with, uh, we go ahead and split it up into training and testing. Uh, in this case, we're going to go ahead and scale it. Scale it means we're putting it between a value of minus one and one, uh, or someplace in the middle ground there. And this way, if you have any huge set, you don't have this huge, um, Setup. If we go back up to here where salary, uh, salary is 20,000 versus age 35. Well, there's a good chance with a lot of the back end math that 20,000 will skew the results and the estimated salary will have a higher impact than the age instead of balancing them out and letting the calculations weigh them properly. And finally, we get to actually create our um, naive Bayes model. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and import the Gaussian naive Bayes. And the Gaussian is, is uh, the most basic one. That's what we're looking at now. It turns out, though, if you go to the SK um, Learn kit, uh, they have a number of different ones you can pull in there. There's a um, Bernoulli. I'm not, I've never used that one. Categorical. Um, Complement. And here's our Gaussian. Uh, so there's a number of different options you can look at. Gaussian, when you come to the naive Bayes, is the most commonly used. Uh, so we're talking about the naive Bayes. That's usually what people are talking about when, they, when they're when they pulling this in. And one of the nice things about the Gaussian, if you go to their website um, to SK Learn, the naive Bayes Gaussian, there's a lot of cool features. One of them is you can do partial fit on here. Um, that means if you have a huge amount of data, you don't have to process it all at once. You, once. you can batch it into the... Gaussian uh, NB model, and there's many other different things you can do with it as far as fitting the data and how you um, manipulate it. We're just doing the basics, so we're going to go ahead and create our classifier. We're going to equal the Gaussian NB, and then we're going to do a fit. We're going to fit our uh, training data and our training solution, so X train, Y train. And we'll go ahead and run this. Uh, it's going to tell us that it, it ran the code right there. And now we have our trained classifier model. So the next step is we need to go ahead and run a prediction. We're going to do our y predict equals the classifier dot predict x test. So here we fit the data and now we're going to go ahead and predict. And now we get to our confusion matrix. Uh, so from the SK learn matrix metrics, you can import your confusion matrix. Just as saves you from doing all the simple math that does it all for you. And then we'll go ahead and create our confusion metrics with the Y test and the Y predict. So we have our actual and we have our predicted value. And you can see from here, this is the chart we looked at. Here's predicted. So true positive, false positive, 
false negative, true negative. And if we go ahead and run this, there we have it, 65, 3, 7, 25. And in this particular uh, prediction, we had 65, uh, we're predicted the truth as far as a, a purchase, they're going to make a purchase, and we guessed three wrong. And then we had 25 we predicted would not purchase, and seven of them did. So there's our, our uh, confusion matrix. At this point, if you were uh, with your shareholders or a board meeting, um, you would start to hear some snoozing if they were looking at the numbers. And you say, hey, here's my confusion mat uh, matrix. So let's go ahead and visualize the results. And we're going to pull from the Matplot library colors, import listed color map. Um, and this is actually, uh, my machine's going to throw an error because this is being, um, because of the way the setup is. Uh, I have a newer version on here than when they uh, put together the demo. And we need our um, X set and our Y set, which is our X train and Y train. And then we'll create our X1, X2. And we'll put that into a grid. Uh, and we set our X set uh, minimum stop and our X set max stop. And if you come all the way over here, we're going to step 0.01. This is going to give us a nice line, uh, is what that's doing. And then we're going to plot the contour, uh, plot the X limit, plot the Y limit, and put the scatter plot in there. And let's go ahead and run this. Uh, to be honest, when I'm doing these graphs, there's so many different ways to do that. There's so many different ways to put this code together. To show you what we're doing, it's uh, a lot easier to pull up the graph and then go back up and explain it. So the first thing we want to note here when we're looking at the data is this is the training set. And so we have those who didn't make a purchase. We've drawn a nice area for that. That's, that's defined by the naive Bayes setup. And then we have those who did make a purchase, the green. And you can see that some of the green dots fall into the red area and some of the red dots fall into the green. So even our training set isn't going to be 100%. Uh, we couldn't do that. And so when we're looking at our different data coming down, uh, we can kind of arrange our X1, X2, so we have a nice plot going on, and then we're going to create the um, contour. That's that nice line that's drawn down the middle on here with the red-green. Um, that's, that's what this is doing right here with the reshape. And notice that we had to uh, do the dot T. If you remember from NumPy, um, if you did the NumPy module, um, you end up with pairs, you know, X, uh, X1, X2, X1, X2, next row, and so forth. You have to flip it so it's all one row. You have all your X1s and all your X2s. Um, so this is what we're kind of looking for right here on this setup. Uh, and then the scatter plot is, of course, um, your scattered data across there. We're just going through all the points. That puts these nice little dots onto our setup on here. And we have our estimated salary and our age. And then, of course, the dots are, did they make a purchase or not? And just a quick note, this is kind of funny. You can see up here where it says X set, Y set equals uh, X train, Y train, which seems kind of a little weird to do. Um, this is because this is probably originally a definition. Uh, so it's its own module that could be called over and over again. And which is really a good way to do it because the next thing we're going to want to do is do the exact same thing, but we're going to visualize the test set results. Uh, that way we can see what happened with our test group, our 25%. And you can see down here we have um, the test set. Uh, and it, if you look at the two graphs next to each other, this one obviously has 75% um, of the data, so it's going to show a lot more. And this is only 25% of the data. You can see that there's a number that are kind of on the edge as to whether they could guess by age and income they're going to make a purchase or not. Um, but that said, it still is pretty clear. It's pretty good as far as how much the estimate is and how good it does. Now, graphs are really effective for showing people what's going on. But you also need to have the numbers. And so we're going to do from sklearn, we're going to import metrics. And then we're going to print our metrics classification report from the Y test and the Y predict. And you can see here we have precision. Uh, precision of zeros is 90. There's our recall, 0.96. We have an F1 score and a support. And we have our precision, the recall on getting it right. Uh, and then we can do our accuracy, the macro average, and the weighted average. Uh, so you can see that it, it pulls in 
pretty good as far as um, how accurate it is. You could say it's going to be about 90% is going to guess correctly um, that, it, that they're not going to purchase. And we had an 89% chance that they are going to purchase. Um, and then the other numbers as you get down have a little bit different meaning, but it's pretty straightforward on here. Here's our accuracy and here's our micro average and the weighted average and everything else you might need. And if you forgot the exact definition of accuracy, it is the true positive, true negative over all of the different setups. Precision is your true positive over all positives, true and false. And recall is a true positive over true positive plus false negative. And we can just real quick flip back there so you can see those numbers on here. Uh, here's our precision, here's our recall, and here's our accuracy on this. What's in it for you? We're going to go over applications of deep learning. What is deep learning? Why is deep learning important? What are neural networks? the activation function in our neural network, the cost function that comes in for processing our neural networks, how do neural networks work, deep learning platforms, and then we'll do introduction to TensorFlow and a use case implementation using TensorFlow so you can see how it works and get some hands-on. So let's start off with the applications of deep learning. Deep learning helps us make predictions about the rain, earthquakes, tsunamis, etc., allowing us to take the required precautions. With deep learning, machines can comprehend speech and provide the required output. Deep learning enables a machine to recognize people and objects in the images fed to it. And with deep learning, advertisers can leverage data to perform real-time bidding and targeted display advertising. And these are just a small sample of the myriad of different uses for deep learning today. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that deals with algorithms inspired by the structure and function of the brain. When we look at this, we have uh, the larger category, which is artificial intelligence, very generic, comprehensive um, ideal. And in there we have machine learning, and then a subcategory of machine learning is deep learning. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, this is the ability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. So when we look at something, can it solve a problem the way humans do? Can we take it to that next level? So it's just not repeating some kind of uh, simple output that we programmed it to do. Can it actually start imitating human intelligence? And we look at machine learning, we have the application of AI that allows a system to automatically learn and improve from experience. So machine learning, the most basic machine learning, is your linear regression model. You put a bunch of dots on the graph and you draw a line through them and you have a guess of what X and Y are based on uh, where what X is, you can guess what Y is. And finally we have our deep learning. Application of machine learning that uses complex algorithms and deep neural nets to train a model. Why is deep learning important. It works with unstructured data. Machine learning works only with large sets of structured and semi-structured data, while deep learning can work with both structured and unstructured data. Handles complex operations. Deep learning algorithms can perform complex operations easily while machine learning algorithms cannot. Feature extraction. Machine learning algorithms use labeled sample data to extract patterns, while deep learning accepts large volumes of data as input analyze the input to extract features out of an object. Achieve best performance. Performance of machine learning algorithms decreases as the amount of data increases. So to maintain the performance of the model, we need deep learning. And this is always a challenge of when do you go from machine learning, doing linear regression or other regression models, to deep learning neural networks. It really centers around both uh, the complexity as it becomes more and more complex or the problem becomes harder to solve, along with the amount of data. So both of those play a huge part in deciding which would best serve your purpose is to predict what your data is going to do and try to predict the outcome. So what are neural networks? With deep learning, a machine can be trained to identify various shapes. So here we have a square coming in. You can see we've broken it up into the pixels, and we want the label to come out square. And if we turn the square slightly sideways, it's still a square. And we want it to still say it's a square. With deep learning, a machine can be trained to identify various shapes or the different patterns of those shapes as they be 
or in this case being rotated. But how is the machine able to do this? So we'll look at a nice grid, 28 by 28, 784 pixels. And when we look at that grid, we can look at each one of those pixels as inputs. So a neural network is a system modeled on the human brain. And so we have all our inputs, kind of like your eyeball coming in there. It has the sensors in the back, your different input sensors, which are your cones and rods. So each one of those is an input coming in with information. And it goes into a neuron, and then it sends out a pulse. So the data is fed as an input to the neuron. The neuron processes the information provided as an input. The information is transferred over weighted channels. And this is very central to our neural network. Each one of those pulses coming in gets a different weight. And the output is the final value predicted by the artificial neuron. In this image, we're only looking at one neuron. So remember, we're looking to talk about a lot of neurons working together. And we'll look at how those fit together in just a moment. When we look at one neuron, so let's just take a look at that one neuron. Let's dig a little deeper so we can get some concepts in here so we can understand the neural network. So what exactly happens within a neuron? We have an activation function. So within each neuron, the following operations are performed. The product of each input and the weight of the channel it's passed over is found. Some of the weighted products is computed. This is called the weighted sum. And a bias unique to the neuron is added to the weighted sum. And you can always look at that as if you have an XY graph, where's your Y in intercept? You know, the old uh, Euclidean geometry, X or Y equals uh, 3X plus five. That's your plus five is that bias, is where does that come in? And this is a little bit more complicated because it's not like 3x, it's more like 3x1, 5x2, 6x7, and usually you're dealing with float numbers. So it's not even, it doesn't even look like that. It looks like 0 0.001 times x1, 0.13 times x2, and so on. So the numbers get a little confusing, but the concept is very straightforward. We're going to multiply the weight times the value coming in, and we're going to add that all together plus the bias. And the final Final sum is then subjected to the particular function known as the activation function. And the most simplest one is if it's greater than zero, it's one. If it's less than zero, it's zero. They usually use a lot of different, there's a lot of other functions that are more uh, reliable than that one. But that one gives you the most basic understanding of what you're looking at, zero or one coming out. In most cases, you actually have a value coming out. And in some cases, we use like a tangent wave so that there can be a value between zero and one, but it might be, um, it, it tends to show shoot right up to one rather quickly. But you know, those are things you can fine tune in your neural network as you start getting to the solution. Let's keep into the generals here and let's see what's the next step. We're going to look at the cost function. And this is so important in understanding how the current neural networks that we're working with are able to learn things. So we end up with a cost value. The cost value is the difference between the neural net's predicted output and the actual output from a set of labeled training data. The least cost value is obtained by making adjustments to the weights and biases iteratively throughout the training process. And when you think about this, we're not just sending one set of numbers through, we're sending all kinds of data in here. So you might have a hundred samples or a thousand samples and each one of those samples comes in and then we look at the cost for that. And we want to get that cost, the minimal, the average minimal among all the different samples. So we want a general answer on there. You can see here we denote the predicted output with a little um, half triangle over it. And then the actual output is just a straight Y on this. Let's learn how neural networks work. Let's dig in a little deeper in how we program them. How do neural networks work exactly? And this we're jumping from a single node into a larger picture. So our neural network will be trained to identify shapes. And we'll start with the square again, 28 by 28, or 784 pixels. And this is kind of a, one of the standard images we work with a lot of times. Our shapes are images of 28 by 28 pixels. Each pixel is fed as an input to the neurons in the first layer. So here we have our input layer. Each one of those, we might flatten that out. That's the most easiest way to process that, but not the only way to process. So we flatten it out so it's just one long array. And then we have hidden layers that improve the accuracy of the output. And you can see here we're not looking at just one neuron. We actually have a row, two hidden layers, and each layer is a row of neurons. And data is passed on from layer to layer over weighted channels. Each one of those 
inputs is then weighted to each of the next neurons in the next layer, in the hidden layer. Each neuron in the first hidden layer takes a subset of the inputs and processes it. Let's look into what happens within the neurons. So here we have step one, and we can see in here where we have x1 times weight 1, x2 times weight 2, plus b1. That's that top neuron up there. And then we have the next neuron down, which is step two. And then in step two, they denote the, um, with the Greek symbol, phi, and phi is the activation function based on step one. So it might be, um, if it's close to zero, it's zero. If it's close to one, it's one, and it might be a value in between. It's very common, depending on what activation function you use. The results of the activation function determine which neurons will be activated in the following layer. So you can see here we have B1, that's what we looked at with X1 and weighted one, X2 and weighted two, and then you would compute B2 the same way, and B3 the same way, and B4, and B5 and so on. So each neuron has an input from all the input layers go into each of the hidden layer neuron, or the first hidden layer. The result of the activation function determines which neurons will be activated in the following layer, and then that activation number goes off to the next layer. So we see here B11, B12, B13, and B14, and the weight's coming in from B1. So let's say B1 fires and it goes into B11. Usually you would see the weight's going all the way down. So B2 would have their weight's going going into B1 and B2 would then go into B11. B1, B2, B3, and B4, and B5 would then go into B11, and they would have their weights depending on what came out. It might just be zero, so there's nothing coming through, or it might be a, z a value between zero and one, and so forth for B12, B13, B14, and B15. And then we take those, and they'll have the weights attached to each one of those coming out, and they go into the final layer. In this case, we have a neuron that represents a square, a neuron that represents a circle, and a neuron that represents a triangle. And just as before, the information reaching this layer is processed, after which a single neuron in the output layer gets activated. But our input was a square, what went wrong here? Remember we started with a square, what do we have coming out? It said a circle. Well, that's gonna be a problem because we don't want it to tell us that uh, squares are circles. Well, our network needs to be trained first. How do we train a network? The predicted output is compared against the actual output by calculating the cost function. Remember our cost function at the end? We take whatever we uh, said it was gonna be and what it actually is, and we just subtract those two. And the most common way used to generate the cost function is as follows is we're going to take the actual value minus the predicted value where you have y and then you have y with the um, half triangle over it is the uh, predicted and then y is the actual value. We subtract them, we square that value and then we divide it by two. So that's usually how they generate the cost function. The cost function determines the error in prediction and reports it back to the neural network. So we're going to do some back propagation. That's what this is called, back propagation. We're going back through the network the other way and we're sending that error back the other way. The weights are adjusted in order to reduce error. The network is trained with the new weights and you can see here we have c equals one half y minus y predicted or y actual minus y predicted squared. Once again the cost is determined and back propagation is continued until the cost cannot be reduced any further. Now keep in mind you know if we have one picture of a square and it goes through we actually do just a little training. We don't change it all to match that first one otherwise you'll have a but what they call a bias. So each of those data goes back with our um, back propagation and we'll send hundreds of samples on there until we can get that cost as a whole down as low as we can get so that our average cost is very low without it being biased towards one specific figure. And you can see here we have our input layer, hidden layer, and our setup on here. Similarly, once we've trained it for our square, the network must also be trained to identify circles and triangles too. So we need sets of all of these. We need lots of squares, lots of circles, and lots of triangles. The weights are this further adjusted in order to predict the three shapes with the highest accuracy. We can now rely on our neural network to predict the input shapes. And you can see we have a triangle coming in here, and it goes through. Here's our circle going through, and it's going to light up the circle, and so on for the square. So before we dive into some hands-on, let's take a look at some deep learning platforms. The primary programming language, we're going to look at four of these platforms, and we're going to start with Torch. The primary programming language is uh, Lua with an implementation in C2. Torch's Python implementation is called PyTorch. And this is interesting because Python has become one of the leads in data analysis. So you'll almost always see a PyTorch or um, any one of these will have 
have a Python equivalent, and it's literally spreading throughout the languages. So I'm sure there's within Torch, it's also um, probably got a Java set up and definitely has a C because its, it's primary implementation is in C. And so we have Keras. Keras is a Python framework for deep learning, and USP is reusability of code for the CPU and GPU processing. We have TensorFlow. TensorFlow is deep learning platform by Google. It was developed in C++ and has its implementation in Python. And just a quick highlight, Keras and TensorFlow have slowly been working together. So there's a lot of things that you can actually put Keras on top of TensorFlow and access TensorFlow. Although there are still some tools in TensorFlow that, are, that Keras doesn't fully access. But it is a great interface for doing that. And then there's the DL4J. It is the first deep learning library written for Java and Scala. It is integrated with Hadoop and Apache Spark. And you remember Apache Spark is written in Scala. That's one of the reasons that DL4J came about is so that it would run on the Spark platform. So let's take an introduction to TensorFlow. Google's TensorFlow is currently the most popular deep learning library in the world. It has really, once they open sourced it, it was just amazing how much it's spread in use and how many tools are linked into TensorFlow. Tensors are vectors or matrices of n dimensions. And you can see here we have dimension 5, we have a dimension 4 by 5, or 5 by 4 as the case is, 5 rows by 4 columns. Here's one where it's 3 by 3 by 3. And so this is kind of nice because when you're processing pictures, there are certain things you want to do where you want the pixels to be next to each other. That's very important. Uh, same thing with your processing, say, a movie. You might want a 3x3 three three grid coming in where you have the, the layers of the frames coming in to be processed. So you can see how having different dimensions is really helpful in analyzing certain data structures. And this is what's so great about tensors is you can, of course, flatten them out like we did earlier, or you can process them based on their location. In TensorFlow, all computations performed involve tensors. So everything going through is always looked at as tensors, as a matrix, or uh, matrices of n dimension. TensorFlow architecture is as follows. Pre-processing data, build a model, train and estimate the model. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and dig into use case implementation with TensorFlow. To do that, I'm actually going to go into, uh, in this case, I'll be using the Anaconda Navigator. And you can use either Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook. Most people are very familiar with Jupyter Notebook. It's very commonly web-based. The Jupyter Lab is the next version of Jupyter Notebook, and it just lets you have multiple tabs open when you're working on it. And if you're using Anaconda, you'll go under Environments, and you'll want to make sure that you have your TensorFlow installed. And you can simply, uh, we'll do this, uh, I have it installed, uh, but you could do all, we'll do all. You can do a search under all for Tensor, and you can see all the different tensors. It's actually installed in here, version 1.13. Point one. If it wasn't, you could check the box and then run the install on there and it'd bring it right in. But we'll go ahead and start up our Jupyter Lab, which is going to open up. In this case, I use Google Chrome. And in our Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, if you're in the notebook, you only have one tab and you won't have the added options. Like there's a folder and different things you can do in the uh, lab that you can't do in the notebook. But everything we're going to do, you can easily do in the notebook. And you'll start up a new project. Deep learning is what I'm going to call this. And if you're not familiar, you can definitely, we have some tutorials out on the use of Jupyter Notebook and how to run it and set it up and things like that. The most basic is we put our code in here. It has a nice display, a nice interface, uh, especially for data science. I can display all kinds of things on this page. And then you can just run this page right here. There's no code in it, so it's not going to show anything uh, until I put some code in there. And, of course, you can cut your cells and things like that. So the first thing we want to do is we want to import our tools. Now, if you haven't, remember you got to, install TensorFlow and we'll also use Pandas. Pandas is a nice database setup. And that, again, is underneath your environment, and you can see here your um, whatever you're working on. I simply learned setup, where I've installed TensorFlow and Pandas in here. And I'll simply go up here and run this. I'm not going to see anything, because so we've just imported those into our notebook that we're working on. So those are now available to us. And it helps to have some data to work with. And we have here, I'm going to create a path and a test path. 
and uh, we'll go ahead and let's just highlight this whole path and you can always post a note either down below in the YouTube video or you can post a note on simplylearn.com and ask for this path if you're not quite picking it up but it is over here at the um, UCI EDU on their setup and it's in their archive so it's archive.ics.uci.edu forward slash ml for machine learning slash machine dash learning dash databases slash adult that's quite a mouthful and in this case we have adult data and adult test but let's go ahead and just take a look at that let me just paste that right in there to our browser window and here's our adult data and if I click on there it's going to come down as a download I'm going to go ahead and open it as a text in my notepad um, and the guys in the back were kind enough to look up to find out what the actual columns were in this uh, coming across so let me go ahead and take that to pull that information and it doesn't matter whether I put it before or below because these are just variables uh, but we can see here that we have age, work class, final WGT. I'm guessing that's final. We'll look that up in just a second to see what that matches. In fact, let's pull that up and just put them next to each other so we can kind of see what we got here. So we have age, we have our working class, state gov, maybe final wage. 77, 5, 16, education of bachelors, education number 13, marital, never married, admin, clerical, relationship, not in family, so on and so on. So it goes all the way across here. And so we've pulled out this information, native country, label, etc. We'll go ahead and run this. And so now we've loaded all our different uh, paths. And uh, this path, by the way, this is the same columns on here. So I don't need to create a separate columns on the adult test. And once we've run this, we've set those variables, let's go ahead and pull that data in. And to do that, we'll use pandas. And we'll create a DF train, a DF test. Uh, each one's going to have our PD for pandas dot read CSV. It'll have our path we put in there, our path test. The first one we went ahead and skip initial space, true, names, columns. There's our columns in there. Index column equals false. There's no index column. Uh, on the second one, if we went back into here and we open up adult test, let me just go ahead and open that up, pad. You'll see there's an actual row up here we want to skip, uh, one by three cross validator uh, with all the same data in it. So we're looking at the same data in there, and here we're going to go ahead and bring in our data. And then once you bring it in, it's always nice to see what kind of shape your data is in. And of course, when we talk about shape, we're talking about how many rows and columns, not whether it's been lifting weights. We can see here we have each one has 15 columns, and that goes with our columns right here. If we counted them, there's going to be 15. And the first data set has 32,561 rows where the second one has 16,281 rows. And it's also good to see just how the data came in. So we'll use the um, pandas uh, D types. We'll run that. And you can see here where age came in as an integer, integer 64, uh, working class as an object, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and then we have our FNL WGT, the education as objects, or well, this is an integer, integer object, so on, all the way down. And if we flash back to the data, we look at the last column, it's less than or equal to 50K. And if we scroll down enough, we'll see it's also greater than or equal to 50k. So we'd like to kind of give that its own special setup on that label. So on that feature we're going to set the label equal to um, if it's less than or equal to 50k it's going to be 0 and if it's greater than or equal to 50k it's going to be 1. Uh, so it's one or the other. That's always an easy easy thing to read. And then we can take this and we go dftrain.label equals label item for item in dftrain label. And this just loops through all the labels. There's a lot of ways we can do this. Pan Pandas, this might be actually kind of a slower way. There's a way to do just that setup and do the logic within the um, setup instead of doing a, a loop. Uh, but for this, this thing will work fine. We're not dealing with a lot of data. You know, it's a large data set, but it's not that big of a data set as data goes. And we also want to do it for our test data. Um, I didn't really mention that we created two data. We're looking at two different data sets. One, we're going to train the data, and then we're going to take it and run the test data to see if it works. So we have our two different data sets, and we didn't catch it off the that if, if you were pulling up this, you're going to pull up one, The um, this is the training set. And if we go back in here and open up the test set, let me just go back and do that, adult test. One of the things that we didn't uh, notice that you'll want to pull up is at the end there's a period. So we're pre-processing our data. We want to make sure that we include that period in every line on the second setup. So when I go back to my Jupyter Notebook, I've got to have a label T, which is less than or equal to 50K period, or greater than or equal to 50K period for one. Otherwise, it's doing the exact same thing. 
We're going to change uh, the DF train label and the DF test label to 0 or 1. We'll just run that. We'll go ahead and print uh, the DF train label dot value counts and the DF test label value counts. And this is always a good idea because we want to know is there any weird stuff going on there. If there's no value, stuff like that, this will turn up on that setup. And we can see here we have uh, zeros, how many zeros, how many ones, and so on on there. Just a quick view of the data that we're going through. And if we go back up here, go ahead and print the uh, train D types again. And we run that. You can actually run it up there and it'll give you the new answer because it's loaded this information. Uh, we now see it's an integer. And if you go back up here, it was an object. So that makes life a little easier as far as what we're doing with this. Now at this point, we're going to look at the data and we can see we have a lot of numbers and we have a lot of categories in here. Uh, so categories would be United States, male, never married, versus seven. And we can also see that when we looked at this, we have our integers, we have our objects, working class. So the next thing we want to do on there is we want to go ahead and take that uh, where we have integers and the objects, and we want to bring that down here. We want to create those categories in a way that the computer can see them. And we'll start with our uh, continuous features like age. We can see age integer. FNL WGT is an integer. Capital gain is an integer. Educational number. There's our educational number as an integer and so on. Uh, so if we're going to have these as continuous features where they're an integer, we also need to make a list of the categorical features we want to work with, such as working class, education, marital, occupation, relationship, race, sex, and native country. And again, these are all objects, uh, so that makes sense. And when we flip back over to the data, we can see here we're actually looking at United States. If we continue down, see if I can find another one. A lot of United States on this particular one. I was getting worried there for a second that we only had United States, and it was a very biased um, uh, census, which it probably is, for wherever it came from. And of course, bachelors, associate, vocational, some college. Uh, so you can see this is more categorical versus is an actual number. Uh, so now we have our uh, categorical and we have our continuous features. And this is just the list of these. So let's go ahead and run that and load that list in there so we can now start manipulating our data with it. Now we get our first line of tensor uh, flow code, which is exciting. And we're going to create a variable continuous features. And what we're doing in here is we're going to go into TF uh, feature columns. So we have the feature columns. We're going to set those up. Numeric columns K for K in continual features. So this is going to go in here and says each one of these is a continual feature and we're going to feed that into the feature column. Not very exciting on the output because uh, we're just creating this variable here letting it know what columns are what. And then we're going to create a uh, relationship uh, setup. So we have continuous features and then we have a relationship. And again we're doing TF but in this case we use feature column. Uh, so just like this one we're telling it feature column and now we do categorical column with vocabulary list. Uh, so that's one of the things we can do with TensorFlow. And we're going to feed it one we have have a relationship and so we're just drilling down to the relationship column and these are the options they had so this is going to be the vocabulary attached to this column and we'll go ahead and run that so we load up our relationship and then we're going to do one more uh, way of loading uh, and this one we're going to do categorical features and so in categorical features we're going to do TF feature column. There's our um, command we've already seen before. And it's going to be categorical column with hash bucket. We're going to create buckets. Uh, in this case, uh, for K and categorical features. So it's going to create a bucket for each one of these uh, categorical features. And the bucket size is 1,000. So we're looking at, uh, and we've actually kind of repeated something because relationship is also in the bucket setup on there. But we wanted to show you three major ways of loading in your different features. Features. One is our features that we know where it's going to be a number. Uh, so our continuous features. Then we can set it as a relationship. Uh, in this case, we actually created a vocabulary, husband, not in family, very clear vocabulary on there. And then we also are loading just general categories into buckets. You can set different bucket settings in here. We went ahead and just went with a thousand. So pretty much everything, since there's not a huge number of categories, each one gets their own kind of bucket set up in there. And as far as the initial setup, we need to go ahead and create a model. And so this is where it starts to come together. We've, um, as far as the pre-setup, we have our TF. We have an estimator. We're going to do linear classifier on the estimator. In classes equals two. So we know there's only two classes we're looking at. We have ongoing train feature columns 
and then we have our different we have uh, categorical features plus continuous features uh, so this basically creates our model what data is going in and we'll go ahead and run this and you can see here that it gives us a little information uh, that we had our tensorflow using default config you can change a lot of defaults you can change as far as a model directory uh, random seed saving summary checkpoints there's all kinds of things you can go in here and set up rewrite options keep checkpoint mix etc at this point the model hasn't done anything all we've done is create the model uh, so let's just do a real quick rehash of what we've done so far what we started off with is we grabbed some data in this case uh, an adult and adult tests we have a, a training data set and a test data set uh, we set the columns up we took a very short brief exploration of the data and its shape um, as far as what we're working with we changed our label around a little bit so that the label makes a little bit more sense of 0, 1 instead of um, for the machine it's easier to spit out a 0 or a 1. Uh, we can look up here we double check to make sure we how many zeros and ones we have double check our data make sure it's integer 64 nothing weirds going on and then we looked at three different ways that we can kind of label the data as far as the way we're going to read it uh, we have our continuous features and a categorical features here's a relationship which is one of them when we went ahead and created our model we did not put the uh, relationship in here uh, which you can do you can actually maybe take it out of um, categorical and then have its own on here instead of having categorical features and continuous features and so on uh, so we've created our setup for our model the next thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and create a function letting it know how to read the data into our model how are we going to train it and let's go ahead and create two variables uh, the first one is going to be features this is just all the features that are in there and then the second one is going to be our label and this is basically um, we're looking at all the different information we can put into it and then is that person based on that information going to make less than or greater than 50k that's what that comes down to now the next part uh, the definition we're going to create has a lot in it and we're going to feed this definition into our model training uh, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on here first we'll call it get input and function def get input function we have our data set number of epics equals none in batch equals 128 shuffle equals true so we're running this and it's going to return a tf estimator inputs pandas input function and in this case it's going to be x equals our pd data frame k data set k values for k and features y is pd series data set label values batch size equals in batch number of epics equals number of epics shuffle equals shuffle so in here we're passing in uh, the number of epics we're not too worried about we're going to just go once through the data because there's a lot of data in there we don't need to rerun it epics is how many times do you cover all the data and then how many groups of data do you pull in and batch at a time so we're only going to look at 128 do the reverse propagation like we talked about uh, and then it'll go to the next batch and the next batch and the next batch and it shuffles them so shuffle means that we're randomly picking where they're coming from uh, and we're, like again we're only doing we're not too worried about the number of epics for this particular model depending on how much data you have and depending on what you're running depends on how many epics you need to run and there's a lot of rules on how many epics you need to run one of them is if your uh, training data and your testing data because you'll check your testing data against your training data if your testing data starts having a better results in your training data that means you're no longer fitting towards the data but you're fitting to the answer uh, so it's kind of these little weird things you start to on here and tensorflow is really cool because it actually checks a lot of that for you uh, but we're just going to set number of epics equal to zero and then we have our data set going in so we're creating our uh, get function how do we get the data into training our model and we'll go ahead and run that so now we have our data function and now it knows where the data is coming from uh, so we need to go ahead and train it and that's simply we take our model we created way up here that's where we take the model there we've told it what uh, columns it's going to pull in so it knows what columns it's looking at know what the definition where it's going to get the information from so now we want to go ahead and train it and here's our input function equals in this case get input function and here we tell it that our data Data set is a DF train, number of epics equals none, 
which is already automatically set up there. In batch equals 128, which is what we have up here. Shuffle equals false, and we're going to do 1,000 steps. So we're actually going to go through um, uh, 128 batches, but we're going to do that 1,000 times. And we'll go ahead and run this. And I just ran an update, so it's going to give me some warnings because of that update. And then we're back here, and it's still going. To construct pipelines, use TF data module. Not a big problem. We let it go ahead and run all the way through on here. And it takes it just a moment. There we go. There's our 1,000 coming out. As you can see here, here's uh, checkpoints for 1,000 ongoing training, 1,001, global steps. And this is just all the reverse propagation going on. That's what we're doing here. Uh, one of the things we didn't cover is we do it in small increments. So it's not all done like one error goes all the way back. You'd only do a part of that error and each one sends back a little piece and so you slowly adjust your different weights going all the way back. And then if you're going to train your model, we want to know how it did. So we're going to do model evaluate. And our input function equals, remember our input function up here that we created? Way up here. We're going to take this input function and instead of the data set that's coming in, we put in the data set here for training. Where's our training? Input train. There we go. DF underscore train. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and evaluate. And here it is. Uh, get input function test. So we're going to test the data out. Number of epics, one. We don't need to rerun it more than once. Per batch, 128. Uh, so on, shuffle, and steps, 1,000. So we're going to go ahead and evaluate this. Let's just see how good our test data did, uh, how good our model was programmed on our training data, and how it evaluates on the test. And we can see it going on down here where it's got the uh, evaluating. Graph was finalized. Let me just highlight that. Ongoing model checkpoint. TensorFlow running local init. Uh, evaluate 100 out of 1,000, and so on. And once it gets to the end, we get a nice uh, output here. We have an accuracy, in this case, of 0.79 with a baseline of 0.76. So now we've created a model. Uh, let's go ahead and tweak it a little bit. So we have our accuracy up here. What we're going to do is we're going to look at age. And let's just go ahead and create a new uh, square value for age. And the reason we want to look into the square value of age is we know that if you really look through the data, you'll find that as a young person, the age keeps increasing. And as you get close to retirement, it begins to decrease. Uh, so we square the value of age. And that's very data specific when we're looking at data. You'll find that any kind of data that has that kind of like uh, uptick and downtick, by squaring it or square rooting it, you can get some very different results. And so we're going to go ahead and square our age. And this is kind of, um, it's interesting because at this point, even at the beginning of this, we're focused on deep learning and on TensorFlow. But before I would begin even looking at any of this, I would have probably run some kind of heat map or some kind of evaluation in R or SK Learn in Python to find out the correlation between different features to see just how well they correlate to each other. And there certainly are some wonderful tools for that because sometimes you can just mark off some features and other features you bring in. But for the deep learning, we can see how we can just dump it all in there and let it uh, sort it out itself. And we're going to just write a quick little function here to take the square variable. In this case, we have DFT, DFTE. And this is our uh, training and your test variable and the variable age coming in. And we just want to go ahead and create a new under DFT and the new is going to be the uh, variable name whatever we put in there which will be age. Uh, so let's load this. Here's our functions now loaded and certainly we could have just done that as a line of code uh, but you start to get the feeling that when you build these um, functions you might use it you can now use this function if you had a number of different features that had this kind of quality to them. And we have our DF train new so we're going to create a new training and a new test and it's going to equal the square variable DF train or DF test and the variable name is age. Uh, let's just go ahead and run that. And so now we have our new, our DF train new and DF test new. And just like we did before, let's just double check the shape of our data and make sure it all matches. And when we look at the um, output here, really what's important is that each one of these has 16 features in it. We want to make sure we're not getting something weird on there. And our training set has 32,561 rows in it, and this one has just over 16,000 in there. And everything's pretty much the same, except that in our continuous features new, new, we now have the new column we put in there. So we need to change that. And we have our continuous features new down here, which we're going to load up with our TF feature column numerical. This should all look familiar because we just did this. And so we're going to load that up with the new being the new value in there. 
And let's go ahead and run that. And we'll create a model that we'll call it model one. And this is the same that we did before, except now we have our continuous features new in here. Uh, so here's our new model. In this case, model one instead of model. And we're going to build that model right there. Now we haven't trained it. All we've done is told it where to get the data and how to get the data and what features are coming in. We haven't actually told it everything on the features coming in because we still need to also build our full our um, get input function. So where's the input coming from? So we built the model with the features in it and now we need to go ahead and create our get input function. This is the same as before but you'll see um, we now have it with the data set coming in is going to be the same data set up here and so if we scroll a little bit to the right we should see the new and there it is. Sure enough there's our new on the right. And so let's go ahead and run that. Now we've defined our model. We defined where the information is coming from and again you can go back and review the first part because this is identical that we did before except now we have new as the column for the age. And we'll go ahead and do our model one and let's go ahead and train it. There's our input function, get input function that we defined up here. DF train is going to be the same and everything else is going to be the same. Let's go ahead and run that. And uh, it should go through here and run the tensor info coming in. And it's going to go through, uh, in this case, where we have steps 1000 shuffling. So it's going to go randomly, 128 per batch. Uh, and then the epics is automatic. We're not worried about that today. So now we have a trained TensorFlow model. And with our new model, just like we did before, we want to go ahead and evaluate it. Uh, so it's the same setup we had before with our same get input function with our DF test new in here coming in. So there's our new data coming in. And this is really common when you're doing these models. You make little tiny tweaks to see if you can improve it. One of the best articles I read recently was you build your model to fail. You want a running model so that you actually have something to compare against. And then you continually tweak it till you get a better accuracy. Now, I don't expect the accuracy necessarily to get better on this uh, because of the way we partition the data. But we can see here we now have an accuracy of 0.76, which is a little bit over the baseline. And it's about what I would have expected it to be kind of the same. The reason is because we split the data at the 50, the people making over 50k and those making less. And so the age factor shouldn't be a huge factor. It would be if we were looking at more discrete buckets, like 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70 when we create buckets. But in this, I didn't really expect it to go up that much. In fact, we could probably run it a dozen times, which would be very bad data science. And we see we actually had a slightly better one up here, but our baseline accuracy was 0.76. And we come down here and we still see, uh, uh, here's our accuracy baseline, 0.763. That didn't really change. And, you know, the accuracy didn't really go up that much. I could hit the run button a few times, and I would probably upbeat the one above. So not a big change, but that's all right. This is how we learn. This is how we go through and figure out what's going to work with our data and what's not. What's going to improve the quality of our data so we have a better prediction and what's not. And we can now go ahead and utilize this model. This is where it gets exciting when you're actually working with somebody or with your clients. And you come in and you say, okay, here's my predictions. We're going to take a create a list, and we're going to use model one, and we're going to predict and our input function is get input function df test new again this probably doesn't make too big of a difference but we'll go ahead and stick with the new data we created number of epics one batch 128 so all this should look pretty familiar but we're running the prediction so we're going to load all our predictions into the predictions and let's go ahead and run that and you'll see it go through the TensorFlow setup. And so it's running, done running local ops. And then let's just go ahead and print the DF test new I location zero, so row zero. And we're going to look at the predictions also for the same location zero. And let's go ahead and run that. And we can see here that we have age 25, work class private. Um, it has all the information coming in for that individual. And then it comes down here and we go ahead and get our um, prediction. And in this particular instance, there's our label zero. Uh, and then we come down here and we see, it takes a little bit for the uh, setup to look up, but there's our array which also returns a zero. And it has information for us on there, probabilities, logistics on here. So you can see there's all kinds of additional information you can pull from this. And likewise, we could do it for uh, position three. Let me go ahead and run that. And what's kind of nice about this is you can now see here's label one and here's our logistics output. And again, we have to kind of hunt for it a little bit in this particular setup, but here's the output array and there's our one and they match label one, one. So we predicted for the very first one, uh, location zero, that it's going to be a zero on the label. It's going to make under 50,000. And the individual in two, working class, uh, private, whatever setup on here, capital gain, capital loss, etc., came up as one, meaning they're going to make over 50,000. 
thousand. So we covered a lot. I mean, this is the basics. And you can see as you dig deeper, when you look at some of this code, let me just go back up here. We're way back up here at the very top, a little too far overshot. As we start working in here, we have uh, one, defining your features. And at this point, we didn't show this, but I would probably use either Python or R to show a relationship correlation, because they have some really easy packages in there to pull that up. So you can see what features are really connected and how they're connected. Uh, and then we showed you different features, like we have ones that are um, integers, and then we have ones like sex that are objects. You're zero or one, you're male or female, you're, uh, same thing with race. Uh, we probably have just a, maybe 16 different races listed there, ethnicities, things like that. Native country, again, that's, you don't have like infinite number of native countries, you just have uh, a handful. So when we look at this, we have our uh, features, we looked at that. We have our continuous features like age, which is a number, or in this case, an integer and education number, how many years, and so on, along with your race, your sex, your relationship, which are just very abbreviated uh, categorical data. Uh, so we looked at that. We went in there and we showed you how to, um, where was it? Here we go. We go back up here. Uh, so we create our model. The model ha knows what uh, categories are coming in. That's really important. And this is probably the one of the more complicated parts of this is our input function. And this input function is so important. So I want to just rehash the input function for that reason. Uh, this lets us know how we're pulling the data. It lets us know um, if we're going to go through all the data 20 times, um, or we're going to let the, or we're just going to let TensorFlow itself keep going until the training model reaches a point. That point is based on uh, what, what they call bias. You can become biased on your training data. And so when it hits a certain point where it becomes overly biased to just that data, then it doesn't really work really good in the outside world. You start losing. We're going to keep it generic, but as close as possible to the right answer. Uh, so generic answers for a huge amount of data. And then we have our batch size. Are we going to shuffle it, which we did. And then also our estimator inputs. Uh, so you have your estimator function here. And then, of course, where the actual data is coming from. So you can see all this is in that get input function. That's where a lot of the work comes in putting this together. And then we train our model. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Once you have your input function and all your setup, training the model is quick. And then we go ahead and evaluate. And then we can go ahead and create a predict. And then, you know, look at our predictions and how they work on individuals. Uh, so it's pretty, it gives you a whole roundabout setup on here and how this is set up and how it's working. Certainly, there are um, a lot more things you can do with TensorFlow. This is the basic TensorFlow, and it's always developing, so it's exciting. This is going to be one of the most exciting fields right now because it is really in an infant stage and just exploding in the market. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Welcome to TensorFlow 2.0 Tutorial. What's in it for you? We're going to cover today deep learning frameworks, what is TensorFlow, features of TensorFlow, TensorFlow applications, how TensorFlow works, TensorFlow 1.0 versus 2.0, TensorFlow 2.0 architecture, and then we'll go over a TensorFlow demo where we roll up our sleeves and dive right into the code. So let's start with deep learning frameworks. To start with, this chart doesn't even do the filled um, justice because it's ex just exploded. These are just some of the major frameworks out there. There's uh, Keras, uh, which happens to sit on TensorFlow, so they're very integrated. There's TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch is out there, Cafe, Theano, uh, DL4J, and Chainer. These are just a few of the deep learning frameworks. We're talking about neural networks. If you're just starting out and never seen a neural network, you can go into Python in the um, scikit and do the neural network in there, which is probably the most simplest version I know, but the ro most robust version out there, the most top of the ladder as far as the technology right now is TensorFlow. And that, of course, is changing from day to day, and some of these are better for different purposes. Uh, so let's dive into TensorFlow. Let's see what is TensorFlow. What is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is a popular open source library released in 2015 by Google Brain Team for building machine learning and deep learning models. It is based on Python programming language and performs numerical computations using data flow graphs to build models. So let's take a look at some of the features of TensorFlow. It works efficiently with multi-dimensional arrays. 
If you've ever played with any of the simpler packages of neural networks, you're going to find that you have to pretty much flatten them and make sure your, your stuff is uh, set in a flat model. TensorFlow works really good. So we're talking pictures here um, where you have uh, X and Y coordinates of where the picture is, and then each pixel has three or four different channels. That's a very complicated array, a very multidimensional array. It provides scalability of computation across machines and large data sets. This is so new right now, um, and you might think that's a minor thing, but when Python is operating on one computer and it has a float value and it truncates it differently on each computer, you don't get the same results. And so your training model might work on one machine and then on another it doesn't. This is one of the things that TensorFlow um, addresses and does a very well, good job on. It supports fast debugging and model building. This is why I love TensorFlow. Uh, I can go in there and I can build a model with different layers. Each layer might have different properties. Um, they have like the convolutional neural network, which you can then sit on top of a regular neural network with reverse propagation. There's a lot of tools in here and a lot of options. And each layer that it goes through can utilize those different options and stack differently. And it has a large community and provides TensorBoard to visualize the model. TensorBoard is pretty uh, recent, but it's a really nice tool to have so you, when you're working with other people or showing your uh, clients or the um, shareholders in the company, you can give them a nice visual model so they know what's going on. What are they paying for? And let's take a glance at some of the different uses or applications for TensorFlow. When we talk about TensorFlow applications, uh, clearly, this is data analytics. We're getting into the data science. I like to use data science as probably a better term because this is the programming side. Uh, and it's really the sky is the limit. Um, we can look at face detection, language translation, fraud detection, video detection. There are so many different things out there that TensorFlow can be used for. When you think of neural networks, because TensorFlow is a neural network, uh, think of complicated chaotic data. This is very different than if you have a set numbers, like you're looking at the stock market. You can use this on the stock market, but if you're doing something where the numbers are very clear and not so chaotic as you have in a picture, then you're talking more about linear regression models um, and different regression models when you're looking at that. When you're talking about these really complicated data patterns, then you're talking neural networks and TensorFlow. And if we're going to talk about TensorFlow, we should talk about what tensors are. After all, that is what tensor, um, that's what this is named after. So when we talk about tensors in TensorFlow, TensorFlow is derived from its core component known as a tensor. A tensor is a vector or a matrix of n dimensions that represent all types of data. And you can see here we have like the scalar, which is just a single um, number. You have your vector, which is two numbers. Uh, might be a number in a direction. You have a simple matrix, and then we get into the tensor. I mentioned how a picture is a very complicated tensor because it has your x, y coordinates, and then each one of those pixels has three to four channels for your different colors. And so each image coming in would be its own tensor. And in TensorFlow, tensors are defined by a unit of dimensionality called as rank. And you can see here we have our um, scalar, which is a single number that has a rank of zero because it has no real dimensions to it other than it's just a single point. And then you have your vector, which would be a single list of numbers. Uh, so that's a rank one. Uh, matrix would have rank two. And then as you can see right here, as we get into the full tensor, it has a rank three. And so the next step is to understand how a tensor flow works. And if you haven't looked at um, the basics of a neural network in reverse propagation, that is the basics of TensorFlow. And then it goes through a lot of different options and properties that you can build into your different tensors. Uh, so a TensorFlow performs computations with the help of data flow graphs. It has nodes that represent the operations in your model. And if you look at this, you should see uh, a neural network going on here. We have our inputs. B, C, and D, and you might have X equals B plus C, Y equals D minus 4, um, A equals X times Y, and then you have an output. And so even though this isn't a neural network here, it's just a simple set of computations going across, you can see how the more complicated it gets, the more it can actually, one of the 
tensors is a neural network with reverse propagation, but it's not limited to that. There's so much more you can do with it. And this here is just a basic uh, flow of computations of the data going across. And you can see we can plug in the numbers uh, b equals 4, c equals 3, d equals 6, and you get x equals 4 plus 3, so x equals 7, y equals 6 minus 4, so y equals 2, and finally a equals 7 times 2, or a equals 14. Like I said, this is a very simplified version of how TensorFlow works. Each one of these layers can get very complicated. Um, but TensorFlow does such a nice job that you can spin different setups up very easily and test them out. So you can test out these different models to see how they work. Now, TensorFlow has gone through two major stages. Uh, we had the original TensorFlow release of 1.0, and then they came out with the uh, 2.0 version. And the 2.0 addressed so many things out there that the 1.0 really needed. So when we start talking about TensorFlow 1.0 versus 2.0, um, I guess you would need to know this for um, a legacy programming job if you're pulling apart somebody else's code. The first thing is that TensorFlow 2.0 supports eager execution by default. It allows you to build your models and run them instantly. And you can see here from TensorFlow 1 to TensorFlow 2, uh, we have um, almost double the code to do the same thing. So if I want to do um, with tf.session or TensorFlow session um, as a session, the session run, you have your variables, your session run, you have your tables initializer, and then you do your model fit. Um, X train, Y train, and then your validation data, your X value, Y value, and your epics and your batch size. All that goes into the fit. And you can see here where that was all just compressed to make it run easier. You can just create a model and do a fit on it, uh, and you only have like that last set of code on there. So it's automatic. That's what they mean by the eager so if you see the first part and you're like, what the heck is all this session thing going on? That's TensorFlow 1.0. And then when you get into 2.0, it's just nice and clean. If you remember from the beginning, I said Cross uh, on our list up there. And uh, Cross is the high-level API in TensorFlow 2.0. Cross is the official high-level API of TensorFlow 2.0. It has incorporated Cross as tf.cross. Cross provides a number of model building APIs such as sequential, functional, and subclassing, so you can choose the right level of abstraction for your project. And uh, we'll hopefully touch base a little bit more on this, sequential being the most common uh, form, that is your, your layers are going from one side to the other, so everything's going in a sequential order. Functional is where you can split the layers, so you might have your input coming in one side, it splits into two completely mo different models, and then they come back together. Um, and one of them might be doing classification. The other one might be doing just linear regression kind of stuff, or a neural basic uh, reverse propagation neural network. And then those all come together into another layer, which is your uh, neural network reverse propagation setup. Subclassing is the most complicated as you're building your own models, and you can subclass your own models into Keras. So very powerful tools here. This is all the stuff that's been coming out currently in the TensorFlow Cross setup. A third big change we're going to look at is that in TensorFlow 1.0, uh, in order to use TF layers as variables, uh, you would have to write TF variable block. So you'd have to predefine that. In TensorFlow 2, you just add your layers in under the sequential, and it automatically defines them as long as they're flat layers. Of course, this changes a little bit as the more complicated um, tensor you have coming in, but all of it's very easy to do, and that's what 2.0 does a really good job of. And here we have um, a little bit more on the scope of this, and you can see how TensorFlow 1 asks you to do um, these different layers and values. If you look at the scope and the default name, you start looking at all the different code in there to create the variable scope, that's not even necessary in Tensor 2.0. So you'd have to do one before you do do what you see the code in 2.0. In 2.0, you just create your model. It's a sequential model, and then you can add all your layers in. You don't have to pre-create the um, uh, variable scope. So if you ever see the variable scope, you know that came from an older version. And then we have uh, the last two, which is our API cleanup and the autograph. Uh, in the API cleanup TensorFlow 1, you could build models using tfgans, tfapp, tfcontrib, tfflags, etc. In TensorFlow 2, uh, a lot of APIs have been removed. And this is just, they just cleaned them up because people weren't using them and they've simplified them. 
and that's your TF app, your TF flags, and your TF logging are all gone. Uh, so there's, those are three legacy features that are not in 2.0. And then we have our TF function and autograph feature. In the old version, uh, TensorFlow 1.0, the Python functions were limited and could not be compiled or exported, re-imported. So you were continually having to redo your code and you couldn't very easily just um, uh, put a pointer to it and say, hey, let's reuse this. In TensorFlow 2, you can write a Python function using the TF function to mark it for the JIT compilation for the Python JIT. So that TensorFlow runs it as a single graph. Autograph feature of TF function helps to write graph code using natural Python syntax. Uh, now we just threw in a new word in you, graph. Uh, graph is not a picture of a person. Uh, you'll hear graph X and some other things. Graph is what are all those lines that are connecting different objects. So if you remember from before where we had uh, the different layers going through sequentially, each one of those white lined arrows would be a graph X. That's where that computation is taken care of and that's what they're talking about. And so if you had your own special code or Python way that you're sending that information forward, you can now put your own function in there instead of using whatever function they're using in neural networks, this would be your activation function, although it could be almost anything out there depending on what you're doing. Next, let's go for hierarchy and architecture, and then we'll cover three basic tools in TensorFlow before we roll up our sleeves and dive into the example. So let's just take a quick look at TensorFlow toolkits and their hierarchy. At the high level, we have our object-oriented API. So this is what you're working with. You have your TF Keras, you have your estimators, this sits on top of your TF layers, TF losses, TF metrics. So you have your reusable libraries for model building. This is really where TensorFlow shines is between the Keras, uh, running your estimators, and then being able to swap in different layers. You can, your losses, your metrics, all of that is so built into TensorFlow. It makes it really easy to use. And then you can get down to your low level TF API. Um, you have extensive control over this. You can put your own formulas in there, your own procedures or models in there. Uh, you could have it split. We talked about that earlier. So with the 2.0, you can now have it split one direction where you do a linear regression model and then go to the other where it does a uh, neural network. And maybe each neural network has a different activation set on it. And then it comes together into another layer, which is another neural network. So you can build these really complicated models, and at the low level, you can put in your own APIs, you can move that stuff around. And most recently, we have the TF code can run on multiple platforms. And so you have your CPU, which is uh, basically like on the computer I'm running on, I have uh, eight cores and 16 dedicated threads. I hear they now have one out there that has over 100 cores. Uh, so you have your CPU running, and then you have your GPU, which is your graphics card. And most recently, they also include the TPU setup, which is specifically for TensorFlow models, uh, neural network kind of setup. So now you can export the TF code and it can run on all kinds of different platforms for the most um, diverse setup out there. And moving on from the hierarchy to the architecture, in the TensorFlow 2.0 architecture, uh, we have, uh, you can see on the left, this is usually where you start out with and 80% of your time in data science is spent pre-processing data, making sure it's loaded correctly and everything looks right. Uh, so the first level in TensorFlow is going to be your read and pre-process data, your TF data feature columns. This is going to feed into your TF Keras or your pre-made estimators and kind of you have your TensorFlow hub that sits on top of there so you can see what's going on. Uh, once you have all that set up, you have your distribution strategy. Where are you going to run it? Are you going to be running it on just your regular CPU? Are you going to be running it uh, with the GPU added in? Um, like I have a pretty high-end graphics card, so it actually grabs that GPU processor and uses it. Or do you have a specialized TPU set up in there that you paid extra money for? Uh, it could be if you're in later on when you're distributing the package, you might need to run this on some really high processors because you're processing at a server level for uh, let's say net, you might be processing this at a, um, a distribute, you're distributing it, not the distribution strategy, but you're distributing it into a server where that server might be analyzing thousands and thousands of purchases done every minute. Um, and so you need that higher speed to give them a, um, 
to give them a recommendation or a suggestion so they can buy more stuff off your website. Or maybe you're looking for uh, data fraud analysis working with the banks. You want to be able to run this at a high speed so that when you have hundreds of people sending their transactions in, it says, hey, this doesn't look right. Someone's scamming this person and probably has their credit card. So when we're talking about all those fun things, we're talking about saved model. This is, we were talking about that earlier where it used to be when you did one of these models, it wouldn't truncate the float numbers the same. And so a model going from one, you build the model on your uh, machine in the office and then you need to distribute it. And so we have our TensorFlow serving cloud on premium. That's what I was talking about if you're like a banking or something like that. Now they have TensorFlow Lite. So you can actually run a TensorFlow on an Android or an iOS or Raspberry Pi. A little breakout board there. In fact, they just came out with a new one that has a built-in, this is a little mini TPU with the camera on it so it can pre-process a video. So you can load your TensorFlow model onto that. Um, talking about an affordable way to beta test uh, a new product. Uh, you have the TensorFlow JS, which is for browser and node server. So you can get that out on the browser for some simple computations that don't require a lot of heavy lifting, but you want to distribute to a lot of endpoints. And now they also have other language bindings. So you can now create your uh, TensorFlow backend, save it, and have it accessed from C, Java, Go, C Sharp, Rust, R, or from whatever package you're working on. So we kind of have an uh, overview of the architecture and what's going on behind the scenes. And in this case, what's going on as far as distributing it. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, three specific pieces of TensorFlow. And those are going to be constants, variables, and sessions. Uh, so very basic things you need to know and understand when you're working with the TensorFlow uh, setup. So constants in TensorFlow. In TensorFlow, constants are created using the function constant. Uh, in other words, they're going to stay static the whole time, whatever you're working with. The syntax for constant uh, value, dtype nine, shape equals none, name constant, verify shape equals false. That's kind of the syntax you're looking at. And we'll explore this with our hands on a little more in depth. Uh, and you can see here we do z equals tf.constant, 5.2, name equals x, uh, dtype is a float. That means that we're never going to change that 5.2. It's going to be a constant value. And then we have our variables in TensorFlow. Uh, variables in TensorFlow are in memory buffers that store tensors. And so we can declare a 2 by 3 tensor populated by 1s. You could also do constants this way, by the way. So you can create a, um, an array of ones for your constants. I'm not sure why you do that, but you know, you might need that for some reason. Um, in here we have v equals tf.variables. And then in TensorFlow you have tf.ones. And you have the shape, which is 2, 3, which is then going to create a nice uh, 2 by 3 um, array that's filled with ones. And then of course you can go in there and they're variables so you can change them. It's a tensor, so you have full control over that. And then you of course have uh, sessions in TensorFlow. A session in TensorFlow is used to run a computational graph to evaluate the nodes. And remember, when we're talking about graph or graph X, we're talking about all that information then goes through all those arrows and whatever computations they have that take it to the next node. And you can see down here uh, where we have import TensorFlow as TF. If we do X equals a TF dot constant of 10, we do Y equals a TF constant of 2.0 or 20.0. And then you can do z equals tf.variable, and it's a tf.add x comma y. Uh, and then once you have that set up in there, you go ahead and init your tf global variables initializer with tf session as session. You can do a session run init, and then you print the session run y. Uh, and so when you run this, you're going to end up with, of course, the uh, 10 plus 20 is 30. And we'll be looking at this a lot more closely as we actually roll up our sleeves and put some code together. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And for my coding today, I'm going to go ahead and go through Anaconda, and then I'll use specifically the Jupyter Notebook on there. And of course, this code is going to work uh, whatever platform you choose, whether you're in a notebook, um, the Jupyter Lab, which is just a Jupyter Notebook, but with tabs for larger projects. We're going to stick with Jupyter Notebook. PyCharm, uh, whatever it is you're going to use in here. Uh, you, know, you have your Spider and your QT console for different programming environments. The thing to note, um, it's kind of hard to see, but I have my main Py 3.6. 
Right now, when I was writing this, TensorFlow works in Python version 3.6. If you have Python version 3.7 or 3.8, you're probably going to get some errors in there. Uh, might be that they've already updated it and I don't know it, and I have an older version. But you want to make sure you're in a Python version 3.6 in your environment. And of course, in Anaconda, I can easily set that environment up. Make sure you go ahead and, and um, pip in your TensorFlow, or if you're in Anaconda, you can do Aconda install TensorFlow to make sure it's in your package. So let's just go ahead and dive in and bring that up. This will open up a nice browser window. I just love the fact I can zoom in and zoom out depending on what I'm working on, making it really easy to adjust um, a demo for the right size. Go under New, and let's go ahead and create a new Python. And once we're in our uh, new Python window, this is going to leave it untitled, uh, let's go ahead and import. Import TensorFlow as TF. Uh, at this point, we'll go ahead and just run it real quick. No errors. Yay! No errors. Uh, <laughs> I do that whenever I do my imports because I, I unbearably will have opened up a new environment and forgotten to install TensorFlow into that environment uh, or something along those lines. So it's always good to double check. Uh, and if we're going to double check that, we also it's also good to know uh, what version we're working with. And we can do that simply by um, using the version command in TensorFlow, which uh, you should know is, is probably intuitively the tf um, dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. And, you know, it always confuses me because sometimes you do tf dot version for one thing, you do tf dot underscore version underscore for another thing. Uh, this is a double underscore in TensorFlow for pulling your version out. And it's good to know what you're working with. We're going to be working in TensorFlow version 2.1.0. And I did tell you that the, um, we were going to dig a little deeper into our constants. And you can do an array of constants. And we'll just create this nice array, um, a equals tf.constant. And we're just going to put the array right in there, 4361. Uh, we can run this, and now that is what A is equal to. And if we want to just double check that, uh, remember we're in Jupyter Notebook, where I can just put the letter A, and it knows that that's going to be print. Um, otherwise, you'd, round, you'd surround it in print. And you can see it's a TF tensor. It has the shape, the type, and the, and the array on here. It's a two-by-two two array. And just like we can create a constant, we can go ahead and create a variable. And this is also going to be a two-by-two two array. And if we go ahead and print the V out, We'll run that, uh, and sure enough, there's our TF variable in here. Uh, then we can also, let's just go back up here and add this in here. Um, I could create another tensor, and we'll make it a constant this time. And we'll go ahead and put that in over here. Uh, we'll have B TF constant, and if we go ahead and print out uh, V and B, let me go ahead and run that. And this is an interesting thing that always that happens in here. Uh, you'll see right here when I print them both out, what happens is it only prints the last one unless you use print commands. Uh, so important to remember that in Jupyter Notebooks. But we can easily fix that by go ahead and, and print and surround V with brackets. And now we can see with the two different variables we have, uh, we have the 3152, which is a variable. And this is just a flat uh, constant. So it comes up as a TF tensor shape two kind of two. And that's interesting to note that this label is a tf.tensor and this is a tf variable. So that's how it's looking in the back end when you're talking about the difference between a variable and a constant. The other thing I want you to notice is that in variable we capitalize the v and with the constant we have a lowercase c. Little things like that can uh, lose you when you're programming and you're trying to find out, hey, why doesn't this work? Uh, so those are a couple little things to note in here. And just like any other array in math, uh, we can do like a concatenate or concatenate the different values here. Uh, and you can see we can take um, a b concatenated. You just do a tf dot concat values, and there's our a b axes on one. Hopefully you're familiar with axes and how that works when you're dealing with matrices. And if we go ahead and print this out, uh, you'll see right here we end up with a tensor. So let's put it in as a constant, not as a variable. And you have your array 4378 and 6145. It's concatenated the two together.
And again, I want to highlight a couple things on this. Our axes equals one. This means we're doing the columns. Um, so if you had a longer array, like right now we have an array that is like, you know, has a shape one, whatever it is, two comma two. Um, axes zero is going to be your first one and axes one is going to be your second one. And it translates as columns and rows. If we had a shape, let me just put the word shape here. Um, so you know what I'm talking about, and it's very clear. And this is, I'll tell you what, I spend a lot of time looking at these shapes and trying to figure out which direction I'm going in and whether to flip it or whatever. Um, so you can get lost in which way your matrix is going, which is column, which is rows. Are you dealing with the third axes or the second axes? Um, axes 1, you know, 0, 1, 2, that's going to be our columns. Uh, and if you can do columns, then we also can do rows. And that is simply just changing the concatenate. Uh, we'll just grab this one here and copy it. We'll do the whole thing over. Um, control copy. Control V. And changes from axis 1 to axis 0. And if we run that, uh, you'll see that now we concatenate by uh, row as opposed to column. And you have four, three, six, one, seven, eight, four, seven. So it just brings it right down and turns it into rows versus columns. You can see the difference there, your output. In this really, you want to look at the output sometimes just to make sure your eyes are looking at it correctly and it's in the format. Um, I find visually looking at it is almost more important than understanding what's going on because uh, conceptually your mind just, just too many dimensions sometimes. The second thing I want you to notice is this says a numpy array. Uh, so TensorFlow is utilizing NumPy as part of their format as far as Python's concerned. And so you can treat, you can treat this output like a NumPy array because it is just that. It's going to be a NumPy array. Another thing that comes up uh, more than you would think is filling uh, one of these with zeros or ones. And so you can see here we just create a tensor tf.zeros. And we give it a shape. We tell it what kind of data type it is. In this case, we're doing an integer. And then if we... Um, print out our tensor. Again, we're in Jupyter, so I can just type out tensor. And I run this, you can see I have a nice array of um, with shape 3, 4 of zeros. One of the things I want to highlight here is integer 32. If I go to the um, TensorFlow data types, I want you to notice how we have float 16, float 32, float 64, uh, complex. If we scroll down, you'll see the integer down here, 32. The reason for this is that we want to control how many bits are used in the precision. This is for exporting it to another platform. Uh, so what would happen is I might run it on this computer where Python goes does a float to indefinite, however long it wants to, um, and then we can take it, but we want to actually say, hey, we don't want that high precision. We want to be able to run this on any computer. And so we need to control whether it's a TF float 16. In this case, we did an integer 32. We could also do this as a float. So if I run this as a float 32, uh, that means this has a 32-bit precision. You'll see zero point whatever. And then to go with uh, zeros, we have ones. If we're going from the opposite side, and so we can easily just create a uh, TensorFlow with ones. And you might ask yourself, why would I want zeros and ones? And your first thought might be to initiate a new tensor. Usually we initiate a lot of this stuff with random numbers because it does a better job solving it. If you start with a uniform uh, set of ones or zeros, you're dealing with a lot of bias. So be very careful about starting a neural network uh, for one of your rows or something like that with ones and zeros. On the other hand, uh, I use this for masking. You can do a lot of work with masking. You can also have, uh, it might be that one tensor row is masked um, you know, zero is, is false, one is true, or whatever you want to do it. Um, and so in that case, you do want to use the zeros and ones. And there are cases where you do want to initialize it with all zeros or all ones, and then swap in different numbers as, a, as the um, tensor learns. So it's another form of control. But in general, you see zeros and ones, you usually are talking about a mask over another array. And just like in uh, NumPy, you can also uh, do reshapes. So if we take our, um, remember this is shape 3, 4. Maybe we want to swap that to 4, 3. And if we print this out, you will see, let me just go ahead and do that. Control V. Let me run that. 
and you'll see that the the order of these is now switched instead of uh, four across now we have three across and four down and just for fun let's go back up here where we did the ones and i'm going to change the ones to um, tf.randomuniform uh, and we'll go ahead and just take off well we'll go ahead and leave that we'll go ahead and run this and you'll see now we have uh, 0.0441 and this way you can actually see how the reshape looks a lot different. Uh, 0 0.041, 0 0.15, 0 0.71. And then instead of having this one, it rolls down here to the 0 0.14. And this is uh, what I was talking about. Sometimes you fill, you, a lot of times you fill these with random numbers. And so this is the random.uniform is one of the ways to do that. Now, I just talked a little bit about this float 32 and all these data types. Uh, one of the things that comes up, of course, is recasting your data. Um, so if we have a D-type float 32, we might want to convert these to integers because of the project we're working on. Um, I know one of the projects I've worked on ended up wanting to do a lot of round off so that it would take a dollar amount or a float value and then have to round it off to a dollar amount. So we only wanted two decimal points. Um, and in which case you have a lot of different options. You can multiply by a hundred and then round it off or whatever you want to do. There's a lot of, or, or then convert it to an integer was one way to round it off. Uh, kind of a cheap and dirty trick. <laughs> uh, so we can take this and we can take the same tensor and we'll go ahead and create a, um, as an integer. And so we're going to take this tensor. We're going to tf.cast it. And if we print tensor. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and print our tensor. Let me just do a quick copy and paste. And when I'm actually programming, I usually type out a lot of my stuff just to double check it. Uh, in doing a demo, copy and paste works fine, but sometimes be aware that uh, copy and paste can copy the wrong code over. Personal choice. Depends on what I'm working on. And you can see here we took um, a float 32, 4.6, 4.2, and so on. And it just converts it right down to a integer value. Uh, so our integer 32 setup. And uh, you remember we talked about um, a little bit about reshape um, as far as flipping it. And I just did uh, 4 comma 3 on the reshape up here. And we talked about axis 0, axis 1. Uh, one of the things that is important to be able to do is to take one of these variables. We'll just take this last one, tensor as integer. And I want to go ahead and transpose it. And so I can do, um, we'll do a equals tf.transpose. And we'll do our tensor integer in there. And then if I print the a out and we run this, you'll see that's the same array, but we've flipped it so that our columns and rows are flipped. This is the same as reshaping. Uh, so when you transpose, you're just doing a reshape. What's nice about this is that if you look at the numbers, the columns, when, you, when we went up here and we did the reshape, they kind of roll down to the next row. So you're not maintaining the structure of your matrix. So when we do a reshape up here, they're similar, but they're not quite the same. And you can actually go in here and there's settings in the reshape that would allow you to turn it into a transform. Uh, so when we come down here, it's all done for you. And so there are so many times you have to transpose your digits that this is important to know that you can just do that. You can flip your rows and columns rather quickly here. And just like NumPy, you can also do your different math functions. We'll look at multiplication. And so we're going to take matrix multiplication of tensors. Uh, we'll go ahead and create A as a constant, 5, 8, 3, 9. And we'll put in a vector V, 4, 2. And we could have done this where they matched, where this was a two by two array. Um, but instead, we're going to do just a uh, two by one array. And the code for that is your tf.matmol. Uh, so matrix multiplier. And we have A times V. And if we go ahead and run this, oh, let's make sure we print out our AV on there. And if we go ahead and run this, uh, you'll see that we end up with 36 by 30. And if it's been a while since you've seen the matrix math, uh, this is 5 times 4 plus 8 times 2, um, 3 times 4 plus 9 times 2. And that's where we get the 36 and 30. Now, I know we're covering a lot really quickly as far as the basic functionality. 
Uh, so the matrix or your matrix multiplier is a very commonly used back-end tool as far as computing um, uh, different models or uh, linear regression, stuff like that. One of the things is to note is that just like in um, NumPy, you have all of your different math. So we have our TF math. And if we go in here, we have um, functions, we have our cosines, absolute, angle, all of that's in here. So all of these are available for you to use in the TensorFlow model. And if we go back to our example, and let's go ahead and pull, um, oh, let's do some multiplication. That's always good. We'll stick with our um, AV, our um, constant A and our vector V. And we'll go ahead and do some bitwise multiplication and we'll create an AV, which is A times V. Let's go and print that out. And you can see coming across here, uh, we have the 4, 2 and the 5, 8, 3, 9. And it produces uh, 20, 32, 6, 18. And that's pretty straightforward. If you look at it, you have 4 times uh, 5 is 20. 4 times 8 is uh, 32. That's where those numbers come from. Uh, we can also quickly create an identity matrix, which is basically um, your main values on the diagonal being ones and zeros across the other side. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what that uh, uh, looks like. And we can do, let's do this. Uh, so we're going to get the shape. Um, this is a simple way, very similar to your numpy. You can do a dot shape. And it's going to return a tuple, in this case our rows and columns. And so we can do a quick uh, print. We'll do rows. Oops. And we'll do columns. And if we run this, uh, you can see we have three rows, uh, two columns. And then if we go ahead and create an identity matrix, the scripts, <laughs> the script for that, got a wrong button there. The script for that looks like this, where we have the number of rows equals rows, the number of columns equals columns, and D type is a 32. And then if we go ahead and just print out our identity, You can see we have a nice uh, identity column with our ones going across here. Now, clearly we're not going to go through every math module um, available, but we do want to start looking at this as a prediction model and seeing how it functions. So we're going to move on to a more of a um, direct setup where you can actually see the full TensorFlow in use. For that, let's go back and create a, a new setup. And we'll go in here, new Python 3 module. There we go. Bring this out so it takes up the whole window because I like to do that. Hopefully you made it through that first part and you have a basic understanding of TensorFlow as far as being uh, a series of NumPy arrays. you got your math equations and different things that go into them. We're going to start building a full um, setup as far as the NumPy so you can see how uh, Karas sits on top of it and the different aspects of how it works. The first thing we want to do is we're going to go ahead and do a lot of imports. Uh, date times, warning, SciPy. SciPy is your um, uh, math, so the back end scientific math. Uh, warnings because whenever we do a lot of this, you have older versions, newer versions, um, and so it's sometimes when you get warnings, you want to go ahead and just suppress them. We'll talk about that if it comes up on this particular setup. And of course, date time. Pandas, again, is your data frame. Think rows and columns. We import it as PD. NumPy is your uh, numbers array, which, of course, TensorFlow is integrated heavily with. Seaborn for our graphics. And the Seaborn, as SNS, is going to be set on top of our matplot library, which we import as MPL. And then, of course, we're going to import our matplot library pyplot as PLT. And right off the bat, we're going to set some graphic colors. Um, patch force edge color equals true. The style, we're going to use the 538 style. You can look this all up. There's When you get into matplot library and to Seaborn, 
And there are so many options in here. It's just kind of nice to make it look pretty when we start the um, when we start up. That way we don't have to think about it later on. Uh, and then we're going to take, we have our uh, uh, MPLRC. We're going to put a patch, ed color, dim gray line width. Again, this is all part of our graphics here in our setup. Uh, we'll go ahead and do an interactive shell. Uh, node interactivity equals last expression. Uh, here we are, PD for pandas. Options display max columns. So we don't want to display more than 50. Um, and then our matplot library is going to be inline. This is a Jupyter notebook thing, the matplot library inline. Uh, and then warnings, we're going to filter our warnings, and we're just going to ignore warnings. That way when they come up, we don't have to worry about them. Not really what you want to do when you're working on a uh, major project. You want to make sure you know those warnings and then uh, filter them out and ignore them later on. And if we run this, it's just going to be loading all that into the background. Uh, so that's a little back-end kind of stuff. Then what we want to go ahead and do is we want to go ahead and import our specific packages uh, that we're going to be working with, which is under Keras. Now remember, Keras kind of sits on TensorFlow. So when we're importing Keras and the sequential model, we are in effect importing um, TensorFlow underneath of it. Uh, we just brought in the math, probably should have put that up above. And then we have our Keras models, we're going to import sequential. Now if you remember from our uh, slide, there was three different options. Let me just flip back over there so we can have a quick uh, recall on that. And so in Keras, uh, we have sequential, functional, and subclassing. So remember those three different setups in here we talked about earlier. And if you remember from here, we have uh, sequential, where it's going one TensorFlow layer at a time. You go kind of look at, think of it as going from left to right or top to bottom or whatever direction it's going in. But it goes in one direction all the time, where Functional can have a very complicated graph of directions. You can have the data split into two separate um, tensors, and then it comes back together into another tensor, um, all those kinds of things. And then subclassing is really the really complicated one, where now you're adding your own subclasses into the tensor to do external computations right in the middle of like a huge flow of data. Uh, but we're going to stick with sequential. It's not a big jump to go from sequential to functional. Uh, but we're running a sequential TensorFlow. And that's what this first import is here. We want to bring in our sequential. And then we have our layers. And let's talk a little bit about these layers. This is where Cross and TensorFlow really are happening. This is what makes them so nice to work with, is all these layers are pre-built. Uh, so from Cross, we have layers import dense. From Cross, uh, layers import LSTM. When we talk about these layers, uh, Keras has so many built-in layers. You can do your own layers. The dense layer is your standard neural network. Uh, by default, it uses uh, ReLU for its activation. And then the LSTM is a long, short-term memory layer. Since we're going to be looking probably at sequential data, uh, we want to go ahead and do the LSTM. And if we go into... Um, Cross, and we look at their layers, this is a Cross website, you can see as we scroll down for the Cross layers that are built in, we can get down here and we can look at, let's see, here we have our layer activation, our base layers, um, activation, layer weight, layer weight, just a lot of stuff in here. We had the ReLU, which is the basic activation that was listed up here for layer activation, so you can change those. And here we have our core layers and our dense layers. You have an input layer, a dense layer, um, and then we've added a more customized one with the long-term, short-term memory layer. And of course, you can even do your own custom layers in Keras. There's a whole functionality in there if you're doing your own thing. What's really nice about this is it's all built in. Uh, even the convolutional layers, this is for processing graphics. There's a lot of cool things in here you can do. Um, this is why Keras is so popular. It's open source and you have all these tools right at your fingertips. So from Keras, we're just going to import a couple layers, the dense layer um, and the long short-term memory layer. And then, of course, from uh, sklearn, our scikit, we want to go ahead and do our min-max scalar, standard scalar for pre-editing our data, and then metrics just so we can take a look at the errors and compute those. Let me go ahead and run this, and that just loads it up. We're not expecting anything from the output. And our file coming in is going to be airquality.csv. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. This is in OpenOffice. It's just a standard 
you know, you can do Excel, whatever you're using for your spreadsheet. And you can see here we have a number of columns, a number of rows. It actually goes down to like 8,000. The first thing we want to notice is that the first row is kind of just a random number put in going down. Probably not something we're going to work with. The second row um, is Bandung. I'm guessing that's a reference for the profile. If we scroll to the bottom, which I'm not going to do because it takes forever to get back up, they're all the same. Uh, the same thing with the status. The status is the same. We have a date, so we have a sequential order here. Um, here is the jam, which I'm going to guess is the timestamp on there. So we have a date and time. We have our O3, CO, NO2 reading, SO2, NO, CO2, VOC, um, and then some other numbers here, PM1, PM2.5, PM4, PM10. Uh, without actually looking through the data, um, I mean, some of this I can guess is like temperature, humidity. I'm not sure what the PMs are. Uh, but we have a whole slew of data here. Uh, so we're looking at air quality as far as an area and a region and what's going on with our date timestamps on there. And so code-wise, we're going to read this into a pandas data frame. So our data frame, uh, DF is a nice abbreviation commonly used for data frames, equals pd.readcsv, and then our the path to it just happens to be on my D drive, uh, separated by spaces. And so if we go ahead and run this, We'll print out the head of our data, and again, this looks very similar to what we were just looking at. Um, being in Jupiter, I can take this and whoop, go the other way. Uh, make it real small so you can see all the columns going across, and we can get a full view of it. Um, or we can bring it back up in size. <laughs> That's pretty small on there. Overshot. Um, but you can see it's the same data we were just looking at. Uh, we're looking at the number. We're looking at the profile, which is the bandung, the um, date. We have a timestamp, our O3 count CO, and so forth on here. Uh, and this is just your basic pandas printing out the top five rows. We could easily have done uh, three rows, uh, five rows, ten, whatever you want to put in there. By default, that's uh, five for pandas. Now, I talk about this all the time, so I know I've already said it at least once or twice during this video. Most of our work is in pre-formatting data. What are we looking at? How do we bring it together? Uh, so we want to go ahead and start with our date time. Uh, it's come in in two columns. We have our date here and we have our time. And we want to go ahead and combine that. And then we have, uh, this is just a simple script in there that says combine date time. That's our formula we're building. Our, uh, we're going to submit our um, pandas data frame and the tab name. When we go ahead and do this, uh, that's all of our information that we want to go ahead and create. And then goes for I and range DF uh, shape zero. So we're going to go through um, the whole setup and we're going to list tab append DF location I. And here is our date uh, going in there and then return the numpy array list tab D types date time 64. That's all we're doing. We're just switching this to a date time stamp. And if we go ahead and uh, do DF date time equals combined date time. And then I always like to uh, print. We'll do DF head just so we can see what that looks like. And so when we come out of this, uh, we now have our setup on here. And of course it's added it on to the far right. Here's our date time. You can see the formats changed. Uh, so there's our, we've added in the date time column and we've brought the date over and we've taken this format here and it's an actual uh, variable with a 000 on here. Well, that doesn't look good. So we need to also include the time part of this. And we want to convert it into hourly data. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, to do that, uh, to finish combining our date time, let's go ahead and create a, uh, a little script here to combine the time in there. Same thing we just did. We're just creating a numpy array, returning a numpy array and forcing this into a date time format. And we can actually spend hours just going through uh, these conversions. How do you pull it from the pandas data frame. How do you set it up? Um, so I'm kind of skipping through it a little fast because I want to stay focused on TensorFlow and Keras. Keep in mind this is like 80% of your coding when you're doing a lot of this stuff is going to be reformatting these things, resetting them back up uh, so that it looks right on here. And uh, you know it just takes time to, to get through all that. But that is usually what the companies are paying you for. That's what the big bucks are for. <laughs> 
And we want to go ahead and uh, a couple things going on here is we're going to go ahead and do our date time. We're going to reorganize some of our setup in here, convert into hourly data. Let me just put a pause in there. Uh, now remember we can select from DF our different columns we're going to be working with. And you're going to see that we actually dropped a couple of the columns. Those ones I showed you earlier, they're just repetitive data. Uh, so there's nothing in there that exciting. And then we want to go ahead and we'll create a, a second data frame here. Let me just get rid of the DF head. And DF2 is we're going to group by date time and we're looking at the mean value. And then we'll print that out so you can see what we're talking about. Uh, we have now reorganized this so we put in date time 03 CO. So now this is in the same order um, as it was before. And you'll see the date time now has our 00. zero. Uh, same date, one, two, three, and so on. So let's group the data together so that it's a lot more manageable and in the format we want. And in the right sequential order. And if we go back to, um, there we go, our air quality, uh, you can see right here we're looking at um, these columns going across. We really don't need, since we're going to create our own date time column, we can get rid of those. These are the different columns of information we want, and that should reflect right here in the columns we picked coming across. So this is all the same columns on there. That's all we've done is reformatted our data, grouped it together by date, and then you can see the different data coming out uh, set up on there. Uh, and then as a data scientist, <laughs> first thing I want to do is get a description. What am I looking at? Uh, and so we can go ahead and do the DF2 describe, and this gives us our... Um, you know, describe gives us our basic uh, data analytics information we might be looking for, like what is the mean, standard deviation, uh, minimum amount, maximum amount. We have our first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter um, numbers also in there. Uh, so you can get a quick look at a glance describing the data or descriptive analysis. And even though we have our uh, quantile information in here, we're going to dig a little deeper into that. Uh, we're going to calculate the quantile for each variable. Uh, we're going to look at a number of things for each variable. And we'll see right here, Q1, uh, we can simply do the quantile 0.25%, which should match um, our 25% up here. And we're going to be looking at the min, the max, um, and we're just going to do this. It's basically, we're breaking this down for each uh, different variable in there. One of the things that's kind of fun to do uh, we're going to look at that in just a second. Let me get put the next piece of code in here. Um, we got to clean out some of our... Um, we're going to drop a couple things, our um, last rows and first row, because those have... Usually they have a lot of null values, and the first row is just our titles. Uh, so that's important. It's important to drop those rows in here. And so this right here, as we look at our different quantiles, again, it's, it's the same. You know, we're still looking at the 25 quantile here. We're going to do a little bit more with this. Um, so now that we've cleared off our first and last rows, we're going to go ahead and go through all of our columns. And this way we can look at each uh, column individually. And so we'll just create a Q1, Q3, min, max, uh, min IQR, max IQR, and calculate the quantile of I of DF2. We're basically doing uh, the math that they did up here, but we're splitting it apart. Um, that's all this is. And this happens a lot because you might want to look at individual. Uh, if this was my own project, I would probably spend days and days going through what these different values mean. One of the biggest data science uh, things we can look at that's important is uh, use, your, use your common sense. <laughs> you know, if you're looking at this data and it doesn't make sense and you go back in there and you're like, wait a minute, what the heck did I just do? At that point, you probably should go back and double check what you have going on. Now, uh, we're looking at this, and you can see right here, here's our attribute for our O3. So we've broken it down. Uh, we have our Q1, 5.88, Q3, 10.37. If we go back up here, here's our 5.8. We've uh, rounded it off. 10.37's in there. So we've basically done the same math, uh, just split it up. We have our minimum and our max IQR. And that's computed, uh, let's see, where is it? Here we go. Uh, Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR. And the IQR is your Q3 minus Q1. So that's the difference between our two different quarters. And this is all uh, data science. Um, as far as the hard math, 
we're really not, uh, we're actually trying to focus on Keras and TensorFlow, you still got to go through all this stuff. I told you 80% of your programming is going through and understanding what the heck uh, happened here. What's going on? What does this data mean? And so when we look in that, we're going to go ahead and say, hey, um, we've computed these numbers. And the reason we've computed these numbers is if you take the minimum value and it's less than your min minimum IQR, uh, that means something's going wrong there. And that usually in this case is going to show us an outlier. Uh, so we want to go ahead and find the minimum value. If it's less than the min minimum IQR, it's an outlier. And if the max value is greater than the uh, max IQR, uh, we have an outlier. And that's all this is doing. Low outlier is found, uh, minimum value, high outlier is found. Uh, really important, actually. Outliers are almost everything in data sometimes. Sometimes you do this project just to find the outliers because you want to know uh, crime detection. What are we looking for? We're looking for the outliers. What doesn't fit a normal business deal? And then we'll go ahead and throw in, um, just throw in a lot of code. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so we have, if your max is greater than IQR, print outlier is found. What we want to do is we want to start cleaning up these outliers. And so we want to convert, uh, we'll do create a convert nan, x max IQR equals max uh, underscore IQR, min IQR equals min IQR. So this is just saying this is the data we're going to send. That's all that is in Python. And if x is greater than the max IQR and x is less than the min IQR, x equals uh, null. We're going to set it to null. Why? Because we want to clear these outliers out of the data. Now, again, if you're doing fraud detection, you would do the opposite. You would be cleaning everything else that's not in that series so that you can look at just the outlier. Uh, and then we're going to convert the NAN hum. Again, we have X uh, max IQR is 100%. Min IQR is min IQR. If X is greater than max IQR and X is less than min IQR, Again, we're going to return a null value. Otherwise, it's going to remain the same value x, x equals x. And you can see um, as we go through the code, if i equals um, uh, our hum, uh, then we go ahead and do, that's the, that's a column specific to humidity. That's your hum column. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and convert, do the, run a map on there and convert the non hum. Uh, you can see here it's, this is just cleanup. Uh, we run, we found out that humidity probably has some weird values in it. Uh, we have our outliers. Um, that's all this is. And so when we go ahead and finish this and we take a look at our outliers and we run this code here, uh, we have a low outlier, 2.04. We have a high outlier, 99.06. Outliers have been interpolated. That means we've given them a new value. Uh, chances are these days when you're looking at something like um, these sensors coming in, they probably have a failed sensor in there. Something went wrong. Um, that's the kind of thing that you really don't want to do your data analysis on. Uh, so that's what we're doing is we're pulling that out and then uh, converting it over and setting it up uh, method linear. So we interpolate method linear is it's going to fill that data in based on a linear regression model of similar data. Uh, same thing with this up here with the uh, um, DF2I interpolate. That's what we're doing. Again, this is all data prep. Uh, we're not actually talking about TensorFlow. We're just trying to get all our data set up correctly so that when we run it, it's not going to cause problems or have a huge bias. So we've dealt with outliers specifically in humidity. And again, this is one of these things where when we start running, um, we ran through this, you can see down here that we have our um, outliers found, high, low outliers, um, migrated them in. We also know there's other issues going on with this data. Uh, how do we know that? Some of it's just looking at the data, playing with it until you start understanding what's going on. Let's take the temp value. And we're going to go ahead and, and use a logarithmic function on the temp value. And uh, it's interesting because it's like, how do you, how do you heck do you even know to use logarithmic on the temp value? That's domain specific. We're talking about being an expert in air care. I'm not an expert in air care. Um, you know, it's not 
what I go look at. I don't look at air care data. In fact, this is probably the first air care data setup I've looked at. But the experts come in there and they come to you and they say, hey, in data science, um, this is a um, exponentially vari variable on here. So we need to go ahead and do um, transform it and use a logarithmic scale on that. So at that point, that would be coming from your um, uh, data. Here, here we go. Data science programmer overview does a lot of stuff connecting the database and connecting in with the experts data analytics a lot of times you're talking about somebody who is a data analysis might be all the way usually a phd level data science programming level interfaces database manager that's going to be the person who's your admin working on it so when we're looking at this we're looking at uh, something they've sent to me and they said hey domain air care this needs to be, this is a skew because the data just goes up exponentially and affects everything else. And we'll go ahead and take that data. Um, let me just go ahead and run this. Just for another quick look at it, um, we have our, uh, uh, we'll do a distribution DF. We'll create another data frame from the temp values and then from a data set from the um, log temp. So we can put them side by side. And we'll just go ahead and do a quick histogram. And this is kind of nice. Plot of figure, figure size. Here's our PLT from Matplot Library. Uh, and then we'll just do a distribution um, underscore DF. There's our data frames. This is nice because it just integrates the histogram right into pandas. Love pandas. And this is a chart you would send back to your data analyst and say, hey, is this what you wanted? This is how the data is converting on here. As a data scientist, scientist, the first thing I note is we've gone from a 10, 20, 30 uh, scales, a 2.5, 3.0, 3.5 scale. Um, and the data itself has kind of been uh, uh, adjusted a little bit based on some kind of a skew on there. So let's jump into, uh, we're getting a little closer to actually doing our uh, um, cross on here. We'll go ahead and split our data up. Um, and this, of course, is any good data scientist. You want to have a training set and a test set. Uh, and we'll go ahead and do the train size. We're going to use 0.75% of the data. Make sure it's an integer. You don't want to take a slice as a float value. Give you a nice error. Uh, and we'll have our train size is 75%. And the test size is going to be, um, of course, the uh, train size minus the length of the data set. And then we can simply do train comma test. Here's our data set which is going to be the train size, the test size. Uh, and then if we go ahead and print this, let me just go ahead and run this. We can see how these values um, split. It's a nice split of 1,298 and then 433 points of value that are going to be for our um, setup on here. And if you remember, we're specifically looking at the data set. Where did we create that data set from? Um, that was from up here. That's what we called the uh, logarithmic uh, value of the temp. Uh, that's where the data set came from. So we're looking at just that column with this train size and the test with the train and test data set here. And let's go ahead and do a uh, converted an array of values into a data set matrix. We're going to create a little um, setup in here. We create our data set. Our data set's going to come in. We're going to do a look back of one. So we're going to look back one piece of data going backward. And we have our data X and our data Y for I and range length of data set look back minus one. Uh, this is creating, let me just go ahead and run this. Actually, the best way to do this is to go ahead and create this data and take a look at the shape of it. Uh, let me go ahead and just put that code in here. So we're going to do a look back one. Here's our train X, our train Y, and it's going to be adding the data on there. And then when we come up here and we take a look at the shape, there we go. Um, and we run this piece of code here. We look at the shape on this and we have uh, a new slightly different change on here, but we have a shape of X, uh, 1296 comma one, shape of Y, train Y, test X, test Y. And so what we're looking at is that um, the X comes in and we're only having a single value at, out. Uh, we want to predict what the next one is. That's what this little piece of code is here for. What are we looking for? Well, we want to look back one. That's the, um, the what we're going to train the data with is yesterday's data. Yesterday says, hey, the humidity was at 97%. What should today's humidity be at if it's 97% yesterday? Is it going to go up or is it going to go down today? Uh, if 97, does it go up to 100? What's going on there? 
Uh, and so our, we're looking forward to the next piece of data, which says, hey, tomorrow's is going to, you know, today's humidity is this. This is what tomorrow's humidity is going to be. That's all that is. All that is is stacking our data so that uh, our Y is basically X plus 1, or X could be Y minus 1. And then a couple things to note is our X data, um, we're only dealing with the one column, but you need to have it in a shape that has it by the columns. So you have the two different numbers. And since we're doing just a single point of data, we have, and you'll see with the train Y, we don't need to have the extra shape on here. Now, this is going to run into a problem. Uh, and the reason is, is that we have what they call a time step. And the time step is that long-term, short-term memory layer. Uh, so we're going to add another reshape on here. Let me just go down here and put it into the next cell. And so we want to reshape the input uh, array in the form of sample time step features. We're only looking at one feature. And, I mean, this is one of those things when you're playing with this, you're like, why am I getting an error in the numpy array? Why is this giving me something weird going on? Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add one more uh, level on here. Instead of being 1299.1, we want to go one more. And when they put the code together in the back, you can see we kept the same shape, the 1299. Uh, we added the one dimension, and then we have our train X shape one. Um, and this could have depends, again, on how far back in the long short-term memory you want to go. That is what that piece of code is for and that reshape is. And you can see the new shape is now one... Uh, 1299.11 uh, versus the 1299.1. And then the other part of the shape, 432.11. Again, this is our, our XN and, of course, our test X. And then our Y is just a single column because we're just doing one output that we're looking for. So now we've done our 80%. Um, you know, that's all the, the writing all the code, reformatting our data, um, bringing it in. Now we want to go ahead and do the fun part, which is we're going to go ahead and create and fit the LSTM neural network. Uh, and if we're going to do that, the first thing we need is we're going to need to go ahead and create a model. And we'll do this sequential model. And if you remember, sequential means it just goes in order. Uh, that means we have, if we have two layers, the layers go from layer one to layer two or layer zero to layer one. This is different than functional. Uh, functional allows you to split the data and run two completely separate models and then bring them back together. We're doing just sequential on here. And then we decided to do the long short-term memory. Uh, and we have our input shape, uh, which it comes in. Again, this is what all this switching was. We could have easily made this uh, one, two, three, or four going back as far as the uh, end number on there. We just stuck to going back one. And it's always a good idea when you get to this point, where the heck is this model coming from? Um, what kind of models do we have available? And uh, there's, let me go ahead and put the next model in there because uh, we're going to do two models. And the next model is going to go ahead and we're going to do dense. So we have model equals sequential. And then we're going to add the LSTM model. And then we're going to add a dense model. And if you remember from the very top of our code where we did the imports, oops, there we go, our cross, this is it right here. Here's our importing a dense model and here's our importing an LSTM. Now, just about every TensorFlow model uses dense. Uh, your dense model is your basic forward propagation, uh, reverse propagation error, or it does reverse propagation to program the model. Uh, so any of your neural networks that you've already looked at that uh, looks and says, here's the error and sends the error backwards, that's what this is. The long short-term memory is a little different. The real question that we want to look at right now is where do you find these models? What, what kind of models do you have available? And so for that, let's go to the Keras website, uh, which is the Keras.io. If you go under API slash layers, and I always have to do a search, just search for Keras uh, API layers. It'll open up and you can see we have um, your base layers right here, class, trainable, weights, all kinds of stuff like there. Your activation. Uh, so a lot of your layers, you can switch how it activates. Uh, ReLU, which is like your smaller arrays, or if you're doing convolutional ne neural networks, the convolution usually uses a ReLU. Um, your Sigmoid, um, all the way up to SoftMax, SoftPlus, all these different choices as far as how those are set up. And what we want to do is we want to go ahead, and if you scroll down here, you'll see your core layers. And here is your dense layer. 
Uh, so you have an input object, your dense layer, your activation layer, embedding layer. This is your, your kind of your one setup on there that's most common. Uh, convolutional neural networks or your convolutional layers, these are like for doing uh, image categorizing. Uh, so trying to find objects in a picture, that kind of thing. Uh, we have pooling layers, so as you have the layers come together, um, usually you bring them down into a uh, single layer, although you can still do like global max pulling 3D. And there is just, I mean, this list just goes on and on. Uh, there's all kinds of different things hidden in here as far as what you can do. And it changes, you know, you go in here and you just have to do a search for what you're looking for uh, and figure out what's going to work best for you as far as which project you're working on. Uh, long short-term memory is a big one because this is when we start talking about text. Uh, what if someone says the, what comes after the? Uh, the cat in the hat, little kid's uh, book there, um, starts programming it. And so you really want to know not only um, what's going on, but it's going to be something that has a history. The history behind it tells you what the next one coming up is. Now, once we've built all our different, you know, we built our model, we've added our different layers we went in there, um, play with it. Remember, if you're in functional, you can actually link these layers together and they branch out and come back together. If you do a uh, um, the sub setup, then you can create your own different model. You can embed a model in there that might be something linear regression. You can embed a linear regression model uh, as part of your functional split and then have that come back together with other things. So we're going to go ahead and compile your model. This brings everything together. We're going to put in what the loss is, which we'll use the mean squared error. Uh, and we'll go ahead and use the atom optimizer. Clearly, there's a lot of choices on here depending on what you're doing. And just like uh, any of these uh, different prediction models, if you've been doing any uh, um, scikit from Python, uh, you'll recognize that we have to then fit the model. Uh, so what are we doing in here? We're going to send in our train X, our train Y. Um, we're going to decide how many epics we're going to run it through. 500 is probably a lot for this. Um, I'm guessing it'd probably be about two or 300, probably do just fine. Our batch size. So how many different, uh, when you process it, this is the math behind it. If you're in data analytics, um, you might try to know what this number is as a data scientist where I haven't had the PhD level math that says this is why you want to use this particular batch size. You kind of play with this number a little bit. Um, you can dig deeper into the math, see how it affects the results, uh, depending on what you're doing. And there's a number of other settings on here. Uh, we did verbose two. I'd have to actually look that up to tell you what verbose means. I think that's actually the default on there, if I remember correctly. Uh, there's a lot of different settings when you go to fit it. The big ones are your epic and your batch size. Those are what we're looking for. And so we're going to go ahead and run this. And this is going to take a few minutes to run because it's going through um, 500 times through all the data. So if you have a huge data set, this is the point where you're kind of wondering, oh my gosh, is this going to finish tomorrow? Um, if I'm running this on a single machine and I have a terabyte, terabyte of data uh, going into it, if this is my personal computer and I'm running a terabyte of data into this, um, you know, this is running rather quickly through all 500 iterations. Uh, but yeah, you know, a terabyte of data, we're talking something closer to days, week, um, you know, even with a, 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 a 3.5 gigahertz machine and in, in eight cores, it's still going to take a long time to go through a full terabyte of data. And then we want to start looking at putting it into some other framework like Spark or something that will prill the process on there more across multiple um, processors and multiple computers. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you're going to see here's our uh, square mean error of 0 0.0088. If we scroll way up, you'll see it kind of oscillates between 0 0.0088 and 0 0.08089. It's right around 2, 2, 250 where you start seeing that oscillation where it's really not going anywhere. So we really didn't need to go through a full 500 epics. Uh, you know, if you're retraining this stuff over and over again, it's kind of good to note where that error zone is so you don't have to do all the extra processing. Of course if you're going to build a model uh, we want to go ahead and run a prediction on it. So let's go ahead and make our prediction. Remember we have our training test set and our test set or the, <laughs> we have the train X and the train Y for training it or train predict 
and then we have our test X and our test Y going in there. Uh, so we can test to see how good it did. Uh, and when we come in here, we have, um, uh, you'll see right here, we go ahead and do our train predict equals uh, model predict train X and test predict model predict test X. Why would we want to run the prediction on train X? Well, it's not 100% on its prediction. We know it has a certain amount of error, and we want to compare the error we have on what we programmed it with with the error we get when we run it on new data that's never seen, the model's never seen before. And one of the things we can do, uh, we go ahead and invert the predictions. Uh, this helps us level it off a little bit more. Um, get rid of some of our bias. We have train predict equals an NP um, exponential M1, the train predict. And then train Y equals the exponential M1 for train Y. And then we do the again that with train test predict and test Y. Um, again, reformatting the data so that we can, it all matches. And then we want to go ahead and calculate the root mean square error. So we have our train score, uh, which is your math square root times the mean square root error, train uh, Y and train predict. And again, we're just, um, uh, this is just feeding the data through so we can compare it. And the same thing with the test. And let's take a look at that because really the code makes sense if you're going through it line by line, you can see what we're doing but the answer really helps to zoom in. Uh, so we have a train score, which is 2.40 of our root mean square error. And we have a test score of 3.16 of the root mean square error. If these were reversed, if our test score is better than our training score, and then we've overtrained, something's really wrong. At that point, you gotta go back and figure out what you did wrong. Because uh, you should never have a better result on your test data than you do on your training data. And that's why we put them both through. That's why we look at the error for both the training and the testing. When you're going out and quoting your, um, uh, publishing this, and you're saying, hey, how good is my model? It's the test score that you're showing people. This is what it did on my test data that the model had never seen before. This is how good my model is. And a lot of times you actually want to put together like a little formal code, um, where we actually want to print that out. And if we print that out, you can see down here, um, test prediction and standard deviation of data set 3.16 is less than 4.40. Uh, I'd have to go back and we're up here. If you remember, we did the square means error. This is standard deviation. That's why these numbers are different. It's saying the same thing that we just talked about. Uh, 3.16 is less than 4.40. Model is good enough. We're saying, hey, this is this model is valid. We have a valid model here. So we can go ahead and go with that. Uh, and along with putting a formal print out of there, um, we want to go ahead and plot what's going on. Uh, and this, we just want a pretty graph here so that people can see what's going on. When I walk into a meeting and I'm dealing with a number of people, they really don't want these numbers. They don't want to say, hey, what's, I mean, standard deviation, unless you know what statistics are, um, you might be dealing with a number of different departments, head of cells might not work with standard deviation or have any idea what that really means number wise. And so at this point, we really want to put it in a graph so we have something to display. And with displaying, you got to remember that we're looking at uh, the data today going into it and what's going to happen tomorrow. So let's take a quick look at this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and shift the train predictions for plotting. Uh, we have our train predict plot, uh, NP empty like data set, uh, train predict plot, uh, set it up with uh, null values. Eh, you know, it's just kind of, it's kind of a weird thing where we, we're creating the, um, the data groups as we like them and then putting the data in there is what's going on here. Uh, so we have our train predict plot, uh, which is going to be our look back, our length, plus look back. We're just, is going to equal train, uh, train predict. So we're creating this, basically we're taking this and we're dumping the train predict into it. So now we have our nice train predict plot. And then we have the shift test predictions for the plotting. Uh, we're going to continue more of that. Oops, it looks like I put it in here double. No, it's just, uh, yeah, they put it in here double. Um, didn't mean to do that. We really only need to do it once. Oh, here we go. Um, this is where the problem was, is because this is the test predict. So we have our training prediction. We're doing the shift on here. And then the test predict, we're going to look at that. Same thing, we're just creating those two uh, data sets. 
uh, test trad predict plot length prediction set up on there. And then we're going to go through the plotting, the original data set, and the predictions. Uh, so we have a time axis. Always nice to have your time set on there. Um, set that to the time array, time axis lap. All this is setting up the time variable for the bottom. And then we have a lot of stuff going on here as far as setting up our figure. Let's go ahead and run that, and then we'll break it down. We have on here... Uh, our main plot, we have two different plots going on here. Uh, the ISPU going up and the data and the ISPU here with all these different settings on it. And so when you look at this, we have our um, AX1, that's the main plot. I mean our AX, <laughs> that's the main plot. And we have our AX1, which is the secondary plot over here. So we're doing a figure PLT or PLT.figure. And we're going to dump those two graphs on there. Um, and so we take, and if you go through the code piece by piece, uh, which we're not going to do, we're going to do the, um, the data set here, um, exponential, reverse exponential, so that it looks correctly. We're going to label it the original data set. Um, we're going to plot the train predict plot. That's what we just created. We're going to make that orange, and we'll label it train prediction. Uh, test prediction plot, we're going to make that red and label it test prediction and so forth. Um, set our ticks up. This actually just put ticks, um, time axes gets its ticks. The little, little marks that are going along the axes, that kind of thing. And let's take a look and see what these graphs look like. And these are just kind of fun. You know, when you show up into a meeting and this is the final output and you say, hey, this is what we're looking at. Um, here's our original data in blue. Here's our training prediction. Um, you can see that it trains pretty close to what the data is up there. I would also probably put a um, like a little little time stamp and do just right before and right after where we go from uh, train to test prediction. And you can see with the test prediction, the data comes in in red. Um, and then you can also see what the original data set looked like behind it and how it differs. And then we can just isolate that here on the right. That's all this is, um, is just the test prediction on the right. Uh, and it's, you know, there's you, you'll see with the original data set, there's a lot of peaks we're missing and a lot of lows we're missing. But as far as the actual test prediction, it's pretty, it does pretty good. It's pretty right on. You can get a good idea of what to expect for your ISPU. And so from this, we would probably publish it and say, hey, this is... Um, what you expect, and this is our area of, this is a range of error. Um, that's the kind of thing I'd put out on a daily basis, maybe. We predict the cells are going to be this, or maybe weekly. So you kind of get a nice, you kind of flatten the um, data coming out, and you say, hey, this is what we're looking at. The big takeaway from this is that we're working with, let me go back up here. Whoops, oh, too far. There we go. Um, is this model here. This is what this is all about. We worked through all of those pieces, um, all the tensor flows, and that is to build this sequential model. And we're only putting in the two layers. This can get pretty complicated. If you get too complicated, it never, um, it, it, it never verges into a usable model. Uh, so if you have like 30 different layers in here, there's a good chance you might crash it kind of thing. Um, so don't go too haywire on that. And that you kind of learn as you go. Again, it's domain knowledge um, and also starting to understand all these different layers and what they mean. The data analytics behind those layers um, is something that your data analysis uh, professional would come in and say, this is what we want to try. But I tell you, as a data scientist, um, a lot of these basic setups are common. And I don't know how many times... Uh, working with somebody and they're like, oh my gosh, if I only did a tangent H instead of a ReLU activation, I worked for two weeks to figure that out. Well, as a data science, I can uh, run it through the model in, you know, five minutes instead of spending two weeks doing the, the math behind it. Um, so that's one of the advantages of data scientists is we do it from programming side and a data analytics is going to look for it. How does it work in math? And this is really the core right here of TensorFlow and Keras is being able to build your data model quickly and efficiently. And of course, uh, with any data science, putting out a pretty graph so that your shareholders, um, again, we wanna take and um, 
reduce the information down to something people can look at and say, oh, that's what's going on. They can see stuff, what's going on as, as far as the dates and the change in the ISPU. Hello guys, welcome to yet another video by Simply Learn. I am Keertana and today we shall be talking about the top 10 artificial intelligence technologies. Before getting into the video, here's a gentle reminder to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you wouldn't miss any update from us. So, without further ado, let's quickly jump into the topic. In the list we have Natural Language Generation, Smart Devices, Virtual Agents, Speech Recognition, Augmented Reality, Machine Learning, Robotic Process Automation, Decision Management, Deep Learning and finally Image Recognition. Please note that the list is in no particular order. Natural Language Generation Communicating or conveying the information efficiently and transparently is very much crucial in communication. To say the right words in the right sequence, to convey the message clearly, humans often find it tricky and when it comes to machines, it's trickier. Natural Language Generation is a sub-discipline of artificial intelligence and is a trendy technology that converts the structured data into a native language. The machines are programmed in such a way that the algorithms convert the data into a desirable format for the users. This technology is widely used in customer service, report generation and summarizing business intelligence insights. Some of the sample vendors are Ativio, Automated Insights, SAS, Cambridge Semantics, Digital Reasoning, Narrative Science, etc. On the list next we have Smart Devices. With every passing day, smart devices are becoming more popular and more trendy. Technologies that people were using once upon a time are now remodeled and modified as smart devices. They can be used in almost every industry to improve efficiency and optimize the operations. Smart devices are everyday objects made intelligent with advanced computations which include artificial intelligence and machine learning. They are electronic gadgets that are able to connect, share and interact with its users and other smart devices. Some of the smart devices are smart watches, smart glasses, smart phones, smart speakers, etc. Virtual Agents They are computer-generated intelligence that provides online customer assistance. They can effectively communicate with humans. In most of the web and mobile applications, we see chatbots as customer service agents who interact with us answering our queries. In simple, virtual agents are a manifestation of a technology which aims to create an effective but digital impersonation of humans. Virtual agents can make reservations, book an appointment, place an order and can even avail product information. Some of the best examples of virtual agents are Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa. And the companies that provide virtual agents are Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Assist AI. Next, we have Speech Recognition. Speech recognition is yet another sub-discipline of artificial intelligence which is used to convert human speech into a comprehensive and useful format for computer applications to process. It can be said as a bridge between computer interactions and humans. It's presently used in interactive voice response systems and mobile applications. Some of the companies offering speech recognition services are Nuance Communications, OpenText, NICE and Verint Systems. Augmented Reality Yet another trendy technology in the field of artificial intelligence, augmented reality is an enhanced version of the real physical world that is achieved using sound, digital visual elements and other sensory stimuli delivered via technology. 
Augmented reality uses the existing environment and adds information to it to make a new artificial environment. It alters the perception of the real world environment. Augmented reality is making its way into several retail stores that make makeup selection and furnishing much more fun and interactive. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Machine Learning Machine Learning is an application and an important branch of artificial intelligence which refers to machines being able to learn by themselves without being explicitly programmed. It enables systems to learn and improve from experience automatically. Machine learning platforms are becoming more and more popular with the help of algorithms, APIs, big data, and applications and training tools. Enterprises are heavily investing in machine learning to reap its benefits for the various domains. Machine learning is widely used for categorization and prediction. Some of the sample vendors are Amazon, Fractal Analytics, Google, Microsoft, etc. Robotic Process Automation Configuring a robot to interpret, communicate and analyze data is robotic process automation. It uses scripts and other methods to automate the human actions which in turn supports efficient business processes. Robotic process automation is widely used in those areas where the physical presence of a human is dangerous. Fields like warfare, mining, etc. is where it's currently being used. We need to remember that artificial intelligence is not meant to replace humans, but instead it is to complement their abilities and reinforce the human talent. Companies that are focusing on robotic process automation are Pegasystems, Automation Anywhere, Blueprism, etc. Next on the list we have Decision Management. Decision management is yet another technology in artificial intelligence that helps companies make valid decisions by providing up-to-date and relevant information and performing analytic functions. Artificial intelligence, when combined with decision management, helps translate customer data into predictive models of key trends. It also helps in making quick decisions, avoidance of risks, and in the automation of the process. Decision management is widely used in the healthcare sector, financial sector, insurance sector, e-commerce and many more. Some of the companies that provide this service are Informatica, Advanced Systems Concepts, Pika Systems, Mana, etc. Deep Learning Deep Learning is a branch of artificial intelligence that mimics the workings of the human brain in processing data. This data is used for a variety of purposes like recognizing speech, detecting objects, translating languages, and making decisions. Deep learning uses hierarchical level of artificial neural networks for carrying out the process of machine learning which is used across several industries for various applications. Some of the sample vendors are Deep Instinct, Fluid AI, MathWorks, Safran Technology, etc. At last, we have Image Recognition. Image recognition is the process of detecting an object or feature in a digital image or video. It can be used to analyze clients and their opinions, verify users based on their faces, detect license plates, and diagnose diseases. The present-day image recognition is comparable to human visual perception. Many social media platforms like Facebook use this technology to enhance image search and aid visually impaired users. Clarify, Gugums and SenseTime provide this technology. Thank you all for watching this full course video tutorial on artificial intelligence. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions, then please feel free to put them in the comment section. Our team will help you solve your queries. Thank you for watching and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos.
To nerd up and get certified, click here.